Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second day of the Cisco Quantum Summit. Uh, we have a very interesting set of talks today. Uh, but before that, we will have a poll that's going to pop up on your screens. Uh, please go ahead and answer that. Uh, so the first session today is on quantum security. And to kick off the session, we have uh, Professor Elham Kashefi. She's going to join us from, uh, she's a professor of computer science at the University of Edinburgh, and she's also a CNRS researcher at the Sabon University. She's contributed to a lot of areas of quantum information, like cryptography, and she's worked on verification of quantum protocols. She's also one of the originators of blind quantum computing. I'm really lo looking forward for this talk. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I believe you're seeing my full screen. Uh, uh, let me make sure all is okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about quantum computing as a service uh, or a vision uh, that is what you know we're dreaming of to have a secure and verifiable multi-tenant quantum data center. It's slightly the same different title I, I show you, but let me walk you through to see what I'm uh, aiming in this talk. So hopefully you're seeing my next slide, otherwise somebody would complain. So currently, what is the status of the quantum network that we have? Well, we have the quantum links, quantum network, if you wish the QKD, trusted node that being built, the target there using unclonability measurement disturbance to enhance security. And plenty of uh, protocol that probably we also hear in this talk, uh, the ne ne next talks that can be using that. At the same time, we also have quantum computer or quantum node that they are enhancing the speed using superposition entanglement. You can do machine learning factoring, etc. Already with the vision of quantum internet, you know, these are my colleague in Delft that have already demonstrated how you can connect some of these nodes together with the quantum memory with the photonic links. So this is the beginning of the current status of how quantum network, quantum internet, quantum distributed structure is emerging. So future in our dream, when you're a theoretician like me, you can uh, dream it's going to be this beast that we have many, many quantum computers connected using communication link, you know, you know, to try to design a lot of various activity. And what I'm talking a lot about uh, this green part, the algorithmic part, but this vision of multi-client, multi-tenant quantum data center is really the picture that we want to enhance scalability, efficiency, security, integrity, speed, energy, robustness, whatever quantum advantage measure that you would like to have for your own business or your application. So what I want to focus in the remaining of the talk to, to try to say what is the challenges that we are currently facing in order to reach to such an amazing infrastructure that we can achieve all of this application. So let's, let's start with the first challenge. The first challenge is scalability. If you really want to have this amazing quantum capacity, you know, I just put the IBM, but almost any quantum uh, hardware company have a roadmap and the scalability is something. How do we put more and more and qubit together? So keep this scalability as one challenge towards my dream uh, data center. Then the other challenge is the issue of privacy. Well, let me reflect on it. You know, everything in modern data sciences is about distributed computing, you know, go from wherever sort of application from cloud, synthetic data, fraud detection, et cetera, et cetera. There is all about this distributed sharing, but there is a beautiful dilemma that, you know, regulation is imposing on you what you can actually easily share. And at the same time, without sharing the data, you're not able to do all these fascinating things. So providing privacy in this distributed computing vision that I'm saying is yet another challenge. The third challenge for our quantum internet vision is the integrity. You know, have we really created the quantum data center or is it just so noisy that things are collapsing? And you know, you all heard about quantum advantage versus quantum noise and et cetera. So again, how do we guarantee in this beast that I'm envisioning to be putting all this quantum computer and all those links together to have the correct functioning of scalable devices? So Integrity, privacy, scalability are three challenges that we need to overcome to be able to reach to this uh, utopia that I'm advertising. But there is a good news, and it's the case that I want to convince you in the next uh, 30 minutes that privacy, integrity, scalability is the same thing. And in fact, 
all of them are going to be achievable with quantum link. And I want to argue way more that, you know, we are at the moment of designing this thing. So while maybe somebody is focusing on scalability because you're a hardware provider, somebody's working on the standardization and integrity and testing because you are national organization and somebody caring about privacy, but application, to me, they are exactly the same, the same tool. So you get three for the price of one. So let's look at the scalability. This is a really a hardware uh, solution, and this is not what I'm going to talk about, but I want to argue that we already know the scalability of quantum nodes is going to be possible using quantum communication. If you zoom out into the any roadmap, we know that if you want to go beyond 1000 qubit, 1 million qubit, you have to have quantum communication link. And this random company that I put their logo in here is just, they are the symbol of the exactly emerging technology that actually trying to build the interconnect. So they are all about photonic link that need to come between the quantum node. And now again, what I'm trying to focus going all the way to the application, the same link that people are trying from the hardware motivation to create, whether they are close or whether long distance, that's a different question. But the moment you have created quantum link between your node, you've given me everything I need in order to talk about integrity and privacy. So that's, that's my game. I'm not gonna talk anymore from the hardware point of view, but I want to say that give me that infrastructure and that infrastructure is exactly what I need to, in order to provide for you the secure, verifiable, multi-tenant queue data center. So what do I want? I want to have quantum server, which have some capacity, and then I want to have various clients with the various capacity. Somebody has algorithm, somebody has the data, and they want to run without sharing everything together, providing the security, providing the verifiability and correction. And this is nothing but the same infrastructure we're having here. So quantum comes is there. But before I embark and making sure that everybody implement this thing, I want to also prove to you what we want to achieve only can be achieved with quantum communication. So usually I have like two hours to give these talks, but I want to tell everything. So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of the state of art of various work we have been doing in order to show it. And what I want to emphasize to show so many results is just to show that this is a very modular approach. It's not like every time we're designing a protocol, this is completely a new protocol. Like actually over the last decade that we have been developing on this protocol, they have been very constructively trying to stay close to the hardware and understand what new module we want to add. So the old result that I review, which is the honest client with the malicious server, the usual blind QC that you know, I already mentioned, this is first, I remind you that quantum communication is necessary if you want to have information security, that's if you wish you like the quantum supremacy of quantum communication, because we've proven that it's necessary. The building block in here is our beloved QKD teleportation self-testing that we have seen over and over, and that give me the verifiable blind QC. So why I'm reviewing is that because I want to show you that when I want to go more higher functionality, for example, now, Maybe my client is also malicious. Maybe client has some data that doesn't want to share with server, but server also have some data that doesn't want to share with the client. So I want to go really through the client server infrastructure is the same building block of UBQC, but now I need to add few elements to it. And this few element is the beginning of how do I bring hybrid classical crypto protocol with the quantum crypto protocol and going forward. And also there is another thing is that the demands on the hardware also increase. Now I need to have quantum memory. And then we're bringing technique from the cut and choose technique, which is classical. So it's a lot of classical crypto technique that allows us to enhance the quantum functionality. Finally, if I make it to the end before somebody cut me off, it's the real vision of multi-client, multi-server, everybody malicious, nobody trusts anybody. And how do we uplift classical secure multi-party computing to the quantum one? And then I want to very briefly also talk about this architecture that recently we demonstrated it in order to see that this is the vision that we think is the most appropriate for this structure. Okay, let's see how far we go. So very quickly, currently our access to the quantum cloud are insecure. You know, there is no privacy of data algorithm or result. There is no verification. So what is the solution? Well, you would immediately say, well, this is a big problem. Classically, we already have looked at it since 1979. And it was the solution of it comes as a fully homomorphic encryption, exactly how to do computing and encrypted data. Can we not do the same thing? Can we not use this secure classical access to quantum cloud? There is a 
you know, a series of the work that I'm uh, citing in here for you to later on to look at them, that they kind of start indicating, well, if you want to have information security on running quantum computation and encrypted data, the answer seems to be no. And this old result with the, with the colleague, we also show that, you know, there are strong complexity evidence, i.e. collapse of polynomial hierarchy on the third level, that for the general audience essentially means if you want to have practical, secure, information secure access to quantum cloud, you need quantum communication. So this is a little bit of like my pitch of the scalability that we know that eventually we need to connect those nodes to scale up our devices. And now if you want to have the secure access to the quantum cloud, you need to have quantum communication. And that's again the blind QC protocol. Again, let's quickly look at it because I'm going to use this graph in order to build up. So when I'm showing you my QSM PC, you see that it's a bit of extension of the same thinking, okay? So the protocol goes like this. We have a client, it pick up the randomness. That randomness is exactly the sort of QKD state plus theta minus theta plus minus zero one uh, with the rotation. So we use the QKD state for encoding or creating the randomness of the client that is run on the server. On the server, when we get this randomized quantum state, we use teleportation, gate teleportation, in order to run the computation. So that's exactly how we achieve privacy, secure access to quantum cloud. Again, let me just briefly show it to make sure that you see the, the main building block and I'm keep using the same building block. So I have an Alice, which is using some, some secure communication link, send the plus theta, is running some, some sort of gadget on the server machine. From server point of view, He's thinking I'm making a measurement, I'm requesting making this measurement in the angle alpha plus theta plus r pi, which is masked one. But in fact, you know, this masking is also demasking the initial randomization that I put. So hence, we are implementing J R alpha without leaking the information of alpha. This is really the core single gadget in a hiding of teleportation. And if you put all this gadget together, take care of the communication, etc., you get the full blind QC and you can demonstrate in the photonic uh, work that we have done. Okay, so that's that's where is the blind QC. And I slightly cheated. I said, that, oh, you cannot achieve, you know, classical secure access. And probably some of the people in the audience say, wait a second, what if, if I don't want information security access to quantum cloud, which I prove is impossible to achieve classically, but I'm happy to have post-quantum secure based on the LWR. These are you know, celebrated result of Mahadev and uh, some other work that we have done that indeed, if you're compromising your security to be post quantum security, then you can achieve a emulation of this quantum communication between client and server. But I want to emphasize that because it's very, very important again, thinking about architecture scalability, there is a cost. So not only you have reduced your security to be computational security, post quantum security to be seen if it's remain or not, but you also increase a huge overhead on the server. So roughly speaking, for every single randomization of the gate that I was showing you in this little gadget. So here I'm sending one single qubit in order to randomize one particular gate of my target computation. Now, in order to implement using this LWE machinery, etc., that we need, we need to have order of 1000 logical qubit on the server side. So to me, again, I want to emphasize that quantum comes, even if you are happy to reduce your security, still it's the only practical solution because now we are matching one qubit hiding with one qubit gate versus 1000 qubit. Maybe in future when we have millions of billions of fault tolerant quantum computing, you don't need to be very greedy about resource estimation. But my bet is still that for a long time, we want to keep things as efficient as possible. So here we go. Quantum comes is necessary. Okay, so quantum comes give us the security. Fantastic. You know, we get the cloud. So, but what about correctness? Because I was also pitching to you. Privacy and integrity is the same thing. Now that I achieve privacy and that privacy is exactly what the quantum link you needed to for your scalability. What about the integrity? What does integrity mean? It means that, well, I, I want to make sure that somehow this quantum network distributed computation that I'm doing either on one server or multi-server is really doing what it's supposed to do. And I'm just a classical client and there is this malicious uh, quantum server that is claiming to be fully powerful, how do I certify correctness? So 
look at the same picture. The same picture before you will have only the red dot, which were uh, QKD type of state. But now I'm adding something on top of it. So I don't know where the, my uh, description has gone. So the red qubit are still the plus theta qubit and the yellow and the orange are in such a way that allow me to create isolated qubit. So they are zero one, they are in a different basis. And suddenly I'm doing the same QKD and teleportation for hiding the computation, but I have inserted some new gadget, which is called trapification or self-testing that allow me to also test the computation. So what is the structure? I'm creating a target computation and sometimes I have test computation. So from the device point of view, from the infrastructure, hardware point of view, they're exactly the same. You know, they are some graph with the same native gate, with the same connectivity, with the same set of operation. But in the reality, thanks to the hiding that I integrated, the target computation are probabilistic. Nobody knows what's the answer. They could be quantum simulation. They could be random sampling. They could be something that I don't know the answer. Hence, I'm asking a quantum computer to run it for me for the simulation. Whereas the tests that I have inserted, they are deterministic. I know exactly what they are. So this hiding between target computation versus test computation allow me to make a guarantee that if the test is correct, then my computation is correct. I'll go, I'm going through all of the details of the proof very quickly, but just in order to give you the building block. But again, since you know my whole motivation for today is just say Q comes is the most important thing that has happened to humanity. So proof technique is already actually showing that the only way that I take this beast, which is the general noise that is happening on my infrastructure, it could be a Markovian, non-Markovian, entangling the ancilla qubit to not, you know, whatever, somehow magically the cryptographic hiding technique that can be enabled only using quantum communication will allow me to do truly, for those of you who are familiar, which is reducing the general noise model to a very simple test sub model. So I'm making this verification testing that is completely informationally secure in the sense that I don't make my assumption on the noise to be IID or not IID or et cetera, et cetera, is uh, superconducting, et cetera. This is really the general technique for being able to give the integrity in the most um, standardized way, if you wish. And essentially the same thing like uh, reducing verification to simple error detection. It's not error correction, it's not fault tolerance. I don't need that overhead. It's a very simple error detection. And very recently, the only work that we have done, I mean, million of people have worked on this field, of course, you know, but the last work that we have done is just we managed to make protocol very optimized. As you see, it fits into one page. You know, you can read it, but it's really a simple protocol that if you have a deterministic computation, classical input, classical output, you just need to run 1000 times the same computation. Sometimes it's the test computation, sometimes it's the trap uh, uh, comp uh, target computation. You check your test computation if they are above some threshold, exactly like an error correcting code. Then we prove that we can give the guarantee that your actual computation are also correct. So that's the notion of verifiability. Again, very quickly gone through. But the important things of this new protocol is that we show all the features that it was very motivated from hardware point of view. You can do redo because maybe the verifier trying to send something to the server and the photon get lost and you want to redo it without compromising security. You want to also have this thing as a composable, very important for the rest of the talk, because I keep picking up the same building block and I said, oh, I'm plugging it in order to do multi-party computing. And if I didn't have this general composable exponential security amplification, I would have not been able to plug it. So it's confidence that is exponential as well as composable. It's also have all of this nice feature of being fine tuning, you know, in the sense that you tell me what is the expected noise of your device, if you know it, and then I can adjust the number of repetition. It's not an assumption. It's just like a trying to get the best possible acceptance rate. And if there is a notion of scalability in the following way. So if you build a device, if you build a node that is 100 qubits, I'm not going to ask you 1 million qubit as the overhead to do the test or certification. I'm just going to ask you to run a lot of computation. So this was a very, very quick review. I don't even know where we are in the terms of the time, but we have now this blind QC gadget and we have this very efficient verification gadget. It gives me integrity, it gives me the security. Oh, by the way, 
very importantly, because of all the optimization, we actually managed to experimentally demonstrate it. This is the very latest work we did with the Oxford Iron Trap Group. They have this very nice architecture that, again, if you remember from the beginning of my talk, they have been exploring how to do you know, iron trap photon link in order to connect different iron trap together. And that's exactly as I mentioned, is that since they have photon link to the iron trap, that's where I can implement my verification protocol. So this server is an iron trap um, architecture. It has a memory qubit, means that they are staying for a long time in a coherent time, but they can also shine a laser, making sure a photon is emitted from those memory, means this photon is entangled to those iron trap uh, qubit. And those photons, we are taking them away and we act as them in order to be climbed to do verification. Maybe in this picture is better. So we have a server, it's a model server, you just have only two iron trap, but we can recycle those because they have a very high fidelity. For each one of those for, uh, iron trap, for the memory iron trap, we are able to get a photon entangled to that. So on the verifier side, separately, I'm able to make a measurement in order to randomize the qubit that sits in my iron trap. And then I'm mapping exactly all those protocols that I was showing you in this picture. So it's really, again, why this is a simple proof of principle. It's just saying that like this uh, architecture that you will keep seeing in here, sorry, this one is doable. I can send photon in or get photon out, and then I'm achieving information privacy and information integrity. Okay, very good. So finally, I can start my talk. So I have all of these building blocks. They are demonstrable. They're efficient. And can I go now to the next step? The next step was that I need to have also malicious client and malicious server. We're trying to build the quantum internet. Google cannot share its data with the Amazon, and yet they want to compute some sort of joint intersection as who is clicking on which advertisement, et cetera, et cetera. So when you have party with algorithm and data, so this comes as the simple symbol of the two-party computation. Again, ages ago, classically, this problem was solved by Yao, which even initiated the field. The Yao garbled circuit is example that somebody has some secret information, some secret circuit, and it wants to run it with somebody else who has its own secret input and trying to come in, you know, for example, the famous who's the millionaire person or how do we compute a joint function on our private data. So what we do, we're exactly trying to mimic this thing in the quantum setting in the sense that, again, I'm going to think in my, my uh, scenario that I have those random randomization QKD state, I'm going to send it to the server, the server need to do the same thing as a blind QC, but we need to have now an instruction that the server can put blindly its own input into the server. So compare, so let me go to this picture. While I have QKD teleportation trap to give me the same building block that you saw before, which was the verifiable blind QC. Now, because the client who's sending those single qubit could be malicious, could be, for example, not send single qubit, could be sending entangled qubit, is trying to dig out some information from the server, I need to add a new gadget. The new gadget is called qubit testing. And in order to implement that, I need to bring a classical crypto. So I'm bringing classical oblivious transfer as a new gadget in order to enhance my blind QC, which was with the honest client, to become now dealing with the malicious client. And simply without going through the details, it's the same that you send all this qubit, client in the honest scenario would have been exactly normal QKD plus theta state, but making sure that they are not cheating, and you know, this is like an old result of Professor Hoyle-Kong-Lut, which is talking later on, that you know, in order to not have entanglement attack, now we need to test them. So in this OT commitment, the client committing to some of this qubit classically to know exactly what state they are, and then we do cut and choose and we are opening it. So here, the gadget is a classical OT that comes sit on top of it. As, as a result, we only have computationally secure two-party quantum computing, which is the only thing we can achieve because now we have OT need to be in the picture, but it's exactly designed for the quantum setting. So if I have a quantum machine learning algorithm with the quantum data that's coming from somebody else, I can map it in here, but the price is now that now I need to have this client or need to have this quantum memory because the quantum memory is the gadget that is required in qubit testing. In the previous gadget, when the client was honest, I didn't need to have a memory on the side of client. Now that I want to have a higher functionality, 
I need a higher physical capability. So quantum memory is essential for doing this multi-party secure cloud. And now, finally, you know, I, I don't have any time to know that, you know, how am I doing with time is not too bad. Okay. So finally, I can pitch it the malicious client, a malicious service setting. Now somebody has algorithm, somebody has data. They want to run the same thing in a distributed setting. I'm using the same gadget. Everybody send a randomization. The most important thing is this state. Instead of having a plus theta, that theta was unknown to only the, the client. Now I need to have several clients. And they need to be collectively as a, like a secret sharing scenario to create this masking. So you need to have this key that is shared between everybody. So picturally it's become this. So everybody sends their thing as if they want to imp implement a UBQC by themselves, but there need to be a machine that is qubit mix mixing. So now this joint computation need to make sure that it has randomness from everybody. And this qubit mixing can be implemented using surprise, surprise, another classical gadget. Now, on top of my QKD teleportation trap, OT was very good for one malicious client. The general classical SMPC is necessary to implement the quantum SMPC. So we use the machinery of classical SMPC to make sure all this randomness coming from client are mixed without leaking anything to the several client and then back to the normal. So we are able to run it in this structure. And this is the state of art of various, this protocol, how they compare. But what is very interesting as usual, now when we wanted to go to demonstrate experimentally, the problem is that this qubit mixing, and if you remember, is required a long memory because I need to send all this qubit from various clients, trying to mix them. Once they are satisf satisfactory mix, then I'm sending it to server to run. So we reflect a little bit more. And in a very recent work that we did with the um, uh, Fabio Scarin group at Rome, we understood that, okay, well, there is other technique, other architecture that allow us to do this qubit mixing even better. So the Q-line architecture that we published separately for other uh, architecture is an unknown architecture of how to do distributed QKD uh, type of uh, um, infrastructure. It gives us an uh, opportunity of how to bring a qubit from a potentially uh, noisy source, bring it going through each of the client, maybe this picture is better, and this Q-line architecture is allow every of this masking to accumulate. So when we go at the end uh, in the qubit and the server side, there exists a qubit that everybody has masked. This, this remove one level of the quantum memory, if you want, because it goes very quick, but it's still, you need to have implemented SMPC. And in order to keep them in the SMPC with the current implementation, but you don't have quantum memory, we needed to come some other machinery, which here we're bringing trusted third party using hardware secure module that if you wish is like we take our pen and paper quantum protocol and we try to bring it as close as possible. And there is the novelty of yet bringing classical hardware secure module in order to implement to implement this SMPC. So again, very quickly look at the paper. It has all better description. And this is the scalable architecture that we're proposing that now we really have this multiple source of the qubit, it could be one and multiplexing or not, but they could be all malicious. And then you have several clients, they can be malicious and colluding. And as long as you have one honest client, the information of that client is proven to be composably secure and not even the quantum server, which is colluding with all these other client could get the information. And to us, this is scalable in the sense that, okay, we can, we can construct many of these queue line coming to the infrastructure. And again, this client server picture comes. So, now, really, the important is that can we start really showing some sort of use case? We are looking at the privacy preserving quantum machine learning. You have one algorithm that you want to run. You have some computer, etc. So we need to now have a better quantum server linked to this photonic structure back to the scalability. Please, hardware people, create this photon link to your quantum computer because then we can do magic with it, including exactly secure multi-party computing, which to me seems to be a very nice combination of quantum comes plus quantum computing to implement this dream of multi-tenant quantum data center. And I stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, that's perfectly on time. Um, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. I'm, I'm really excited to see that you have been, uh, you have some experimental demonstrations in these, in this direction. Um, one, I just have time for one very small question. Um, 
So the noise tolerance in each of these architectures and the resource requirement of the communication, it, it seems it's going to be different if you want scalability or you want the integrity or privacy. So could you just comment on, you know, different kind of noise tolerances and resource requirements for these three um, possibilities? It's a very good question. And as usual, is the, uh, the devil is in the details in the sense that precisely in order to not to compromise the security, because we know that the noise can immediately affect not only just the correctness, but also the security. So it's not like just we can put an error correction, everything is will be the same. So in here, we have come up with the solution that with the current memory loss that exists, so back to the question of noise, we need to make sure that we don't use too many rounds. So in simple, for this very, very simple experiment, which is just getting essentially two qubits going on, instead of, so this TTP is a hack in order to say, that, okay, I upload, I'm doing a lot of offline calculation that what this angle are, what is this adaptivity are. So when I'm receiving those precious qubits that are randomized, I have just enough time to make a measurement on one, do it forward on the second one. So immediately you'll see that, well, if I want to have a much larger, if I have much larger computation here, many, many of these two lines that come and I don't have quantum memory, what will happen? So now it becomes calculation of what should be the coherence times that is required while I'm doing fit forward. So it's a bit similar to the same fit forward structure and is creating, and it seems the best solution it would be magical quantum memory that sits there. But I would say that we, we have all this calculation of saying, what should be the minimum threshold to not lose the correctness and the noise? So noise is still is a hassle, but at least because we have verification, so maybe I just add that exists enough verification in making sure that you don't accept the wrong computations. So all of these protocols are verifiable. And the bad news is that with the most of the current architecture, we always get rejection. So we're waiting for this hardware to become much better so that when implement proof of concept, actually we get acceptance too. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank, thanks a lot for your talk. It was really good. Um, so next on we have Professor Hoi Kong Lo. He is a professor in the University of Toronto. He's also the co-founder of Quantum Bridge Technologies. He has contributed a lot to quantum information, you know, decoy state crypto measurement, device independent, quantum cryptography, all photonic quantum repeaters. Well, I have read a lot of his papers and I'm really looking forward to this talk. Please take it away. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Can people uh, see uh, my uh, screen well? Um, so I'm um, very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Hoi Krondo, a professor um, of uh, physics and ECE at UC Toronto. I'm also a co-founder of CTO of the uh, startup Quantum Bridge at Toronto. Um, I will tell you about the quantum fetch to cybersecurity and how we can play it here in this uh, talk. So uh, thank you for the uh, invitation here to uh, speak to you about the subject on quantum security. Uh, let me just see, um, see, next slide. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> so uh, this is the logo uh, for my company. Uh, we want to future-proof uh, network security. Um, the background, right, the quantum fact, right, some of you uh, probably know about it, so just uh, review it. So everyone right, in this uh, audience know quantum computers are coming, the number of users grow exponentially over time, and companies like IBM and Google are making, uh, building quantum computers now. So that's a very useful, right, for us, this is very good news, and uh, Elham also talked about uh, the wonderful things quantum computing can do for us, which is great. On the other hand, right, there would be some security concerns. I, uh, as people probably know, the uh, US NSA, National Security Agency, has announced that we need to make transition to uh, quantum resistance uh, cryptography. Quant um, so quantum computer is really um, a problem uh, for security as well. And uh, at least right, um, the National Institute of Standard Technology, they are standardizing um, post-quantum crypto, uh, PQC. Uh, they have been doing it in the last few years. Okay, the question is why do we have to change our crypto system, right? And um, if, of course, we're going to the pure source algorithm, the most famous algorithm in quantum computing. I um, backing is very easy with quantum computer, and in fact, like the algorithm would be useful for uh, breaking many crypto systems, like RSA, risky blobs, and also related curves. So these are the most commonly used uh, crypto systems today. And Drew Bassett says, if a quantum computer is ever built, 
much of conventional cryptography will just fall apart. So what's the problem? So uh, in the old case where people would say, oh, why can't we just wait for the uh, quantum computer, right? Um, but guess this how that's now and decrypt later I can. The problem is why right, our um, secrets, right? Um, whether it's trade secrets, government secrets, or our personal identification information, we have a kept them for a long, long time without that case. Um, I'm Canadian, so in Canada, right, the Canadian census data have to be kept secure for 92 years. And 92 is a very long time, and this is a big problem right now because of this harvest now, the data. What does it mean? So Eve can just save all the messages. Right, so she can save all the messages which are transmitted in this year, 2023, and she can wait for a quantum computer to arrive by saying um, 2115. So why 2115 is 92 years from now? So in next century, I may be get a quantum computer and she can crack it and she can figure out our, our DNA or, or health data or government secrets. So that could be a big problem. Okay, the question is, um, let's think about it. Was there any computer 92 years ago? Right. Actually, there was no electronic computers. What will a computer look like 92 years from now? And I think in general, it's ridiculous to think that we actually know what the technology looks like 92 years from now. So that's the problem that we have to face today to uh, secure our information. And people probably know about Moscow's uh, theorem, right? Um, so it tells us right, um, what the problem is. So it really takes years right to um make our critical system quantum safe right we have to change our critical infrastructure after that we have to keep our data for a long time with a slightly span for data so we have add these two numbers up x plus y and we have to compare this number with the number of years to build a quantum computer which may be a long time i don't know maybe 10 or 15 years whatever it is however if x plus y is larger than z the number used to be a quantum computer, again, we went in the problem because our secret will be disclosed to the e chopper, right? Okay, so that helps us, right? Uh, because the change critical graphic standards really takes a long time, so we have to think about uh, what to do now. We have to um, plan for a transition right now. And um, with the internet, right, all the data are online with cloud computing, computing, not quantum cloud computing, right? Um, the cost of insert is really high, right? Um, okay, so I think people know about key distribution problems. So I just want to talk about the E4E chopper, right? Um, and what you do is you go encryption. Um, so we have encryption key and we transform a message, for example, Normandy Beach to um, something's not incredible to Eve and transmit to the internet and block the code with the same key. Okay, so this introduces a key distribution problem. Right? So if I have the same key, of course, right, it's perfectly secure because in theory, you can do one kind of path right, by Shen. Okay, so the question is how to transfer this key, a key distribution problem. And um, in classical, like right, people know, like right, it's um, copying is easy, so um, that's a big problem. Okay, so what are the solutions? So um, actually, think about it, there are actually a few solutions that uh, we can think of. One is the public key infrastructure. As I mentioned before, post quantum cryptography have been um, being standardized. Um, the good thing is that uh, it's very easy, it's software based, it's easy to do. do. However, um, you can never prove it is secure. I will say a bit more about this. And um, that's all the QK key. Right? Uh, okay, let's why we just go through that one by one, maybe that's easier. Okay, public key instruction. This has been standardizing post quantum crypto. Okay. And but last year, you, if you read the news, right, um, there have been a number of attacks. So, for example, this news post quantum encryption contender um, is taken out by a single core PC in just one hour. Um, in fact, it's well known, right? Post quantum crypto can never be proven to be secure. Why is this well known? Well, you can also look up, right, um, say, uh, in Canada, this. Um, Defense, national defense um, have this over a quantum 2030. Sorry, I got <laughs> not, not um, 2030 here. Um, it says like post quantum curve is, is very good. However, it's very impossible to prove that um, such algorithm is really secure because based on computation assumptions. Okay, QKG, quantum computation, right? So um, 
um, how have made the first talk. So it's good. That's quantum come uh, is what we need is uh, everywhere. So QKG is uh, one of the uh, application of quantum communication. Um, and I've been working on this for <laughs> the last um, 28 years. Well, the thing about classical key exchange is not secure because you can copy, right? So in quantum mechanics, with quantum local theorem, this is very well known. So it's impossible to copy quantum information. And from there, right, um, we can make critical systems. Um, get different companies, like I get computer and magic, I get all make um, commercial critical systems where you can buy them. Um, you want to be around fibers. Okay, get also free space QK key and um, get different networks in um, in Europe, in Japan, and also in China. This is one example. I um, in China, I have this uh, Shanghai Beijing network with um, 32 um, trusted nodes for relay. So you just go to QKK between the nodes and then um, you do another QKK link. Okay, so I've been working on the subject since 1995, right, for 28 years now. So um, I'm looking back, right? So people sometimes ask me why I keep working on the subject. And uh, so I make up this slide to try to convince you that there has been some progress actually in the last 28 years, right? Um, but first off, for a long time, right, there's no even, there's no security proof, right? So, um, so having a proof of security is very good. So a key way is actually not zero because it's very good. Okay, but once we know key rate is non zero, now we want to work out what the key rate is. So, uh, so how does it scale? Um, optical fibers are very lossy, right? Um, the loss is like 0 0.2 GB per kilometer for standard single mode fibers. Okay, so what's the key rate? So, I always see key rate per part cell segment sent by Alice. And um, Yika is a channel transmission, so Yika is usually quite small, right? 10 to minus 3 or something, right? Depending on the distance. Okay, so uh, I would argue that before two thousand and five, before the decoy scale, I, uh, if you work out a key way, I say in the GLLP uh, paper, like Officeman Low uh, Lucan House Pascal's paper, the key way scales with the transmission as order eager square. So eager is small, eager square is even smaller. So it's a very low key way. Okay, um, and um, in two thousand and five. We get um, people in one key cost key, 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 and we can monitor it. So the key rate is all got eager. So that's sort of a big improvement in the key rate. Okay, and so how about 2012? 2012, we get MGA key, 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 and it has the same key rate. However, the security is much better. So the uh, fourth form of security. The previous protocols are vulnerable to attacks on the key hackers, which is the main problem, which I will discuss a bit. So uh, in the coming slides. But MK quickly really removed this problem. So that's a big uh, improvement in security. And in 2018, right, Chin quickly was invented by Kushiba Group. Right? And since then, there have been quite a few protocols and gamma changes. So the key rate now goes up from Oga Eager to Oga Eager Square Wood. And, and it's also measurement device independent, which means right, um, all the attacks on the Giga discussion really matter. Looking in the future, right, um, so what does the future hold, right? Um, well, people are looking into quantum repeaters, so hopefully they will be one day, and then the QA would be the scale that all got one, like that would be a huge improvement again. And um, the security would be MGI, or maybe even GI QK would become feasible in the future. So I hope this cable would convince you, right? Um, actually, a lot of progress has been made in the, um, um, in the last 39 years, I guess or so, right, since uh, BB4. Okay, so um, um, in the next few minutes, I will tell you about the attacks, right, security, so what kind of attacks is available, and then I will tell you about MGQ in a bit more. Well, in theory, BBF is very nice, very simple, right? but in practice, I would like to remind people why we always have a box um, made by uh, the manufacturers, and there's a big gap between the theory and practice. So security does not depend just on quantum mechanics but also a model of security devices. And of course, there are quantum hackers, like Rekki Makarov also, like, <laughs> they're hacking the security systems. Okay, so um, well, 10 years ago or so, maybe more than 10 years ago, there have been a lot of new stories um, um, about hacking, right, about um, quantum hackers. And uh, I think most, I mean, um, some of you already know the subject. So um, the key is a big problem. Most of the are not the 
Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with subjects, so just remind you, so um, the Kikaka is a big problem, the weakest thing in Kikaki. And question, how do we solve this problem? And MGF Kikaki was proposed in 2012, so it's more than 10 years now, and um, that's um, a very useful kind of measure. So in this case, right, Yif is a black box, and as the box sends signals to Yif, so as and box just do the um, Operation. So if you do the hard work for security in this setup, so the network is proving security in some way. And the good news is all the attacks on the details will be gone. Right? We don't have very well side channels, right? Um, and then we can have a verified investment device, so, so anyone can make a device for us. And we, but the assumption is that we have a trusted source. The security proof is very, uh, conceptually is very simple, right? So the mathematics has some mathematics here, but conceptually, right? So um, there's an the equivalent EPL protocols where as and Bob make EPL pairs and transmit them to the channel, to Charlie. Charlie could teleportation, basically. The experience game measurement is a teleportation. So Charlie teleports the state from between as and Bob, and our as and Bob have EPL pairs, and they can verify the correlations. So that's how security works, right? Because Charlie is doing a teleportation, the bell scheme measurement, Charlie has no idea about the actual key. Like ours and only have, ours have the key. Um, so the left hand side is a conceptual um, proof. The right hand side is the implementation. So in practice, right, ours would measure, because preparing EPL pair is very difficult, right? So easy for ours would be the single focus. So ours would just perform measurement weight and weight. So in practice, ours just be the first case and change to uh, Charlie. Right, so, um, okay, so, so you to summarize, so right, Charlie performed a bell scale measurement, the teleportation, so Charlie doesn't really know um, R's and box speed, R just know the correlation. So this idea is quite old, I right, go back to uh, 1996. However, right, so in the original idea, right, it requires single focus. So what we did in 2012 uh, is to uh, combine this with the case case. So now we don't need single focus, we just can use a uh, laser. So that makes it, much easier to implement. So, and that's how the implementation is done. So with MGKKK, now, I mean, um, Pascal Bygan can talk to a Pascal Apukin um, via um, this quantum internet, right? So quantum communication. And they can um, use a device for, like, from country X. Country X could be the worst enemy um, of um, the US, for example. That would not be a problem because it doesn't rely on the security of the, measurement device. Um, this is just to uh, back up. Right? Uh, the measurement device is held by Charlie or Yves and as a box and single photons to the channel. So QKG is secure with even untrusted relay. So that would be a big change in the, um, that big improvement in the security. Um, and the other, just changing a subject, right? Um, besides poker, we also make devices. So um, Different groups have to make um, this uh, trip based QAG um, transmitter. Um, our group uh, with Professor Joyce Poon were the first to make this silicon oconic space QAG transmitter. It's a very small size, three millimeter times um, one millimeter, as you can see. So you can read more from this paper. Okay, recently, right, um, as I mentioned before, Twin QAG has really got a lot of attention in the subject by its proposed by Toshiba Group. And so uh, there has been a lot of follow-up work on the subject. And we have done the um, world's first chain filtering network. Right? So there's Charlie, um, which is the uh, network. There's artists, there are three users, right? Artists, David and Bob. The three users uh, share this um, group, this um, QKG network. So we can it in 2022. You can read more from the experimental paper. Um, we also work a bit on quantum repeaters. Most quantum repeaters are based on quantum memories. Quantum memories is very good, uh, very useful for quantum repeaters. Um, but we have a different approach. Our approach is um, kind of interesting and different. Uh, we use photons, right? Because it's all photons, quantum repeaters. Uh, we saw that you can actually do quantum repeaters without quantum memories. Um, and of course, we have to just to expand the distance quantum communication. Okay, so I talked to you about um, both PKI and QKG. So now, now uh, I don't know how much time I have. I would try to um, actually um, move to the next subject, which is um, PCI key solutions. 
Okay, why P Circus? I guess I guess the subject that most of you may not be familiar with. I, I should remind people P circus have been used for thousands of years, right? So just since a quick time, right? Um and um in fact they were the only solution available before the uh, invention of public key club in nineteen seventy. So for thousands of years that's the only solution that people use <laughs> in, in cryptography. And it's still being used by um um, and one thing is PKI is very wonderful. Right? For most applications, PKI is good, but it has its own problems because it may expire right? and some guy can have revoked. Um, and for clock secrets, right? uh, governments right? and banking industry, okay, we are key circuits. Right? For example, you have, um, I mean, you have your um, PIN number right? from a bank, right? so that's a lot of key circuit with a bank. Right? So key circuit is really uh, very commonly used. Right? We don't realize it, but it's, um, it's very common. And um, the yeah, good thing is P-Circuit, once you have them, it's really secure. So if they are secure, then you can prove that they're quantum safe because you can do one time path, right? And I should also mention that memory is very cheap, right? You can buy a hard drive, you can buy a very big hard drive, you can buy a mobile phone, you can ship it, right? Uh, so P-Circuit has become highly feasible in the e as well. Um, okay, so here I just, just focus that, um, as I mentioned before, um, post quantum cryptography can never be proven to be secure. So um, for clock secrets, for long term secrets, we need other solutions. And symmetric P-circuits should be used in set off or in addition to a symmetric public key and private key pairs to provide quantum resistant cryptographic protection of classified information with this um, a commercial solution for, um, for um, yeah, for this um, uh, classified solutions. So this is NSA's command, right, in 2022. So p circuit is, right, is really uh, highly recommended for clock secrets. And in fact, in US government, right, so um, they have contracts with, say, General Dynamics to build this key logo. So this is just a device that you ship the key um, and just upgrade the device, it takes like $700 million over the next uh, few years. So p circuit is really a big deal, right, it's um, not patient. Well, we don't have 70, uh, 700 million uh, in Canada, so, but we got 1 million uh, Canadian. Uh, so we're very happy to get it from the Canadian government to test our solutions. Our solution, I, um, we call it DSKE, Distributed Symmetric Key Exchange. So it's a new protocol for key management in PCR keys. And the goal is to be uh, scalable which means that you can have many users. When the new users come in, you don't want to share a new key with the new user. Uh, secure, like you use physical um, delivery key, you want to make it secure, key delivery. And it should be very simple to use because it's um, extra, based on extra one kind of is very simple to use. And of course, you cannot trust just one party, right? So if you want, you can have more than one um, security hub, so the security servers, which, um, do a key management for you between the different uh, link and encryptors. And this um, is compared with SC QKK standard. So you can integrate this with QKK as well. So good news is you can distribute shots between multiple security servers. So you can do secret sharing basically. Okay. And um, there's no misconception, but because this is a physical key delivery, you can do it for Ottawa and Montreal, or maybe Toronto and New York, or, you know, all over the world is not a problem. We also build this um, what is best phone, this um, mobile phone apps for secure messaging. So you can scan the QR code, you can obtain the secure key, and once you do that, right, you can scan it from different sources, and then we can uh, have secure mobile phone app communication. Uh, we are hoping to build this uh, DSKE app uh, in Canada to serve different parts of the country. Right? And you can simplify the local distribution of a key by having some local key distributor. Okay, so um, maybe I should um, just um, end my talk and uh, arrange for um, questions. Just to summarize, right? Quantum computing can break uh, standard encryption gains. Post quantum purpose is being standardized. However, it's not possible. It's impossible to prove they're fundamentally secure. Right? In fact, there have been a lot of attacks on them. For long-term secrets, right? we have to keep them secure for a long time for that case. Um, for example, it could be uh, if quantum computers become available in uh, 
15, that could already be a problem. And QKG would be a usual solution. I have a, at the moment, it requires specialized equipment and high cost. So it's being developed and that will be uh, definitely for the future. Right? That would be wonderful technology. And I'm, uh, at U of T, we have this MK QKG measurement device in the Vancouver protocol, which hopefully will play a key role in the future uh, quantum network. And I think the new message I would bring to you is that preserved key solutions should be used in addition uh, or as a replacement of asymmetric cryptography for clock cycle communication. So um, post quantum cryptography is not the only solution why right? we have to think about um, something more. So that's the main message that I would bring out. And uh, I would end just by uh, mentioning that I, I need students and collaborators for my work, right? just to highlight some of my collaborators here. So thank you uh, for the help. Um, yeah, I think I would just stop here and wait for questions. Hey, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is a bit more on the experimental side. Um, do you need classical beacon as space correction reference in um, twin field QKD to guarantee the successful BSM? So, because a question, I mean, do we need the classical beacon? Uh, yeah. Is well, let's see. For the current implementation, probably yes. Uh, however, I guess I think there's also a proposal I, um, how we could do chain field QQQ, uh without phase stabilization. Um, so phase stabilization has been a big challenge for chain field right? because I mean in principle, right? So chain field is based on the interference effect, right? So it's got some phase fluctuation in the, in the channel. I right? um, you know the other Bob's path, right? The phase would be different. That could be a problem. Um, it depends on how fast that's changing, right? So some guys will do post selection, right? So if the field is slowly, you could uh, measure the phase and do post selection. However, recently, right, uh, people have also proposed, right, um, there's one way to map from chain field to MGI, right? Um, instead of using one photon, we can use two photons. Um, mm -hmm. To generate key, there's a proposal like that, I, and in that way, um, I think we can, in principle, we can get rid of the um, yeah, classical uh, bacon. Um, well, classical bacon is also useful for some, could be useful for some other purposes, right? So, um, so, but if you want to get rid of it, I think in principle, guys, yes, you could be able to get rid of it. Okay. Okay. Um, the second question is, um, what interplay do you anticipate in the future between um, PQC, PSK, and QKD? Like, where do you see all three of these technologies? Oh, okay, how do they uh, fit in? Um, well, depending on what you mean by the future, right? Uh, if you mean the very short term, right? Uh, because post-quantum cryptography is not less standardized. In the talk can why right, people can talk about hybrid cryptography, right? So maybe we need to implement some hybrid mode with uh circuits and QKQ at the moment before we have uh, uh TQC. And then you know medium can when QKQ is standardized. Um we can see we can use QQC most of the time. But for clock secrets, why right, PQC is never proven to secure. Right? So there okay, are some applications, right? Um like uh, if you want to send a, a DNA gate or, or something like that, part if you want to do something stronger, and you need some research keys or uh, a key. And QKG, I think the technology is not mature right now, but it's being developed and hopefully, right, um, I mean, we're hoping a point for quantum internet, but quantum internet will be a future. So at some in the future, hopefully, I think we just move to QKG and would be used as we are. Okay, I think, yeah. Thanks a lot for your talk and uh, taking time out for, for this event, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, hosting your talk and thank you for our questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so next we have Prabhanjan Anand and he's a assistant professor in the computer science department of uh, University of Santa Barbara. He got his PhD in UCLA and then a postdoc at MIT. Uh, he will be talking about advances in unclonable cryptography. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good.
Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, thanks for giving me an opportunity to uh, talk at this summit. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, unclonal cryptography. Uh, we will see what it is, um, uh, what sort of problems uh, it can solve in practice and uh, what lies ahead in the era horizon. So like the previous two talks, uh, this, this is, I would say, relatively less well-explored well area and there's still a lot of rich, interesting questions uh, to be explored. Um, okay. So given the advances of uh, quantum computing, it's, it's sort of important to understand uh, how quantum computing can affect cryptography. So there are two ways to look at it. Um, either you can be a pessimist and say that, you know, quantum computing is very harmful to cryptography. Uh, the future of cryptography looks very bleak. Uh, and there's still some evidence to sort of uh, share this pessimistic view because of uh, the famous uh, Schur's factoring algorithm. Uh, that breaks RSA crypto system and many other crypto systems that are based on number theoretic assumptions. Um, or else you can be a bit more optimist uh, and think that, you know, maybe quantum computing is very useful to cryptography. You can use it to build cryptographic notions uh, that we wouldn't know how to build otherwise. And here, uh, there are some interesting uh, sort of notions that you can study. Uh, so one is quantum key distribution that we already saw in the previous talk. Uh, so the, the other one is, uh, which is relatively well explored, less well explored is unclonable cryptography. So what is uh, unclonable cryptography? Um, so the core principle of uh, unclonable cryptography is this. So it leverages the no cloning principle of quantum mechanics to solve some problems that are uh, uh, motivated uh, from, from the real world privacy problems and these problems cannot be solved using classical technology. So that you can actually provably show that you cannot solve these problems using classical technology. And um, using the no cloning principle of quantum mechanics, you can actually build, uh, solve these problems com by coming up with new cryptographic notions. Uh, and just so that you're uh, sort of familiar with what uh, a no cloning principle is, it, what it roughly says the following, that given a quantum state, um, just a single copy of the quantum state, you should not be able to produce two copies of the state. Okay, so that's what uh, the no cloning principle says. Uh, you would sort of think that this is sort of a restriction. Uh, this, this principle uh, makes things more restrictive uh, for quantum computers, but it turns out that for cryptography, this principle is very useful. So to understand um, what sort of problems uh, this, this area solves, let's consider some examples. So one problem to consider is uh, secure delegation of signing keys. Um, so let's look at an example where there's a manager um, and this manager wants to go on a vacation or he wants to temporarily delegate their duties to another employee. So what they can do is they can sort of share their signing key uh, to an employee where this signing key can be used to, sol uh, used to sign some documents that only the manager was authorized to do so. And once the manager shares the signing key, the employee can actually sign the uh, documents on, on the behalf of the manager. And then uh, after some point in time, the manager returns back, a um, uh, manager comes back and then it, the, the manager asks the employee to return back the signing key. And the guarantee we want is that once, we, once the manager asks the employee to return back the signing key, the employee should no longer be able to sign the documents um, that the manager uh, was able to do so. And this is not a, it's not a, a problem, and this is a problem that has been studied for, uh, I would say, more than two decades. It comes up in sort of different, uh, under different names, such as proxy signatures, delegatable signatures, and so on. And it has some uh, applications, such as uh, in escrow uh, services, where you temporarily authorized a third party to sign legal documents on your behalf. It also comes up in voting systems and, and many other applications. Um, the way I have stated the problem, it's sort of impossible to solve classically. Uh, if this uh, signature key is, uh, is a, a binary string, then the employee can always have copies of the string lying around. And even though he returns back, the, returns back this uh, 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 signing key, there is no guarantee that the employee is not sort of misusing the signature key to sign other documents. 
So this problem is sort of unsolvable using classical technology. On the other hand, if you allow the uh, signing key to be a quantum state, um, so then there's still some hope. So in this case, what the manager can do is it, it can ask the employee to return back this uh, quantum state. And you can sort of be guaranteed that the employee will no longer have the ability to sign messages. And the reason is if the employee was able to have a copy of the signing state and then also return back another copy of, of the signing state, then it means that given just one copy of the signing state, it was able to create two copies, which from the no cloning principle should be impossible. Um, and more formally, uh, you can consider, you can sort of come up with a new unclonable cryptographic notion uh, with the following sort of security guarantee. Um, so you should think of A or Alice to be the adversary. It receives as input a signing key, which is a quantum state. And then it creates a bipartite state uh, that is shared by Bob and Charlie. So the goal of the uh, adversary A is to sort of clone the uh, the signing state. In, in other words, uh, it it wants the signing state to be on both the partitions. And what we want to argue is that, uh, suppose let's say Bob and Charlie receive these two partitions and then receive two messages, XB and XC, uh, and it produces signature sigma B and sigma C. The probability that uh, both these signatures are valid signatures is negligible. So in other words, um, if Alice did manage to clone the state, then Bob and Charlie can actually uh, uh, produce signatures on messages XB and XC, in which case this probability will not be small. So this security property sort of prevents the adversary A to be able to clone the, the signing state. And you might think that you know, this is a very strong notion to achieve. Is it even possible to achieve? And it turns out that using sophisticated uh, cryptographic uh, assumptions, this, uh, this notion can be achieved. Okay, so let's look at another problem, which is that of copy protecting software. Um, so there's an organization which is uh, producing uh, proprietary software and selling it to different users. This organization wants to ensure that the user doesn't illegally use the software and uh, redistribute to other parties without the consent of the organization. I mean, it's not, a, you know, this is a very sort of uh, fundamental problem and, uh, it's actually costing, um, you know, the, uh, the the U.S. government billions and billions of dollars uh, annually. Um, and the goal here would be to uh, ensure that, given just like one copy of the software, uh, the user is not able to produce uh, many copies of the software. Uh, and again, if the software is represented as a classical string, then this is sort of impossible to achieve. Uh, but once you start allowing the software to be a quantum state, then then you're back in business. Okay, so uh, how do you uh, formally define the security guarantee here? Um, again, it can be defined using a similar game as what we did for signatures. So there is Alice who receives as input uh, copy protection of F. We should think of F as a software. Um, and then um, Alice... The goal of Alice is to produce two states such that both these states have the same functionality as F. So in other words, um, given the two inputs XB and XC, Bob should be able to predict F of XB and Charlie should be able to predict F of XC. So this means that both Bob and Charlie have the ability to, to uh, 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 implement the functionality F. And what we want is that uh, the probability that both of, both Bob and Charlie can simultaneously produce uh, f of x b and f of x c should be uh, very very small. Okay? So the trivial success probability you think of it to be very very small. Okay, so this is also a problem that has been uh, uh, studied a lot in the theory, theoretical quantum cryptography literature. Okay. So another problem that actually came from uh, uh, you know one of the uh, uh, main people in Ethereum. So they wanted to solve this blockchain consensus problem, which is that um, uh, there's a transaction, there's a set of transactions that you want to verify, and there's a set of uh, users who talk to each other and uh, come up with a consensus whether to validate the transaction or not. Okay, so this is sort of the goal. So there are users, they talk to each other, they want to verify that whether the transaction is valid or not. And um, 
towards solving the this sort of consensus problem. So one sort of critical problem that comes up in the solution is uh, what is referred to as an equivocation problem, which is that the user, uh, you know, at any point in time in any session should only be able to sign one message. So it has a signature key and it should only be able to sign one message. Again, if you think about it, again, if the signing key is classical, this is impossible to achieve. Whereas uh, if uh, you allow the signing, uh, uh, the signature key to be to be a quantum state, then you can uh, come up with some security notion that is meaningful. More specifically, you can say the following, that I give you the signature state, um, and uh, you need to produce signatures on both bits zero and one. So let's just think about uh, signatures on one bit messages for now. Um, so you as an adversary should be able to produce two signatures, sigma zero and sigma one, and you win if uh, both the signatures are valid signatures on, on these two bits. And ideally what we want is that uh, the probability of success should be very small. So in other words, what this is saying is that if I give you the signature key, either you can produce signature on bit zero, in which case you lose the ability to produce signature on bit one, or you're able to produce a signature on bit one, in which case you lose the ability to produce signature on bit zero. You can never produce both the signatures at the same time. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is roughly what it's saying, that you can only produce one signature from, from the state. Okay, so I've uh, discussed some definitions. So let's see some construction, um, and you know, maybe you'll get a feel of uh, how do we go about constructing unclonable cryptographic notions. Okay, so um, the first part uh, in the construction is the key generation algorithm. So I need to tell you how to generate the signing key. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to pick uh, a basis theta uniformly at random. This dollar sign just says it's uniformly at random from all the n bit strings. Similarly, I'll also pick uh, the string x uniformly at random from all the n bit states, uh, uh, all the n bit strings. And then I compute uh, h theta x, which is really the BB84 state. If, if you're already if you're already familiar with it. Okay. So how do you verify? So in order to verify, uh, I'm going to give you a program. So unfortunately, I cannot tell you the description of the program. If I tell you the description of the program, then you know all security is lost. So instead, I'm going to put the program inside of trusted hardware, where you cannot see the implementation details of it, but you still have the input-output access to it. So what this program does is it takes a input uh, message bit uh, and a string y, and then it checks the following. So if the message m is zero, then in all the locations corresponding to theta equals zero, it checks if X and Y agree with each other. And if M is one, it's gonna do the opposite. It's gonna look at all the positions where theta equals one and then check if uh, X and Y agree with each other. Okay, so this is uh, this is the verification key. And the signing algorithm is, uh, is uh, very simple. So given as input a message with zero, um, you have the state h theta x. You measure all the bits, qubits in the computational basis. Uh, if message uh, uh, is is one, then you apply Hadamard on all the qubits, and then you measure in the computational basis. And then you get some outcome y, and this outcome y will be designated as a signature. Okay. And you can actually check that uh, uh, if you indeed sign correctly, then this program p accepts this y. Um, because if m is zero, then corresponding to all the positions theta equals zero, you do get x i equals y. And similarly, even this condition is satisfied. Okay, so this is the this is the construction. Um, so let's see why uh, is this secure. So the core uh, underlying idea behind the behind the proof is the uncertainty principle. Uh, which says that uh, you cannot simultaneously measure a state with respect to two non-commuting measurement bases. So in other words, if you have two non-commuting measurement bases, if you measure with respect to one basis, then all the information that was encoded with respect to the other basis is lost. Uh, similarly, uh, the similar vice versa also holds. Um, so more concretely, what this says is the following. Um, so given the BB84 state, 
you cannot simultaneously produce two strings, uh, Y comp and Y Hadamard, such that um, with respect to all the positions corresponding to theta equals zero, X agrees with the Y comp string. And with respect to all the bits corresponding to theta equals one, um, Xi agrees with the Hadamard string. Um, so this is something that you can sort of formally pr uh, prove using quantum information theory. Um, what does this mean? This means that uh, it is infeasible to produce uh, signatures on both bits zero and one. And why is that? If you look at it, Y comp is really the signature on bit zero and Y Hadamard is really the signature on bit one. And this says that you cannot simultaneously produce signatures on both zero and one. That's that's really the essence of the proof. Okay, so what is the advantage of this construction? It's very simple. It uses BB84 states, which means that uh, all the really nice, interesting uh, experimental work that is happening in the QKD literature could potentially be leveraged to to uh, actually implement this construction. So another nice uh, advantage of this construction is that there is no long-term me quantum memory required. Um, so, for instance, when it, uh, you know, suppose let's say I want to either generate a signature on bit zero or bit one, then what I can do is whenever I'm ready, I can ask you to send over the state, and immediately I, I can either measure in the computational basis or the Hadamard basis, depending on what the mes message bit is. I don't need to store this state for a long period of time. So this is the advantage. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, it uses trusted hardware. Um, there have been a lot of cryptanalytic attacks on uh, trusted hardware, such as uh, Intel XGX and so on. So we would rather not uh, uh, use trusted hardware. So the other disadvantage is that it's not noise tolerant. So suppose let's say I'm sending the state and some of the qubits get corrupted. Uh, then there's no longer the guarantee that you can still uh, generate valid signatures. So the second part, Fortunately, can be solved. Uh, there have been some. There's a recent work uh, uh, that shows how to uh, make the scheme noise tolerant. Uh, unfortunately, the trusted hardware is a more serious issue, uh, and we would need to significantly change the construction in order to handle it. Um, the reason why we need to change the construction is that uh, there has been there's a work by uh, Lutomorsky who showed that. Uh, any sort of uh, private verification of uh, any scheme where you need to sort of privately verify the BB84 states uh, can be uh, it's sort of tantamount to uh, the superposition attack. So suppose let's say instead of giving you the program in the putting the program in the trusted hardware, suppose let's say I give you some sort of like a scrambling of this program in the clear. So then. Uh, you can sort of run this program coherently uh, and you can uh, implement this this attack and, and sort of like break the scheme. Instead, what we are going to do is we are going to move away from bb 4 states and instead use what are referred to as subspace states. So a subspace state um, is uh, another thing with this a uniform superposition or all the vectors in a subspace. Uh, and the subspace needs to be of some non-trivial dimension. Um, so what is this, uh, what is the advantage of using subspace states? Uh, it doesn't have the same sort of disadvantage of BB84 states. Uh, it, uh, it can be used to sort of, uh, when, when implemented correctly, it can be used to resist the, this Lutomorsky attack. Okay. So let's see how the scheme would look like if we were using subspace states. Um, so uh, in, as part of the key generation algorithm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first sample uh, a random, um, uh, you know, n over two dimensional subspace, uh, and then I'm going to create the uniform superposition over all the vectors in this uh, in the subspace, um, and then the verification key is going to be something in the clear. Uh, but I can't still give you the program in the clear directly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of scramble it. Um, so more formally, uh, you should you need to apply what is referred to as mathematical obfuscation on top of P in such a way that uh, this mathematical obfuscation sort of hides the implementation details of the original program. And effectively, all you have is the input-output access to this program. So what does this program do? This program uh, takes as input uh, uh, the message M, it takes as input the string Y, um, and then, uh, oh, this should be Y, 
uh, if the message bit is uh, zero, then it's going to check if uh, the input y belongs to the source space. And if the message bit is one, then it's going to check if this uh, y belongs to the orthogonal subspace. You know, this, this consists of, uh, this, this dual subspace consists of all the vectors that are orthogonal to A. So why am I doing this? Um, it will become clear as soon as I describe the signing algorithm. Uh, here's the signing algorithm. So given as input a message bit, uh, if it is zero, I'm going to measure all the qubits in the computational basis. If it is one, then I'm going to measure all the qubits in the Hadamard basis. So note that uh, if m is zero, then I'm literally measuring this state, uh, the state A. So I'm going to get a vector in the subspace. So clearly the first check is satisfied. So if m is one, um, what I'm effectively doing is I'm going to apply Hadamard on all the qubits. Um, and you can actually show that uh, this state is transformed into uh, a ket a perp, where ket a perp is the superposition of all the uh, vectors in the dual subspace. So which means that if I measure, if I apply Hadamard and then measure, I'm going to get a vector in this uh, dual subspace. And so even the second check is satisfied. So this is pretty much the uh, the, the construction that, uh, at least on paper, sort of prevents the uh, attack uh, uh, with uh, with respect to the BB84 state construction. Okay, so what are the main disadvantages with the construction? So one is that uh, we are using subspace states and they are highly entangled states. Uh, and maintaining uh, entanglement is a, is a huge problem in the, in the existing quantum computing architecture. Um, and so it would be good to sort of move away from subspace states and uh, look at states that have a uh, low entanglement measure. So another sort of disadvantage is that it's not no accelerant. So unlike the BB84 based construction, uh, we don't have uh, good techniques yet to, to handle noise here. So the other issue is that it's sort of difficult to prepare. Uh, in the case of BB84, it's just applying uh, Hadamard's on all the qubits either you apply Hadamard or not on all the qubits. Whereas here, um, you have to solve a system of linear equations coherently, uh, and the quantum circuit for it is, uh, will have a large enough depth, which again causes problems if you want to implement it uh, in, in the, using near-term computers. Okay, so this, is, uh, this was uh, uh, sort of the state of the art and using like one-time signatures to solve the blockchain consensus problem. So what other uh, pr problems are out there that can be solved using electronic cryptography. Um, so there is this uh, clause in uh, GDPR that is referred to as uh, right to be forgotten. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in essence, what this says is that uh, suppose, let's say you as the user has some data that is stored um, on some uh, server that belongs to some organization. Um, you need to have, if, if at any point in time you want to delete it, then you should have every right to do so. You should be able to go to the company and say, please delete my data, and that the company should delete all the user's data immediately. Um, so more formally, the user you know, has this data in the, in the server side, and it sends the delete, delete my data command to the server, and the server should immediately delete. The question is, how do you ensure that the server has actually deleted your data? Again, it can keep copies of it. Uh, you never know whether it has uh, actually deleted or not. How do you probably show it can delete your data? Um, so we don't know how to sort of solve this problem for arbitrary data, but for data that is, that is of cryptographic nature, you can use quantum mechanics to solve the problem. So suppose, let's say, the user has uh, stored its uh, uh, encrypted data on the server. Um, then it can issue the delete my encrypted data command to the server. And in this case, uh, we want to ensure that the ciphertext is, is provably deleted. So in other words, uh, the server should not be able to clone, you know, many copies of the ciphertext. If it's able to clone, then, you know, it can, it can sort of return back one of the copies and keep the other copies uh, to itself, which, which should be illegal. Okay. Um, so formally, what you can, uh, the, the way you can define is that uh, the adversary receives as input some ciphertext. Uh, the goal of the adversary is to create multiple ciphertexts in such a way that all these different ciphertexts uh, decrypt to the same message M as before. Okay, so I'm not going to explain this uh, in more detail, but uh, this is sort of the 
intuitive explanation of the security definition. Uh, of course, what we want is that the probability that the adversary succeeds in cloning should be, uh, you know, roughly half. Okay, um, so I don't know how much time I have to go uh, into too much details, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll give you the essence of the construction and leave the proof details. Um, you know, if, you, if you're interested, I can talk about it offline. Um, so the construction is, again, inspired from the BB84 construction. Um, so the, the encryption key consists of the BB84 basis state, uh, and to encrypt, you create the BB84 state, uh, and then you also hash the input X, which is part of the BB84 state, uh, and then you XOR the output of the hash uh, with the message bit that you want to encrypt. So decryption is easy. If you have the basis, then you can sort of remove the hash theta to get X, uh, and once you have hex, X, you can hash it. Uh, and then recover the message. Okay, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how to prove its security, uh, but the core idea is to use uh, this very fundamental result in quantum information theory, which is the monogamy of entanglement. Roughly what it says is that uh, it can't be the case that there are three parties uh, that have like a shared tripartite state, such that any two uh, partitions are maximally entangled. So very uh, useful sort of result that has been used to prove security of quantum key distribution, position verification, and so on. Um, and yeah, I'm not gonna go into the details of uh, what monogamy of entanglement is, uh, uh, but roughly the high level idea of proving the security of our construction is to sort of reduce the security of our construction to uh, to show that if, if, there's a, if there's an adversary that breaks our construction, then there's an adversary that breaks the MOI game. And we have very good uh, bounds for uh, for the MOE game. Uh, and so uh, by leveraging these bounds, you can show that there cannot exist any adversary that breaks our encryption scheme. So this is sort of the high level idea. Um, yeah, this is proof of contradiction. And just to summarize, uh, unclonable cryptography is, a, is, is a, an emerging area that has the potential to solve many interesting uh, real world problems. We saw today how it could be used to protect signing keys, encryption keys, uh, one, um, even copy protect software, um, and, and many more. So what, I, what sort of lies ahead in the horizon? Uh, the current agenda is to really get a sense of the area of unclonable cryptography, what sort of uh, problems it can solve in practice, um, to establish feasibility results to understand whether these primitives are even possible. But uh, a future goal, uh, hopefully in the coming years, would be to uh, sort of push the implementation of these unclonable primitives uh, closer to practice. So many of the constructions of these unclonable primitives, as we saw, you leverage as BB84 states, which is the same type of states used in QCARE technology. And as, as I said, uh, hopefully leveraging uh, this like wonderful uh, work in the experimental QCARE literature, the hope is to um, use that to, to uh, build unclonable primitives in practice. Uh, there are many challenges in that regard. The question is whether we use BBD4 states or subspace states, uh, which is the question of entanglement. Um, you know, one is highly entangled, one is not entangled. Uh, ideally, we would want to use BBD4 states, but there are only so many problems it can solve. The other use is whether the primitive uh, it needs is, is a one-time use or multi-time use. Uh, if it is a one-time use, like one-time signature, then you can immediately measure uh, after receiving. Whereas if it is more like copy protected software, then you need to store the state for a long time, which is which is an issue with the current uh, existing quantum technology. So maintaining uh, the quantum state coherently for a long time is an issue, and we need to figure out how to solve this. The other one is, uh, do I need to transmit the quantum state using quantum communication channel? Or is there a way for me to, uh, using probably remote state preparation protocols, to delegate the, uh, the preparation of the state to your side? So there, the another challenge is not tolerance that we really already discussed earlier. Okay, so with this, I conclude. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot for for this talk. Uh, it was very very nice. Um, there are a couple of questions that are coming in. So the first one is on the noise tolerance of the protocols. You did touch briefly um, on on how BB84 still has some noise tolerance while the other one doesn't. Um, 
So just how much noise tolerance do you have and what kind of techniques do you have to develop to have noise tolerance in these protocols, like the theoretical techniques? Right. Um, so regarding the rate, uh, I know that's some constant, uh, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2, but, but don't quote me. Um, mm -hmm. So regarding the kind of techniques, it's just uh, for BPD4, it's just using error correcting codes. Uh, you just need to use error correcting codes with good enough rates. So you just encode X using error correcting code and then compute HC to on X. Um, unfortunately, this technique doesn't quite work for subspace states. I mean, what are you on? What are you applying the error correcting on? Um, it could sort of like disturb the subspace state structure. Um, so that's something uh, it would be interesting to understand how to handle noise tolerance in that. Yeah. I see. Um, okay. The second question is: um, Is there any work to explore how to minimize the quantum hardware requirements for performing the protocol? Uh, for example, like does every party need to come have like a quantum computer or communicate with each other, or is just one way quantum communication enough? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, uh, the, in the protocols I described, uh, the the person who's generating the state needs to have the quantum hardware, and the person receiving also needs to have quantum hardware. But there have been some recent theoretical advancements where, uh, if I need to send the state, I could potentially be just a classical computer. There are ways where I can completely delegate the preparation of the state, uh, even without knowing what the state is from my end. Uh, so in that case, only the person who is receiving the state would uh, need the quantum hardware. I see, so this is sort of like, um, when you do the delegated quantum computing, you sometimes don't yeah. need that much requirement on one on your set client side. I think that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think. Uh, yeah, I had another question on the op uh, the mathematical obfuscation that you were using on your program. Um, is, is that hidden from the user, or is it like the mathematical structure? Is that sort of hidden from your user? Which no, it's just visible. Like I can actually, after obfuscating, I'll just give you the description of the code. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, that, that's the advantage of trust rate hardware. There, you're sort of really relying upon the fact that you don't know the implementation details. But with obfuscation, I'll just like scramble the code and give it to you. Mm -hmm. Even if you see the code, you can't. You should not be able to make sense of what is going on inside. You should only have like input output access to it. I see. Okay. Thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah. Thanks. Um. Okay. So let's just have a look at the poll results. I think you'll see it on your screen now. Okay, so we had the question, what quantum hardware development are you most interested in the next summit? And it seems that uh, the quantum memories and repeaters part is winning. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so that brings us to the end of the session, uh, but we, we're gonna take a half an hour break and then we will be, we'll be having another session on quantum safe security at Cisco. It's a very interesting session. Please join us for that. Thank you. I'm excited to officially announce our OutShift newsletter called The Shift. We'll be covering exciting news and developments across emerging technologies, business impact, and AI advancements. Subscribe today.
Thank you.
Welcome back to Cisco Quantum Summit. Um, I'm Luca Della Chiesa. I'm happy to host this uh, section of, uh, of the day uh, that will be um, covering uh, quantum key distribution, sorry, quantum safe uh, security at Cisco. Um, and uh, I'm uh, immediately introducing the first speaker that is uh, Dr. Mir Miralem Make. Um, Dr. Make is an associate uh, professor at the University of Sarajevo. Um, he has more than 10 years of experience uh, in quantum key distribution networks, uh, uh, specifically uh, with uh, uh, research related to quantum uh, service and management of QKD networks uh, with focus on real-time uh, traffic and utilization of network resources. Uh, pro uh, Professor Maik uh, has also participated in several European uh, projects uh, like uh, on quantum key, uh, on quantum cryptography, like uh, EU Open QKD and also NATO Science of Peace uh, Quantum 5 project. Um, he also um, built a unique QKD network simulator that is called QKD NetSim, and is also author of uh, a book recently published um, with the title Quantum Key Distribution Network, a Quality of Service Perspective. Dr. May. Uh, thank you, Luca. Thank you very much for the nice presentation and introduction. Okay, so um, thank you for hosting me and having the opportunity to speak today. The title of my presentation is uh, Quantum Key Distribution or Software Layer. So I'm coming from University of Sarajevo. Um, it's the biggest university in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Central Europe. And we um, if you decide to come and welcome, uh, I will be more than happy to welcome you in the city. Um, it's an Olympic city with a very nice infrastructure and a nice, very nice nature. Um, the university is one of the biggest in, uh, in, in the biggest one in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We participate in a lot of projects, um, and recently we participated in some very specific um, projects regarding the cyber security such as the Horizon Open QKD uh, Horizon 2020. And it was a very big project, uh, including a lot of partners around Europe, about 38 partners from 13 European countries. And it included QKD suppliers, QKD vendors, QKD network developers, QKD fiber infrastructure, universities, institutions, telco operators, and etc. And uh, besides our participation in this uh, and other European projects. We also participated in several, uh, some specific projects regarding the QKD, such as the NATO project, in which we investigated how to use and how to apply quantum key distribution in a 5G network. Uh, on the right side, you can see some of the base stations from the VHB Technical University Ostrava in Czech Republic, which we uh, cooperate um, very closely which are our partner in the project. And on the bottom side, you can see ID Quantique equipment that was used in the project for practical testing inside the 5G campus of VHB Technical University of Australia. So the main project and main, main the question, main idea is to see and to investigate the approaches, how one can contribute and one how can use the quantum key distribution practically in 5G network, where to use in front hall, mid hall, back hall, what are the experience, what are the problems, and what are the challenges to to finally finally use? So let me start shortly about uh, after this introduction. Uh, let me start shortly about the um, about the software layer that is the topic of my presentation today. So let's imagine that you have a two routers, router A and router B, and you want to connect them with uh, some secure VPN tunnel. Um, you want to establish. Um, connection that is secure using uh, cryptographic key. So 
this VPN tunnel can be implemented on different TCP IP levels. We don't go into details. It can be IPsec, MACsec, TLS, or whatever. However, what is common for this is that in, in, in the end, you need to have a, the key. You need to have a key for the VPN tunnel. There, there are several approaches for the key, um, how to obtain the key for this uh, VPN connection. One of them is about classical, currently available double key astrometric cryptography based on mathematical assumption, mostly with the human algorithms that are assumed to be breakable by quantum computers when they finally arise. The second approach is about post-quantum cryptography, and I'm not going to talk too much about that. We are going to have a presentation so after this one. We are going to present the latest results in this area. However, in overview, this post-quantum cryptography is um, aimed and it should be re uh, replacing algorithms for current public key cryptography with the new algorithms that are um, um, secure enough uh, not to be breakable by quantum uh, computers when they finally arise. The third option uh, that is of interest of our presentation is about quantum key distribution. It's based on quantum mechanics, and the main idea is that this uh, approach provides uh, information theoretically secure key. So we already heard about it today, and we are going to listen about that in the, in the next presentation. So in general, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, what is important only to understand is that the only QKD uh, provides um, only QKD provides uh, information theoretically secure way for establishing of the keys. Um, the major as aspect of quantum key distribution is to rely on the physical principles rather than um, um, com mathematical com complexity for establishment of the of the binary keys. And at the current goal, at the current uh, stage of the of the of the level of um, of the uh, on the market, the QKD is always implemented as a point-to-point -point connection. Um, however, as we said in the previous slides, the QKD doesn't provide uh, standalone security by itself. So it just provides you the key, and uh, you need to decide as end user how you are going to use this key and what is the um, adequate cryptography application that's going to consume this key. For the establishment um, of the VPN session, um, in general, the QKD link um, or the or the this approach of establishing the key based on the uh, quantum key distribution is um, um, consisting of two um, channels. Usually, there are two distinct channels between communication parties. One of them is quantum channel that is used for transmission of quantum materials some of the photon properties, and the second one is public channel that is used for verification of exchange key material. It is important to know that QKD link is an abstraction of the connection. It's a logical link. So in practice, it consists um, also additional channels. It can include for synchronization of the entities or synchronization of devices and et cetera, but uh, communication between key management system and et cetera. But, in general, it uh, consists of these two most important channels, and it can be defined as a logical virtual link between these two distant or remote um, um, locations. So finally, as we said, uh, if we deploy and if we use QQD devices for the um, for the um, establishment of the key, so we are going to have to uh, QKD assistance deployed on the secure location. It's on the, shown on this slide on the bottom. These two devices are going to generate the key with the, up to the limited distance. Usually at the current stage of the market, it goes up to 150 kilometers. The key generation rate decreases uh, with the distance and the current key generation rate is about up to 100 kilobits per second. So um, this is the, the most um, simplest approach. Um, in this case, uh, in order to consume the key, in order to fetch the key, you should have something what we called a key management system or key management layer. This is the red layer on the slide shown in the middle that is uh, in charge of processing the keys or processing the requests from the end users like your routers that is our writer, our router that is asking for the key. So the key management layer should um, analyze the requests and to find which uh, of these requests are re legitimate and how they can be satisfied. It is important also to note that 
Euclidean ink on the bottom, Euclidean systems, they push the key to the key management system. You can, it, it is on this side denoted as a green key that is pushed to the green box on, on the middle layer, key management layer. So the QKD systems constantly generate the keys in, in, in a constant rate and they push the keys to key management layer that storages, stores these keys in uh, key, uh, key storages, in key buffers. For example, they generate the keys during the night and then we want to use the keys during the day. So people fetch the keys from the storages, analyze the request from the customers, from the users, from the routers that are asking for the keys and then finally deliver them the keys that they can use for this uh, initial VPN tunnel that was the topic of the, of the question. Um, there are several protocols that can be used for this communication between the end users and the KMS. Of course, the most popular are Etsy protocols, Etsy 014 and Etsy 004. Um, of course, Cisco has its own solution called Cisco Skip um, that can be also integrated for communication between the application layer and the key, key management layer. So this is the simplest approach. This is the simplest um, use case for uh, communication, and it, I, I, I'm even, I can even say it's trivial. Um, the problem comes when we have a network, when we have um, connection and we want to establish a secure connection or VPN tunnel between endpoints that are uh, um, located in much uh, longer distance. So in that case, uh, due to limitation of QKD links, we cannot have a direct QKD link between point A, location A and location C. That is, um, we need to have some middle point. And in that case, we have um, QKD link between um, A and B. We have a connection also QKD link between B and C. Um, each of these systems is going to generate its own symmetric key um, that is going to be pushed to the key management layer. The key management layer is going to store the keys in its, uh, appropriate buffers. And now uh, we need to somehow combine these keys to finally that can be delivered to the routers on the application layer. This process is usually called key relay, and it's very important in the, um, in, in the quantum network. It says that in the first step, uh, key management layer should have a very um, synchronized communication using the classical internet connections, and they should communicate and decide that the keys that are stored in their buffers, first they need to be organized, they need to be um, precisely identified, they need to be synchronized. So uh, key management A, for example, can say um, to the key management B that he needs to encrypt his already uh, established key AB with additional key that is established with the, between the nodes B and C. So the first step is encrypt key AB with the key BC. So um, since the key management B at this stage, he has the blue key and he has the green key because he's the middle point, he's going to perform and uh, satisfy this uh, action if possible, and he's going to do that. So in the second step, he's going to encrypt the key AB a, with the BC and notify the key management C that he performed this operation. In the end, since uh, key management system C um, also receives this information. So um, since he possesses the key, uh, blue key, he's able to decrypt this information and decrypt the key. And finally, he's able in the step three, deliver the key A, B to router C. So now the router C is able to fetch the green key. Also the router A is able to fetch the green key from the key management A. And then in this step, uh, in the simplest approach, simplest scheme, we showed how uh, router A and router C, they can fetch the key uh, using using the key management layer. So users in the background, they are not aware of the, this and they should not be aware of this, of this whole procedure, but it's very important in this manner to say that um, users and user applications needs to have enough keys. They should never come into situation that they do not have enough keys and they should always um, have this key delivered timely. So they should not wait too long for the delivery of the key. And delivery of the key as our results from the NATO 5G project shows that delivery of the key should also have a very constant delay. So no jitter variations in, in the delivery of key because um, that can cause problems with the encryptors. Then they do not have enough keys for the encryption and they can jeopardize the security and etc. So 
it's very important that network on this uh, uh, red layer in the middle works very synchronous and it's work very um, precisely organizing the key, preparing the keys, managing the keys, uh, analyzing the needs of the customers and etc. And finally preparing the, the, the delivery of the keys when the customers are asking um, for the keys for their for the final purpose. Um, the initial step as uh, as explained in the previous slide can be also extended. So the first initial point or the first initial uh, location for the generation of trusted array key um, can be organized in an approach that um, node A or the KMSA can use the quantum random number generator to generate the key. And then this key is going to be stored in his storage the key is going to be relayed on the same way approach, same approach as explained previously, encrypted by the symmetric key on the location A and decrypted on the on the using the same symmetric key on the location B. Then the step repeats on the location B and C and C and D. And finally, we can also use this approach <coughs> to um, decrypt and encrypt um, and deliver the keys that are generated using quantum random number generators. So there are several variations of the trusted relay. In practice, um, this scheme shows that um, when the finally this three, uh, trusted way approach is implemented and it's finally used for the communication, uh, one can tear down the QKD network. He doesn't need to use it all the time, so he can basically disconnect this network and say, um, when the keys are already shared between the secure vocations, we can use them. Um, disconnect the QKD network, uh, re release the resources, for example, that we leased uh, or rent for the uh, establishment of the keys, and then finally we have enough keys and we can use them as a, as a resource for the encryption or directly establishing VPN tunnels between the remote distance locations. So after this short introduction in QKD network, one should ask about uh, how this is all organized from the QKD network stack. And this size basically shows that on the bottom, we have the optical quantum channels. We have optical quantum systems that constantly generate the keys. Usually in the market, QKD systems generate the keys with the maximum rate. So there are no some uh, slower rate or higher rate or middle rate for generation of keys. Keys are generated by QKD systems at the maximum rate they try to push and generate the keys as much as possible. So on the hardware, on the bottom layer, we have a QKD system and the following of, of equipment that is uh, consisting of the optical connectivity. On the middle layer, we have a key generation software that is uh, consisting of post-processing, sifting, reconciliation, privacy amplification, or authentication. And then on the middle layer on top, we have a key management layer consisting of key storages, key buffers to store the established keys and wait for the end user applications that are going to ask for the for the management of the, uh, for the consumption of the established. Um, why do we need uh, QKD management layer? So what are the main benefits of having QKD management layer? So the main benefit is that uh, it extends the QKD network. It allows the establishment of QKD network beyond the point-to-point -point connectivity. Uh, but it's important to know that QKD management layer is a software layer software layer, so it's a software component. Um, so this software component is also providing API interface to QKD systems. And as we already said in previous couple, uh, previous slides, it's all important to follow and provide the quality of service to the customers that are asking for the keys. Why? Because customers need to have this key timely, they need to have securely delivered, and that they should always be aware and they should be always uh, seek, um, be prepared and assured that there is enough keys for them to establish the secure connection. Otherwise, if they do not have this guarantee of delivery of the key or they are not uh, uh, secure that uh, they are not sure that the key is going to be delivered to them, then the purpose of the whole QKD network is coming into questions. And also QKD management layer, key and KMS allows the interoperability of QKD devices. So one link can be of one vendor, the second one can link of, can be of the second technology, for example, free space, and the third one can be optical connection, and etc. So key management layer tries to um, provide interoperability and merge all these keys together in the one QKD network that can work synchronously. As regards the organization of the network, it is also important to underline that QKD, if we have a 
uh, network topology as shown on the top. We have the two red points uh, denoting the source and the destination of the uh, of the network. Then um, if we want to have a, a establishment path, so this key relay procedure that we already explained, we are going to use some of the routes, some of the paths that is having enough keys for the establishment of the keys, basically the relaying the keys. Why? Because each time when we relay the key, we need to sacrifice the keys that was used in the middle points, in the middle links for the relaying purposes. We, for the security reasons, we cannot use these keys in, uh, once again. So we are going to find a route that is most appropriate for the key relay or the establishment keys between the red points on the ground. However, the usage graph, uh, uh, the usage path or usage route for the final usage of the keys establishment of the VPN tunnel can be different from the route that was used for the establishment of the keys. It can be used in different time and in different um, network organizations. The QKD network uh, can be, for example, tiered down and the uh, VPN tunnels can be established later. So this connection can be established later uh, using totally different routes. And this shows us that in this, approach, we have two different routing protocols. These two routing protocols can take different routes, different quality of service parameters, and different quality of service requirements, and they should take, uh, they can finally at the end provide a different, uh, different results for the establishment of the kings. So this is as shown on this pad, for example, we are establishing the connection between node A and node D, and we are consuming this route over the node B, where because in the buffers there are, there is enough keys that can be consumed um, for the key relay. At the end, on the on the uh, scenario B, when the, um, the connection over the node B is depleted, there are no enough keys in the storage. Then we switch to alternative node. We switch to alternative route over the node C that is going to provide us connectivity between the distant distant nodes. Uh, as regards standardization, uh, there are several standards that follow the network. Uh, the most important ones are the, uh, from the ITUT that are the defining the how key management, where what are the most important um, um, tasks of this of this connectivity, and they are on this slide shown in the gray box. And one can see from this that there is a key supply, key combination, key merge, key, uh, key relay, key replay, key storage, key life cycle management, and et cetera, that is uh, includes in the key management operation. On the top, we have a key KD control that is in charge of uh, deciding about the access control, session control, configuration, and routing control. And on the right side, we have a management layer that includes subs functionality about the network management uh, organization. On bottom, we have a quantum layer that generates the keys and push to the key management layer. And on the top, we have application layer that is in charge for the consumption of the keys. So in these slides, we show also that um, QKD uh, management operations include uh, also can include QKD network controller that is in charge of key relay operations over the key management links. So they um, analyze the uh, amount of keys in key buffers, they analyze the requests from the keys, and they decide which route, for example, is going to be taken and how these key managements are going to perform and, and work in the in the satisfying the customer's request. It's important to underline the QKD network controller should never uh, see the key or uh, have the access to key. They should only have the access to statistics about the key that are available in key management uh, systems uh, that are finally storing these keys in their, in their buffers. As regards the organization, the QKD network can also have the centralized or distributed organization. In this case, for example, according to ITU standard 3802, the management of the network can be centralized. Then we have a local key management systems. Uh, each device or each location should be located in a secure perimeter. And then we have a secure QKD network controller that is uh, and centralized key management that is organized in the network. Um, in the centralized fashion. Um, of course, it is important to know that since KMS in this um, structure is um, the API interface to the end user, so it also can be vulnerable to attacks from the attacker. They can simply perform um, DDoS attack or DOS attack in support uh, based on the equipment that comes into their possession. For example, if they hijack the equipment or they are able to um, um, modify the request for the to the KMS sessions. So the KMS needs to have the ability 
to detect the, the uh, fake or, or, or the attacker's requests and identify or try to um, to, to, to push them in order to uh, favorize the, the requests that are coming from the legitimate users. So the KMS, it's um, the most vulnerable component in this structure because it is the push, the first point of communication, um, first point entity in communi communicating with the end user application requesting for the keys. Uh, as regards the network organization and as regards the network um, QKD network uh, quality of service or software layer, what we can use and what we can uh, what we can combine in these approaches. Uh, it's very interesting to see that we, for example, in our previous research, we uh, identified that QKD network is very similar to mobile ad hoc networks. Uh, why? Because in mobile ad hoc networks, there are also no hierarchical distributed nodes as currently are not available in QKD networks. So there are no quantum repeaters at this, at this moment, at least on the market. Um, there are trusted relay hop by hop approach, the same as a QKD as we already uh, described. And the amount of energy in batteries can be linked to the number of keys or the amount of keys in key storages. If you have enough battery in your phone, you can communicate. It's also the same in the QKD network. If you have enough keys, you can establish this QKD secure VPN sessions. The attenuation of the Wi-Fi signal uh, decre uh, increases with the distance from the link uh, on the antenna. So as far as you from the antenna, your we, uh, signal is weaker, and this is the same as the distance and attenuation on the quantum of optical fiber. So, as um, and the key rate decreases with the QKD system, then th this is very interesting similarity because it provides us some of um, some of the um, very interesting uh, approaches that can be mi migrated from uh, Manet networks to QKD. And we recently published uh, the book for those who are most interested about the quality of service. More details on these sections. Uh, they can find in the book uh, describing the problems, issues, and some solutions how to uh, satisfy all these questions that we arised. Finally, as regards Cisco, um, we recently started working on the Cisco quantum software layer. The main motivation for this quantum software layer is to have a software that is going to support key storage and key management. Uh, support also for ETSI's, uh, ETSI 040 and 04 and CISO, Cisco Skip protocol. What is important is to have the implementation and support of quality of service of QKD network. We already in the, this slide underlined some of the uh, problems and some of the challenges uh, in QKD network, and this should allow us when uh, finally um, uh, should allow us when finally uh, uh, to integrate and interesting users um, into uh, QKD network into some of already existing packet switching networks because without the KMS, without, without the quantum software layer, it is very um, limited QKD deployment and be always integrated in a point to point, point to point fashion. So that's it from me for, for today and I'm staying open for the questions. Thank you, Mirale. Um, we actually have a couple of questions uh, we received from. Um, so the first one is uh, what kind of routing protocol uh, is used for quantum key relay network? Um, well, according to the results from the previous QKD projects like the DARPA network in um, in the United States in 2004 and then also CQQC project in 2007 in Europe and then afterward uh, additional projects in Tokyo and other well, mostly the, the vendors are trying to use some of already existing protocols, routing protocols, uh, routing protocols, then just modify them and try to adopt them for the uh, for the purpose of QKD. So usually it's OSPF version 2. That is the most common solution currently used in, in the QKD network. However, what we saw from this implementation is that uh, this protocol was not, and these implementations were not taken into account the quality of service. They didn't consider, for example, conjunction over the quantum, over the public channel, um, the connectivity and interconnectivity between the public and quantum channel that is also very important and didn't include the quality of service. However, our results and our recent uh, research in this direction shows that quality of service must be taken and um, some uh, additional protocols or some additional variations can be taken to satisfy these needs. Okay, thanks. And 
<clears throat> one other question is uh, um, on the KMS. So, um, so you mentioned uh, so there may be a centralized or a distributed approach in the KMS. Uh, um, I mean, if you can comment, especially thinking also to the security problem that you touch in your presentation, uh, let's say what what would be in your in your opinion uh, the best solution? Uh, well. It comes also to the security problem because the central point can be the, the weakest point for the attacker to attack. However, it's important to, to, to see that the centralized solution is not always the best solution for everyone. Usually the centralized solution is um, interested for the networks that are, for example, telco operators or internet service provider that already have good infrastructure, good network organized, and they do not want to manage and they don't, do not want to border with the new technology or the new um, implementation of some additional devices. Let's, let's say in the, the, the basic sense, the best approach is just to use centralized control that is going to manage all the network and that's the simplest approach. So for this network, the centralized approach is, is defined as a most suitable. However, for some other networks, based on the requirements of the customers, um, there are also requests, requests, for example, uh, the, we do not want that centralized network, centralized controller uh, sees uh, amount of keys that are in our network. So we want to distribute that. We want to have um, totally independent from the centralized network. So such requests also comes in, uh, in possession and from the security's perspective, it's, uh, it's interesting to see um, such usage. In recent uh, research about the satellite connection and QQD networks in satellite, uh, several presentations and several search in the in these directions are also going that cent uh, distributed or centralized approach can be also used for such connections. So it depends for the customers and it depends from the end user who is going finally to manage this network because the network needs to be always secure and needs to be always available and it's important to underline that QKD network just provides additional top up layer to the to the existing network. So it just provides additional layer of providing the keys, you know, but the infrastructure for establishing the, the connections for the usage of the keys and et cetera, it's always uh, following the current available packet switching networks. So basically it depends where you want to use and what is the most suitable approach for, for the end user and, and customer. Thanks. Thank you for uh, a detailed you. presentation and uh, let's step to our second speaker for today, um, that is uh, Mike Luken. Mike Luken is uh, a senior uh, product manager in uh, Cisco Security and Trust uh, Organization and is uh, responsible for driving the development uh, of the PQC strategy in Cisco and uh, also uh, driving uh, the common uh, uh, component and infrastructure uh, uh, that will be then integrated by the various team uh, into Cisco product for uh, to implement uh, the quantum safe cryptography. Before uh, uh, leaving you the stage, Mike, uh, uh, let's uh, also uh, introduce a, a poll. Uh, so we, we, we will ask uh, where do you stand in your journey to deploy quantum safe uh, cryptography solution? Uh, so, uh, while Mike introduces the cryptography, you have time to to answer the question. The talk that Mike uh, uh, will uh, uh, cover today is using quantum safe cry cryptography to today and tomorrow. Mike, to you. thanks for the introduction, Luca. Appreciate it. So there's been a lot of talk in the summit so far, the large majority of it, excluding a, a couple earlier today. We're, we're talking about the end state with quantum computers and quantum networks and stuff like that. You know, what I'm focusing on in this short talk is, is the near-term solution, which is how do we apply quantum safe cryptography to protect today's networks? You know, you, you heard some of this probably before in looking at the types of cryptography that, that's secure and which isn't. Uh, symmetric cryptography, we believe, is secure as long as you have a, uh, a sufficiently sized key. Asymmetric cryptography, flat isn't. 
you know, and it's used for a tremendous number of really important things. It's your identity. It's used for signing and, and key establishing you know, authentication and, and stuff like that. It, it it's it's believed to be broken. There's a lot of shores algorithm and stuff like that, but that's that's the one that the majority of us are focusing on. Um, uh, this kind of highlights what I said before. The, the belief is that once a quantum computer is available, it'll be able to take a public key, do its magic, and and pop out the private key, and then it can apply that private key against all the messages that it has, and and figure out what's happening. Um, yeah, you've heard about the capture data encryption keys. That's a pretty obvious one. Some of the other use cases that are significant in this space is uh, breaking secure boot. So if you're looking at the trustworthiness of all of your network devices, all the things that Cisco and other vendors are putting in there to make sure that your device continues to be what you expect it to be, be broken. You know, the endpoints, you can break the endpoints, you can even break the remote attestation. So it, from sitting from the outside, you won't be able to really tell uh, if if things are busted or not. So it, it's 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 serious, very serious, and everybody said that. Um, you've probably heard the top part of this a hundred times, right? You know, and, and when, when Hoy talked about it earlier, he said 92 years would sound like a really long time for the Canadians, but you know, Obviously, more than 20 years that I have here or the 10 years that I have here, people want to secure their data. You know, if you expect computer to come out in 2035, there's a lot of people with different opinions. You know, you've got data risk now, so you want to take take advantage. You want to do something to fix that. The one that doesn't pop up a lot is, is something I mentioned on the prior slide, and that is on your hardware. You know, you want your hardware, you, you you focus on your devices to make sure that they truly run your software, they truly are the end device, the identities of those devices are accurate, and, and it's harder for people to compromise those. Um, if you take a, a typical product today that's used an elliptic curve or an RSA today, you know, once a quantum computer is available, again, this is not a... a, a, a a copy now and, and and break later. This is one, when you have one available. You know, once this computer is available, I can become you, or I can create updates for your hardware and and pretend like I'm you because I can I can fake your signatures and, and put them in there. All all these bad things, so you can no longer trust your hardware the way you need to trust it today. So that's another aspect that that you need to pay close attention to um, as you're moving forward and getting closer to this magic line. So I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about what's happening to government. Many of you probably know this already. Uh, NIST had, a, a, I guess, a competition. I've heard different different words to describe it, but they went through an evaluation process. It was a global evaluation. There been several different rounds where they, they took algorithms in. They had industry evaluated, provide comments on it. And the NSA did, and NIST both did evaluations on them. In the middle of last year, they came out with their round three selections that says this is what i want to use for key exchange so this would replace the the rsa or does he help them key exchange with something that's supposed to be quantum safe and this is what they want to use for signatures so that the rsa and elliptic curve signatures which will be compromisable in the future these are the ones that they selected all right so let's say they went through that and they once they said they selected them they went through a long evaluation period uh, this past August, a little over a month ago, they came out with the actual drafts, which was the next step from stating what they were looking at using. Um, they are out now for industry comment, and they are expect, and that's supposed to close sometime in November, I believe, and they expect to finalize these standards in the middle of 2024. So this is a good thing. The bottom part of the chart says that hey, they have some additional key exchanges and and that they're being looked at some of them already been compromised so they're kind of off the chart but this was the list when they announced it in the middle of july something else to point out because it wasn't in that announcement was a, a prior standard um, from nist for lms and xmss these are stateful hash-based signatures um, they are approved today and, and you'll see how they are becoming really important here based on some uh, another standard or, or government directive gave you a minute so these are available today people can use them today some people are starting to use them uh, but we will talk briefly in a few minutes about some some 
significant challenges that industry is being faced with in using this. Uh, just, just to complete, there's probably been some chat about this as well, but the algorithm is a great piece, but then you need to update all the protocols that, that use these algorithms to make sure that they take things into consideration. I will touch on a couple of these in, in a few minutes, but there, there's a whole slew of them out there as it relates to how do you do certificates and, 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 and stuff like that. These are going through, many of them have been approved, many of them are close to being approved, so we, we expect that you know, by the time the algorithms themselves are approved or, or within six months or so afterwards, the most important ones to, to industry, you know, should be approved so that we can, we can start using them in products. So this is the other government document I mentioned earlier. It's CNSA 2.0. Uh, this is where NSA says, hey, I agree with everything NIST said I on the algorithms, and this is what I let me, let me back up. This is the, this is what they're stating in their requirements. This is how people with in the government that are buying systems need to apply these requirements where they're buying equipment. So if you look at the chart here, where the solder line starts, that's where they're supposed to be first. So if a a, a government agency is looking at two pieces of equipment. One has the, the post quantum, the other one doesn't, Every, and they're otherwise the same, they're supposed to pick the one that has the post quantum. Um, that, that's kind of how that reads, and that the final check mark says that is a hard requirement. You cannot buy a product unless it has this capability. So the, the probably the two most important ones on here uh, for, for what I'm talking about today is that the firmware and the software signing. This is the one that you use to make sure that the authenticity of the software that you're loading to your box, be it the firmware or the, the application or what have you, um, are validated with a quantum safe you know, algorithm so that you can verify that you have the right thing. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, this is most important today in as it relates to the hardware. So the bottom part of that chart where I talked about about things because you know you or your the governments will be buying equipment now that will likely still be in play within eight or ten years maybe crossing that line nobody really knows where the line is um, and but you have to have this in there otherwise it's kind of game over uh, the second one on here is networking equipment in 2026 it goes beyond firmware signing it, it talks about most everything else in there on the prior sheet needs to be in place. And, and I'll touch on some key aspects for that here in a few minutes. But those are some of the key dates driven by the government um, that industry is, is is trying hard, harder in some areas than others, trying hard to, to meet these requirements. Okay, so moving on how, the, how you can deploy this, and you've seen some of this before, um, and I actually build this out and, and talk about it. As I mentioned originally, you know, symmetric cryptography is safe if you use a big enough key. So if you can provision a, a efficiently sized key into your device somehow, and, and we can come back and talk about how that happens and use that for setting up sessions, that session will be safe. You know, most of the sessions, IPsec or MacSec or, you know, a lot of the others, they'll use AES-256 or, or something equivalent to that. You give it a key. You know, quantum safe in life is good. The the thing, the challenge that you run into in in most of these of these protocols is the initial key establishment uses, you know, RSA or elliptic curve. It and since that is will be vulnerable, um, that there's a problem. I'm not even going to say much about quantum key distribution other than it's an extension to what I just said. And Miralem gave such a tremendously excellent presentation before this i think i would be an insult to say any words on it but it, it's it's a way of using true quantum physics to to generate keys and then funnel those keys into devices so they can be used to create secure channels and the last one is what you what you hear a fair amount about these days this is quantum safe cryptography these are the new algorithms that are believed to be quantum safe uh, I think Hoy or somebody else earlier said that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to prove that statement. Um, and, and I understand that. And and uh, actually the next slide kind of, well, a couple slides out, let's get into that. But anyways, so that's that's 
these are ones that are believed. Industry and, and scientists and, and academia are doing this tremendous research on here to try to make sure that they truly are secure. Now, which one of you pick? It, you really, it, it varies for your ind independent thing. Yeah, I think I heard it best at the ICMC uh, conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's 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 probably not uh, an either or type proposition, although that may be in, in many cases, but like the government does for for their their classified data, looking at the security in depth. So there's probably cases where, you know, some of these work used together will likely make sense, but this is for, um, for industry to, uh, and the different customers to decide which is uh, what, what they favor. So, also discussed in an earlier presentation was, hey, you should either use a symmetric key or a pre-provision key or somehow use it with a, a key exchange. And there's a standard that's been out there in play for a while, 8784, used for, for IPsec or IKV2 is where you pre-provision a key, but instead of just using that key for all the sessions, you do the standard key exchange for Ike, uh, mix these together, and together you have a, 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 a quantum safe key that kind of varies with the different session, which is a, a good concept. This is being used in, in, in many products, both Cisco and otherwise. Um, this, this next thing, and I'll, I'll build it out, is just a, a visual on the different things I talked about on the previous slide. Manual provisioning, you'll you'll take a, a, a router switch or, or what have you, and, and you'll manually insert the key. Uh, and the second was with QKD, you have the whole QKD and the key, key management system, and you'll have a protocol. Here I talk about SKIP, because that's the one that Cisco uses, but there's SKIP, Etsy, and I heard earlier something about a, a desk queue, but another protocol. I expect they're all very similar um, as, as the industry looks and, and figures out where it wants to go. Um, you, you know, I expect that will eventually centralize on on, on a, a standard that are used everywhere, but th that's not super important today as with people look at it. It's really looking at, you know, is the QKD, does it make sense in your system and how it ties into systems and how you can use it and run tests. A key thing to point out here is the provisioning of the keys, either the manual keys or the keys are used to set up the SKIP API or the Etsy API or whatever. The APIs between the QKD and the initiator, that needs to be done in, in a quantum safe method. There, there's several ways to do that, but that, that's, that's a key aspect to make sure that when you're looking at deploying something like this, you figure out, okay, you know, how, how do I get these initial keys in there in a secure way? And the last one is, is pretty straightforward. We just, you, you, take out, I'm going to say it in an overly simplified manner, you take out RSA, you stick in Kyber, and you go on. That That is extreme oversimplification, but that's if you're looking at it from a operational aspect, i.e. you're a customer, you bought this equipment from whoever you're buying it from it, and you set it up, you know, you just type in the command that says, you know, use Kyber or, or whatever, and, and you use it that way. You don't have to have this whole uh, parallel QKD network to get the system to operate. So what Cisco and, and many folks are looking at is a, I call it a, uh, it's, I've heard hybrid and multiple key exchange. And, and what this is looking at is not relying on the new post-quantum algorithms. It actually uses both. You start off with initial legacy, RSA or, or elliptic curve key exchange that handles a lot of problem problems like fragmentation, but also then you would do a second one with, with Kyber. And the advantages are, are twofold for people that care about FIP certification by starting with an existing FIP certified algorithm, you retain that 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 FIP certification. And because and, that would allow you to use the, the secondary, the Kyber exchange. Um, the other advantage of this is, hey, I get quantum safe protection, but if we go three years down the road and find out that Kyber truly has a vulnerability, you haven't given up the farm to, to a totally vulnerable system, you still have the ability to rely on elliptic curve. It doesn't help you in the copy now and, and, and decrypt later problem, but it, it does give you some, some continuing protection while you move forward. 
one of the, the most important things you'll hear it from Cisco, you hear it from everybody else that, that talks about it is making sure that as we develop systems that have these capabilities, we, in, we have crypto agility in mind so that if we need to change from Kyber to whatever the next thing, thing is, you can do that very quickly with, with minimal downtime and impact to your system. Now, disadvantage here is, you know, standards aren't approved yet, but we're expecting them in uh, was about eight or nine months, something like that. So it's it's no longer years out like it was in prior times I've given this presentation, but you know, it's, it was getting pretty close. So th this is for ICV2, uh, for TLS, which is another one of the one of the other major protocols that are used in, in system these days. Similar system. They do it a little bit different. The standard isn't finalized yet; it's still a draft. But you're 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 doing a, a combination of of legacy and uh, post quantum exchange. Same same um, advantages for this as far as the FIPS. You also need to make sure you have the crypto agility and the same disadvantages that you know the, the standards are approved yet. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, in the area of uh, quantum safe signatures, there, there's there's two different groups. If you mentioned before, remember before I talked about LMS and XMSS, CNSA 2.0 says you, sh you should use these for firmware and software signatures. They're extremely secure, they're approved now, go ahead and use them. Um, and then you have the general purpose ones and, and both NIST and CNSA say, hey, we, we are recommending or requiring you to use the lithium. There are a few other ones out there. Falcom and Sphinx Plus. They're they're good for different things. Um, you know, Sphinx Flux has also came out with a draft standard here uh, a little over a month ago, along with the lithium. Falcom is delayed. It'll be a little bit longer before before they're coming out. A couple of things to point on here. You know, LDWM is a precursor to LMS. And if you happen to have a Cisco device, it's been in there in most of those for you know five or ten years. So most of them have that capability. Uh, I, I promise I'm not going to make this a Cisco talk, but there's two things I, I wanted to point out. Um, now there is a challenge here. You know the government wants this by 2025 or in network devices by 2026. Industry has gone repeatedly back to NIST and NSA and say your requirements are not tenable. They will not work. You know, the, the, the short story of this is you have to keep your keys in the HSM. That's a good part. You can't ex export them. That's a bad part. And, and the reason it's a bad part, there's a lots of different use cases. But if you can't export them, the, the keys, and, and you're using that HSM for a, a new device and that HSM dies, you can no longer do updates to that device. That's horrible. I mean, that's you, you, that, that's. That's a bad situation. There, there's similar situations to that. You know, the other ones, there's a limited number of keys and, and, and having to predefine it. Um, if, you know, you could run into a situation if you're not extremely careful where you run out of keys, it makes it difficult for you to do the monthly or quarterly updates you need to for CVEs and vulnerabilities. So there's some serious requirements issues there. Uh, I believe NIST and, and NSA understand them and they're working on two different proposals to fix it. One of the proposals is to allow a um, transferring of state, I think is the wording, where you, it's just kind of a partial export so that you're not limited to the lifetime or the risk of a heart HSM dying. And the other approach they're looking at is allowing the use of one of the, the, the selected algorithms, the one that came up as Sphinx Plus. It is also a hash based, it's, it's not stateful. Um, so, so he doesn't have that challenge. So NIST and NSA are trying to evaluate that and make that decision uh, and, and hopefully we'll get an answer. Unfortunately, they're saying they don't have an answer for a year. So when I get to, I think the next slide or a couple slides down, we'll see how this comes into play. So a really, really quick blurb here because people already asked me what is Cisco doing here? This is it, I can only tell you what they're doing today. So you, you can look at this and, and if you want to learn what's committing coming fast in, in, the, in the pipe or what, what they're looking at, you can contact your account team and they give you more details on that. And just to highlight again, we do have the LDDM for the hardware security. 
So this this is a slide I want to close on and, and spend a little more time on because it gives us the timelines to help us all understand well what can we expect. Because whereas I've been pushing our hardware teams to, to roll out LDM by the end of this calendar year, they can't. I mean they can, but it, it's it's not truly viable. So let's back up a look at here. So the standards came out in, like I said, in August. They're expecting the algorithm standards to be finalized in the middle of next calendar year. And we're expecting the related IETF standards somewhere between then and the end of next calendar year. Okay. So if you're looking at that from a software perspective, because these and the standards are required for like uh, IPsec or, or any of the, 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 the WAN, uh, the VLAN type, I mean, the uh, uh, IPsec or, or that kind of stuff, or MacSec or any of those, or SD-WAN, any of those type of solutions, they will need these in order to come out. Um, th this is the earliest you would probably expect is, is some 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 production-ready cryptographic software libraries, OpenSSL, or you know, different companies have variants of that, and others is likely in the early to mid part of 2025 to get the production software and probably later in that year is when they can start being available and rolled out into products. Okay, you know, there is a big question mark here because if you are you need FIPS requirements, you know, there, there's going to be a problem there because the current queue for FIPS is 18 months plus uh, and, and that's pretty, pretty pretty horrible for, for every vendor and actually anybody that buys equipment that requires FIPS certification. Uh, fortunately, you know, companies that use the multiple key exchange, they, they can rely on the FIPS certification for the legacy and, and they'll give some extension and allow them to move that up a little bit. So late 25 is, or, or in 26 is probably when we'll start seeing that the soft related stuff. Now, on that point, there are companies that have released pre-standards version of these capabilities. You know, if you, you know, from a development aspect, you know, Bouncy Castle has a lot of this in their Java imp implementation. Uh, Strong Swan has it in, in their uh, open source IPsec implementation. OpenSSH has it in their, you know, a version of this in their, their SSH implementation. And there's, there's a lot of other vendors are doing the same. They're, they're creating pre-standards versions that can be used for, for testing and, you know, for demo capabilities. Um, but it, until everything is standardized such that you have interoperability, you, you, you'd want to be a little bit cautious in how, how broadly you want to do that. So moving on to the next, the, this is the, the firmware and hardware signatures that I mentioned before. We're hoping they give us, announce what direction they're taking, because if they tell us that they're going to allow Sphinx Plus or, L, or, or not, you know, and some of these decisions, then we can make plans and, and try to jumpstart some of our solutions. But given that we don't know which direction they're going, you know, so it's a matter of rolling the dice and taking a chance on what you're doing. And the worst thing could happen is we roll it one way, you buy equipment that way, and then they come back and say something different. And then you have to figure out how to upgrade that equipment to use a new algorithm. So it's, you know, so there's, there's some issues there. Uh, again, here's one of the different standards come out. Uh, the one point I, I didn't talk a lot about before is one point I didn't talk about before is the identities in hardware. I, I mentioned the, the, the signatures and the signature verification, but you know most modern network equipment has a burned-in identity, and, and that'll be you know legacy equipment, legacy algorithm today, and and. And the most secure conscious way of doing that is making sure that it cannot be field upgradable. That that totally wipes out a, a, a vulnerability. Um, and, and the problem there is many pieces of equipment have TPMs that they use for storing these identities. TCG has not released a spec that has the new dilithium algorithm in there. Um, what the words that I'm getting, uh, TPM vendors are not expecting to have these out until the middle of 2026. So it's likely, you know, the the Tuno CNSA 2.0 network products deadline of 2026 is not likely to happen. But likely to be middle or end of 20 end of 26, or probably more likely 2027, unless something changes. And with that, back to you, Luca. Thank you, Mike. Very detailed as, as usual. So uh, before going to the question, because we have some question for you, uh, 
we want to see the result of the poll that we did. So if we can put on the screen. OK. Uh, since um, some some of you are observing and uh, someone is are evaluating uh, and see if using uh, QKD and pre-standard based solution. So uh, Mike seems uh, that uh, people are are worried about uh, uh, quantum computing coming and and uh, that they need to have a solution. So uh, first of all, uh, one of the questions that probably relate to, to this result is, uh, are there any plan for uh, hybrid post-quantum cryptography and QKD? So mixing them, I um, guess the I, question. I, I, um... I, I would say I don't really know the answer to that, but I happen to know what your demo is coming up, so I will uh, <laughs> I'll defer the answer to to the, the honorable uh, Luca. <laughs> I, I haven't seen a lot of it, but it's you know to be honest with you, when I when I when we talk to at the ICEMC and, and people looking at at, at 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 security in depth, you know there there I believe that there are cases where this will make good sense. You know exactly how it'll be used. I don't know, but I, I think it will it'll, it'll make good sense and will likely be used in, in 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 many applications. Okay. Another question, Mike. As uh, we always uh, hear about, uh, let's say, the cost of implementing uh, PQC algorithm in terms of resources. Uh, so, ca can you comment? Uh, I mean, how much uh, more would cost from a uh, processing standpoint or uh, algorithm standpoint uh, implement is such a new uh, PQC algorithm? I, I can't, it, it, it actually varies by the algorithm that you use. I mean, the keys are typically significantly larger. So from a resource perspective, if you're looking at an IoT device that is very resource constrained, you know, that's something that needs to be looked at closely. And frankly, that's the reason they have multiple signature algorithms that are being defined. You know, so they so they can address that. You know, for example, I am told that LMS signatures versus you know some of the RSA signatures about takes about a, a 10x time. You know, be, between the two, so it's going to vary. Yeah. Do you expect uh, some device to be, uh, I mean, limited or it is within? Uh, I mean, I, well, I, 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 I guess the answer to the question is what, what you know, depending on the, 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 the security levels that are required and the resources available on the device, you'll be needing to look at a trade off to determine which of the algorithms you're going to use in those instances. Okay. You know, if, you. if you've got a very large computer, you can do the, the Mac Daddy the best, but if you're really constrained, you're going to have to, you're going to have to do a trade off. Thank you. So, um, okay, we we have another poll uh, that uh, we we can launch now. That is uh, asking: Is your organization planning to deploy QKD-based PQS solution? That is uh, related to the next uh, talk. All right, and so that Luca doesn't have to introduce himself, I'm going to introduce him. He is the distinguished engineer in the optical architecture team of Cisco's networking organization. So a, a true leader here. Back over to you, Luca. Thank you, Mike. Let me prepare. Okay, my, my talk would go through sh showing a post-quantum security scenario that uh, we started testing in, in Cisco. And uh, so, and uh, what, I, what I want to, to touch in, in my talk is, uh, um, so you heard from Mike uh, about Skip, uh, so we will go a bit more uh, deep in uh, how Skip works and also how can be used. Uh, then to, to start looking uh, uh, 
So the, the challenging of, uh, of QKD, you heard about them in some of the presentation today. But uh, so what I want to show you is also, for example, when we talk about uh, mixing quantum and classical uh, channel into the same fiber. And finally, uh, we will uh, make a, a demo of uh, using a skip uh, with the pre-standard PQC. It's not a product, it's a demo. Uh, Mike, so uh, I, I will be a part of, the, of that uh, force that you mentioned before that uh, that are simply demonstrating the possibility to uh, to have uh, PQC algorithm uh, really available uh, uh, implementing what is not uh, been uh, yet standardized. Let's start from skip. So um, OK, skip uh, assume um, skip is uh, an acronym for secure key integration protocol assume to have an external device that is uh, a secure key provider. It can be a third party device um, that uh, obviously it is uh, connected to the Cisco box and uh, um, uh, provide the key. So the uh, SKP device can be a, a QKD device, but can be also a, a kind of uh, a device uh, implementing pre-standard pre PQC. So um, oh, the, the SKIP protocol is uh, substantially similar to the ETSI 004 protocol, provides uh, the key and uh, guarantees the synchronization of, uh, of the Cisco boxes uh, in using the keys. Well, how do we use uh, the, um, the SKIP? So let, let's look at possible configuration uh, of the secure key provider I mentioned before can be QKD or can be a pre-standard PQC. But if it is a QKD, uh, we should uh, think two possible configurations. So a QKD with uh, a dedicated fiber or a QKD with uh, the quantum channel that is uh, uh, mixed with uh, classical fiber. And uh, we will try to go to also to analyze uh, these cases first uh, and then show show the demo as I mentioned. But uh, when we talk about QKD, so you heard today uh, so about uh, different kind of QKD. Uh, so I'm not uh, so I, I don't plan here to 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 go all <laughs> through all of them. But uh, I want to distinguish so on what is available, uh, commercially available, and you, you can find, and what is uh, um, actually uh, still in, in the labs. So, um, first of all, you may find probably uh, tens of protocol uh, when, when we talk about QKD. So, very hard to get interoperability between boxes, even if a standard, as mentioned by Miral, and are trying to. Uh, at least uh, standardized at the software layer. Um, but uh, the commercial, the most common commercial implementation are the discrete variable I call uh, direct transmission is uh, normally called a prepare and measure um, that implement either BB84 or uh, B92 protocol. That substantially is uh, the case where uh, you create a um, quantum state uh, in normally in one single photon, um, discrete variable is one single photon that is transmitted on one side and received uh, in uh, in the remote side. Uh, it's not the only one, but uh, as I said, this is the most common when uh, when you hear about a QKD uh, commercial boxes. Um, now there are other uh, startup that are uh, start talking about uh, an approach discrete. Uh, sorry, uh, discrete variable, but entangled based, where entangled based we know that ideally uh, would be implemented uh, having a, a, a third node that is uh, sending uh, entangled photon in real implementation, none of, the, none of the implementation actually are done in this way, but are done using the so-called time reverse um, uh, MDI implementation where 
uh, the two end node send to a central node um, a photon that uh, are combined and measured, uh, a best state measurement is done, and uh, the result is uh, communicated back to to the um, to the two node Alice and Bob. Um, so in uh, obviously the the third node, uh, as it performs a best state measurement, can be untrusted uh, because uh, uh, it cannot detect what was transmitted. It can detect only if uh, the the status uh, that the measure is actually entangled or not. Uh, again, this is a, 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 new, a new implementation that is appearing. Um, why? The, the reason is that uh, um, discrete variable in some case has demonstrated uh, weakness uh, to side channel attack. Uh, measurement device uh, independent uh, in theory is robust uh, to such kind of attack. So uh, add, add uh, um, so have an additional level, level of security. Uh, alternative method that uh, start appearing are continuous variable uh, uh, with Gaussian modulation. So uh, differently from uh, discrete variable, continuous variable do not transmit a single photon, but transmit coherent states. Um, that uh, as uh, uh, pros and cons in uh, so the the pros are obviously an easier implementation because it does not need single photon detection uh, cons uh, can be uh, i mean in, in kind of performance that you can achieve so you heard also about uh, uh, the challenge of uh, qkd application the challenge of qkd application beside uh, it, that requires uh, uh, dedicated hardware. Uh, it is obviously in the quantum channel that should be an optical quantum channel because uh, QKD does not uh, exist uh, for other kind of uh, frequency, if not optical. Um, and obviously optical, if we talk about fiber, um, actually no, uh, sorry, QKD, uh, it is uh, actually uh, either uh, uh, depending on uh, transmittivity or square root of transmittivity that uh, when we talk about fiber, uh, uh, on a dark fiber, the reach uh, that you can see uh, reasonably is in the order of 100 kilometers, maybe the 150 that uh, Miralem was talking about. Obviously, this is when we talk about uh, dark fiber. Um, with the, um, the twin field that is actually uh, going in with the square root of transmittivity, uh, that distance can be slightly higher. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, so twin field is not one of the uh, technology that is currently commercially available. Okay. When uh, you reach the limit, uh, which is a way to, to extend uh, um, the QKD. So the, there are two options, uh, both based on, re on repeater. So you need to go to repeater. Um, so a repeater that can be in the range of 100 kilometer can be either a so-called trusted node. That means simply that the key is uh, um, decoded and re-encoded um, in, in the node that should be secure, or uh, the alternative way um, could be a quantum repeater. Uh, you heard yesterday about uh, the quantum repeater, so the quantum repeater can be used uh, to implement, uh, uh, sorry, to extend the, uh, the QKD and uh, uh, the two kind of implementation can be based on uh, quantum error correction or via the use of quantum memories. Obviously, both of these technology are still far, as you heard. So today implementation, when, uh, when you look at QKD, you, you are forced to go to trusted node approach. Okay, let, let's start uh, 
to talk about uh, what we did. Uh, so the first uh, collaboration and, and experiment that uh, Cisco did on, uh, on QKD was actually a time bin MDI QKD in collaboration with QTech and was done uh, um, in 2021. Um, so the uh, actually was a small network because uh, the distance were maximum 15 kilometer. And uh, uh, the purpose of the network was uh, actually demonstrate the possibility to have uh, a quantum channel and uh, classical channel in the same fiber, and was also start to, uh, let's say, implementing this approach of uh, a QKD system that was passing the key to a, a Cisco router. So the uh, the experiment the, and the demo was uh, su successful. Uh, it did not turn into a product uh, because it was just a collaboration uh, with them. Uh, after that, as uh, I mentioned, so we, we implemented Skip uh, in almost all our product and uh, um, that is either available or will be available shortly. And uh, we started uh, uh, collaborating with multiple third party uh, QKD vendor in, in order to uh, validate the solution. So Skip is uh, a proprietary protocol, but uh, it is open to any vendor that is uh, interested in implementing, in implementing it. So we spend them time to validate such a solution. Now, I mentioned challenges in uh, transporting uh, uh, mixing quantum and classical channel. Where these challenges are coming coming from? So the challenges are uh, the fact that uh, um, the fiber is not an ideal medium, and uh, the interaction of the light with the matter uh, create scattering effects. Such scattering effects uh, generates uh, wavelength f different. Uh, uh, different frequency respect to one of the classical channel. Now, classical channel are traditionally using uh, C band or L band, so 15, uh, 1550 or uh, um, 1600 nanometer. What uh, um, so uh, there are many proposals in uh, mixing. Uh, classical channel and quantum channel. And obviously, uh, one of the proposals is uh, move away the classical channel from the C-band and L-band. The problem is that only in C-band and L-band we have amplifiers. So if we want to extend the distance of classical channel beyond the 100 kilometer, we need to keep them there. So the uh, solution that is normally implemented when when uh, uh, there are mix of uh, quantum channel classical channel is uh, to uh, use the quantum channel in the O band so in the uh, 15 10 nanometer range uh, where uh, the injected noise uh, uh, from classical channel is limited now there is a drawback to to do it uh, that is uh, Fiber loss in uh, in the O band is higher, so it is uh, uh, 0.5 dB per kilometer, while in C band is 0.2 dB per kilometer. So you uh, you get immediately an impact on the on the reach of the QKD. Um, it is true that uh, we heard uh, from Reza that someone tried uh, mixing. Uh, classical channel and quantum channel in the C band, beside the fact of uh, the complexity in filtering, especially if you have an amplifier. Um, I mean, the, 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 level, the limitation that uh, that imposed to the, on the bandwidth on the classical channel is uh, uh, quite high. So it, it can be done just for uh, application where uh, you, you have uh, either short distance with a very limited number of channels. Um, anyhow, what uh, we uh, could achieve was that uh, uh, we success successfully operated 
a classical channel, a QKD, in no band up to 70 km with a single classical channel in C band. Okay, that does not sound so great, uh, but at least uh, we know that ca can be done. And what is the problem? The problem is uh, shown in that graph uh, on, the, on the right. So substantially, as I mentioned, there are some uh, photons are appearing, even if you have uh, just the classical channel. That measure was done without the, uh, the channel, the, the quantum channel at the uh, 1510 nanometer. So what we see is that uh, uh, we can get photons on the number of click are the photon arriving uh, that is are dependent on the amount of power that is launched in the in the C band and uh, that C band was a single channel uh, uh, at 1550. So as you can see, in order to let's say go down to the level of an APD dark count, you need to reduce the amount of uh, uh, classical power down to minus 4 dBm. Now, for a single channel, does not so, uh, sound so bad, but uh, I, I want you to let you think uh, that uh, the impact of, of SNR is uh, so high for classical uh, bandwidth that uh, uh, for that reach of 100 kilometer, so the fiber capacity reduced from 76 terabit, what we can achieve today, to 4.8 terabit. Uh, now, this is uh, the limitation, let's say, taking one of the boxes, uh, uh, QKD boxes commercially, that I mentioned before. But some of you may say, ah, but uh, I saw in uh, papers, uh, that are performing much better than that. And, and this is true. There are solutions. Uh, so the solution obviously is filtering. Uh, you can filter more than the 50 gigahertz that we did uh, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in our experiment. Um, but uh, you can also filter from a, a time perspective. So knowing when uh, the QKD photon should arrive, you gate, um, you time gate uh, in order to not receive a photon that are not uh, in and uh, would disturb your, your receiver. Now, uh, with uh, this uh, approach, uh, the bandwidth capacity for classical channel is actually improved. Uh, it, it would not reach uh, the full capacity, but would be they say impacted by only half the, the total capacity. Anyhow, the QKD distance uh, would be remain heavily reduced. So uh, the under 50 kilometer, under, under 50 kilometer uh, would be reduced uh, below 100 for sure, uh, most likely in the 70 kilometer range. And now, Let's uh, discuss uh, about uh, the use of skip. So the idea here is to demonstrate the use of skip, uh, and uh, we implemented, uh, but, I mean, ju just by joke, uh, a, a pre-standard PQC that uh, is uh, uh, actually running inside the, the router um, and passing using skip uh, the key. Uh, this uh, pre standard PQC is actually implementing uh, the, um, uh, the algorithm, uh, sorry, the RFC 93370, the draft mentioned by Mike before. It is uh, uh, implementing the Crystal Kyber 1024 that uh, uses a public key of uh, 1564 bytes. This is important, uh, you will see shortly. Uh, and just to remember, so the communication would be based on AES-256 uh, symmetric cipher that, you, that use a 256-bit key uh, in both cases. So nothing will change on, the, on that part. And now let's go to the demo. So 
what uh, I'm uh, uh, showing in, in this demo is actually the two pieces of software that uh, I call the PQC are, uh, have uh, an independent interface. Here, there is one of the two routers where I'm showing here that uh, is configured as PPK. Normally, the router is configured as SKA that you use uh, a, a, an algorithm implemented by MESSEC to, uh, to exchange the key. We call the PPK, in this case, uh, when the router is actually using skip to receive a public private key. Um, I'm activating in this demo a, a, a log that will show, so will pop up every time there is a, a key exchange between uh, the router and its uh, um, PQC agent. Substantially, every time the router asks for a new key, uh, you will see some messaging popping out here. Now, the router, uh, right now, the configuration is uh, um, ECDH, so elliptic curve de Feldman, um, so as it is configured, and we can see here in this window a Wireshark capture that is the communication that is happening between these two um, PQC agent. As you can see here, we have the standard IQ messaging that are uh, 300 byte, um, that are actually exchanging the uh, 32 byte uh, public key of the uh, ECDH. As I mentioned here, a message pop popped up and uh, okay, you cannot see, but here there is a 32 byte that is actually the uh, 200, um, 256 key that is passed. Now, I'm configuring right now uh, the PQC agent as post quantum in both sides. And now we will do a new capture. Um, uh, so we will force a new capture in a few seconds, where you can see now uh, the difference in the uh, Wireshark capture with some. Uh, unknown uh, packet uh, and fragmented packet. So this is the part of the protocol that uh, was shown before by Mike, that is adding the possibility to implement new, uh, to transport a new um, kind of uh, uh, public key based of different algorithm. As now the uh, Kyber is uh, implemented, as part of the key communication to generate the uh, the secrets, um, the shared secret, there are these uh, um, bigger packet to exchange. And as uh, the bigger packet is uh, 15, 1564, uh, is bigger than the 1518 of, of the Ethernet, the protocol has fragmented in multiple packet that unfortunately Wireshark do not understand. Uh, so we see that uh, it is uh, uh, labeled as unknown. Uh, as you could see, uh, now every minute, uh, now the demo is stopped, but every minute uh, we got an update uh, of the key and nothing has changed in the length because the shared secret, as I mentioned, remain computed as post quantum, but uh, the two, uh, two, 256 bit uh, that uh, the router then would use for the, um, for the symmetric cipher. With this, uh, I'm closing my presentation, so, but I will happy to answer any question. So, Luca, there's an online question I'll ask you first. Uh, and I guess while I'm asking a question, if you could bring up the poll results. 
and this is from Paul, says, if you time multiplex classical and quantum channels, i.e. only use each one for half the time, then it's not clear why the secure fiber length would decrease. So, okay. So the, the, the approach that we did was not uh, um, multiplexing over time, was uh, uh, multiplexing. So uh, normally, um, classical channel are running uh, full speed and uh, cannot be stopped. So they, they run today uh, for distance over uh, 100 kilometer at the, dist at the speed of uh, 600 gigabits per second. And so you cannot stop uh, to send. Obviously, if you can, if you could stop and uh, and insert a, a, the quantum channel, uh, yes, definitely there would not be any impact because the impact is, uh, uh, let's say, it, it is uh, the impact of the scattering that is uh, happening only when the channel is present. Um, and uh, the, the approach of the, the test was, uh, okay, let's see what happens when everything is together in the same fiber. Uh, so, sorry, Mike, I cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Luca. I, I think we're out of time, or do we have time for one more question? Uh, I think we have time for one question. All right, this is one I made up, so I apologize to you in advance. It says the approach that you have here seems to at least partially address the high cost of using QKDs. You know, kind of a, a multi-part question here is, and what's the impact in terms of reduced primary channel traffic? And the real question is, what's required to make this approach cost effective? Uh, sorry, the, the approach, uh, uh, which one you were referring? Uh, uh, I, I didn't get uh, my... This is where you're running the both the, the, the quantum channel over the same fiber as the regular traffic. Okay. Uh, so, Substantially, what uh, what uh, we could demonstrate is uh, uh, if you take a commercial uh, box available today, you can uh, reduce, I mean, reducing the number of channel, the classical channel, and uh, um, let's say reducing to a, a reasonable distance, you can definitely keep the two, the two together. Um, in order to achieve uh, the max maximum performance, uh, you need to implement something more complicated uh, that is uh, the time gated uh, approach uh, on, on the QKD that, uh, um, that would uh, definitely have a cost impact. Um, so, uh, Obviously, the, the best solution would be keep separate, but we know very well that uh, the, um, the challenges uh, very often are the number of fiber. That's why we started immediately uh, to go in this direction. Now, wh what I can tell you is that uh, we, we will not stop here. We will uh, for sure uh, investigate more and uh, we have started a collaboration uh, with un uh, with an university in order to uh, try to get uh, bet better modeling of the problem uh, um, and uh, and have uh, the possibility to predict uh, what it, what is happening now it, it, it is obviously this would not be uh, i mean would not solve the problem would be probably able to find uh, uh, solution to to limit uh, uh, the impact. That's uh, that's the purpose of the of the research. All right, thank you. Get just a comment. Your your approach it seems to align with the results you got on the poll. Either people aren't using QKD or they're using the same channel. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Luca. 
good. I think that uh, we are at the end of this session. Uh, we will have now a break and we will resume at uh, um, 1 p.m. Uh, PST. Hi, my name is Vijay Pandey, and I lead Outshift by Cisco. Outshift is Cisco's incubation engine, responsible for delivering what is next and new for Cisco in emerging tech areas, such as modern applications, generative AI, and quantum. As organizations rally to capture the potential of generative AI, much remains unknown. How can enterprises manage the complexity of AI-first products and tools to drive innovation? How do they determine the best use cases that can be scaled to achieve competitive differentiation? And what software and hardware solutions should be used to accomplish this? These are all valid questions. Today, I'm excited to share Outshift's initial thoughts on how the world is rapidly evolving with the advent of generative AI in our first ever AI series. It feels like it was just a few years ago, folks were talking about an AI winter, about money, research, and product hype, shifting out from AI towards quantum computing and other ventures. Now quantum is yet another function, step function waiting to happen, but that's for another day, another conversation. For now, with generative AI, we are rapidly and continuously evolving at exceptional speed. It's hard to keep up with everything going on. Difficult for us, even as technologists, to imagine the plight of the customers and the consumers and the creators. The questions we hear quite often are, how do organizations keep up with this space of change, stay relevant, build durable products or processes around generative AI? Where do you even begin? Like most companies, we too are navigating these complexities. There's a hype cycle the AI washing of everything. But this is a technology that will fundamentally pivot us into a different world for sure. At Outshift, we are seeing that generative AI is both driving up productivity and creating new products with innovations across applications, data, and models. Enterprises want to adopt generative AI and build game-changing products, drive up both productivity and value from it, Consume it and build products around it. There is a sense of elation in certain use cases and massive hesitancy in others. The hesitance comes from security, from trust, IP infringement, bias, fairness, scale, and cost concerns. As the technology industry evolves, we at Outshift want to help our customers establish their game-changing experiences and help them manage these growing concerns. We are eager to share more with you soon. Stay tuned for upcoming conversations with AI experts and influencers. We'll discuss how to deploy and manage AI in the enterprise and how to achieve the potential of enterprise-ready generative AI applications.
All right. Uh, welcome back to the Cisco Quantum Summit. Uh, we are at the last session of the day and of the summit as well. Um, hope you've uh, been enjoying all the talks so far. And uh, the last session is about quantum network protocols and software. And we have another distinguished set of uh, panelists here. Uh, two from my own group, Stephen and Hassan, and uh, two from and, and, and Professor Don Towsley from University of Massachusetts and, and Professor Ben Yu from UC Davis. So this is gonna be super exciting. And uh, as usual, please continue to post your questions. And uh, we have a new, new poll going on. Please uh, participate in it and provide your feedback. And uh, okay, without further ado, uh, we are, uh, the next talk is going to be uh, by Stephen Diadamo from our group. And Stephen is a researcher at uh, Cisco Research where he's leading the work around packet switching in quantum. Uh, he completed his PhD at the Technical University of Munich with a focus on quantum networks and quantum software, has degrees in mathematics and computer science. Uh, his recent work focuses on modeling and simulating uh, quantum communication in network applications. And uh, he's gonna introduce this uh, project called QNET Lab. Uh, that aims to unify the quantum network simulation ecosystem. Over to you, Stephen. Hello, and welcome to my Cisco Quantum Summit 2023 presentation. I'm Stephen Diadamo. I'm a Cisco research scientist. My talk is titled Unifying the Quantum Network Simulation Ecosystem. And in this talk, I'll be talking about developing quantum network simulation in an easy way. In this talk, I'll cover the following topics. Firstly, we'll talk about why do we need quantum network simulation. Secondly, we'll talk about what tools exist to perform quantum network simulation and develop quantum network simulations. Thirdly, we'll talk about the trends of those tools and where they're headed in the development phases. Next, we'll talk about a problem we're seeing in these trends and the way we're going to solve that at Cisco via our quantum network lab project. And then in the end of the talk, I'll demonstrate our quantum network development kit platform in which we're building to simplify the process of developing quantum network simulation. To start discussing why we need quantum network simulation, we should think about what it takes, firstly, for a quantum network to even exist. So for a quantum network to exist, we should think about three points. Firstly, there should be strong use cases for the quantum network. What problems can the quantum network solve that we can't currently do with today's technology? And are those applications strong enough to warrant building a quantum network? Secondly, once we know what we want to do with the quantum network, we should start thinking about the quantum capable hardware components necessary in order to actually perform those applications. And thirdly, we should think about the network control software that we will have to apply on top of the quantum network so that the communication can be performed in a reliable way. So in order to get clear answers to those three points, we can look towards three directions. And those are research, engineering, and community. In the research direction, we can look towards building applications and components and studying the designs for those components so that we can run the applications. With engineering, we can take it from theory to practice by developing the software needed to run the applications and the hardware components needed to run the, the software. With the community aspect, we can look at open sourcing that software so that more people can collaborate and develop the software in a robust way. And with academic research, we can use conferences and academic publications in order to disseminate all of the information. When working in those three directions, there'll be various problems that arise that will have a very similar life cycle. What we do is we have the problem, and then the first step is to come up with a theoretical solution to that problem and design a system that can implement that theoretical solution. When we have that design in theory, we can move to simulation and analysis, in which we perform the simulation of the network to see if the theory actually holds and that this, the problem which we want to solve is actually solved. With that, if there's any problems, we can reiterate, go back to theory and design, and update anything that needs to be updated so that the problem is properly solved. Once we do that, we can go back to simulation analysis and right through to a lab prototype. A lab prototype, we might learn something new about our solution and might have to reiterate and go back to theory and design, again through simulation, and again back through the lab. From there, we have a test bed where the environmental variables are a bit less controlled, and again, we might need to go back to theory and design and improve our protocols and designs. Again, through simulation, again through lab, back to testbed. We can go to a small-scale deployment. And then finally, we have full-scale deployment in which, again, might require more theoretical design, more simulation analysis, 
and go through the whole process once over. So what we see is life cycle requires a lot of simulation. And when we look at quantum networks, the current state of the efforts are mostly in theory and design, simulation analysis, and lab prototypes. Although there are some efforts in test beds, but still we're going to have to go through the simulation analysis phase quite a few more times before you know, we have full-scale deployment of quantum networks. So I've been repeatedly saying quantum network simulation, but I haven't really made it clear what exactly I mean when I say that. So a quantum network simulation, what I mean by that is it's a software program that simulates the aspects of a quantum network. And so what we do with quantum network simulation is we firstly model the hardware devices. So we can come up with mathematical models for the noise and the loss of the fiber, for example. We put those pieces together in the software. Then what we do is we want to simulate the communication between the network nodes. So how we do that is we use a random event engine. And what the random event engine does is it creates random events during simulation time that mimic the act of initializing a communication. And the timings can be controlled. We can control the probability distributions of how these random events are distributed. And it mimics exactly how we use communication in a real network. So this helps us to simulate the network traffic. And then with that, we have the timing aspects as well using these simulation engines. And what we could do with that is we can make estimates for the throughput, the latency, the noise, etc. And with that, we have our total simulation. And we can perform an analysis on that simulation to determine how well the protocol can work. So then what does quantum network simulation provide us? At a high level, it provides firstly a design validation. So by modeling our design using simulation, we can validate that the design is achieving the solution we want it to. Secondly, we can use it to develop applications. So since we don't have quantum network hardware available to us, not everybody does, we can use a simulation to interact with the hardware in a mathematical way in order to think about new applications. And thirdly, it can be used to predict network requirements. So if we have the timing aspects of our simulation, we can determine how good the hardware has to be in order for our protocols to be uh, executed reliably. So how does one create a quantum network simulation? How do we get all those four pieces that we need? We need to firstly think of the protocol we want to simulate. Secondly, we define the network parameters such as, such as the network topology, the hardware, and the traffic models. Once we have that, we're ready to start writing simulation code. Uh, we can run the simulation over various parameters like the noise, the loss, etc. And then what we do is we take those, those outputs and we generate plots, we compare it to our theory, and we write up a summary of all those pieces. And with that, we can perform a validation to make sure everything is ex working as we expect it to. When writing a quantum network simulation, there are various decisions to make when you're beginning. It's firstly, what aspects of the protocol are we interested in? Is it the robustness? Is it the throughput? Is it the efficiency? There are many aspects we would want to consider. And with that, we look to the second point, which is which simulation engine can we use to actually extract that data? Not every simulation engine is the same. And thirdly, what if the engine doesn't do what I needed to do? What if there is no engine that can execute the simulation we want it to? What do we do then? Do we build a new simulator? Do we build something for a specific purpose? So there is another decision to make there. So the tools that currently exist are primarily in these four categories. They are discrete event simulators, they're network emulators, then there's a third category of quantum key distribution simulators that simulate the key distribution parts specifically of the network and not a general purpose quantum network simulator, so you can't do everything with those engines. And fourthly, there are a variety of open source libraries that are designed for a very specific use, so they perform a very specific protocol and they're not very expandable to the general population who wants to do general purpose quantum network simulation or invent a new protocol to build on top of those libraries. And when we look to the open source quantum software ecosystem, most of the efforts are actually in quantum computing and those quantum computing packages are very rarely applicable to quantum network simulation. So if you look at the, the open source foundation who has compiled a list of open source projects, only a small portion of those projects are in quantum networking. There are various problems in which we've seen uh, w with regards to the quantum network simulation ecosystem. The first is that it's not unified. There are various groups of people working on network simulators that do a lot of overlapping things. Secondly, there are many one-off projects that can't easily be built on, and then these projects tend to become stale and they become obsolete. 
Thirdly, the protocols tend to be a little bit specific to the simulation engine in which they're developed. So because each simulation engine works in a different way, you may have to write particular protocols that work for that simulation engine rather than a generalized version of that protocol. And fourthly, writing quantum network simulations is hard. So there are various challenges involved when writing quantum network simulations. The first one is because there's limited graphical interfaces, a lot of the, the efforts is devoted to writing code. And what that means is the developer needs a strong knowledge of coding, so you need to be able to write software. And when you have to run those simulations, you may require a powerful computer that is able to run parallel, parallel processes, uh, compute very quickly, because these simulations tend to require lots of resources. And fourthly, when it comes to writing the quantum network simulation, you need to actually know a lot about quantum networks in the first place, because without that knowledge, it's hard to use the simulation platforms. So at Cisco, we've been looking at ways in which we can solve these problems. And so we kicked off a project to address this. We want to achieve the following four things. First, we want to develop a one-stop shop for quantum network simulation. So when someone wants to start with quantum network simulation, there's one place to go and they can find all the resources they need in one place. Secondly, we want to contribute equal efforts to both the community and the software aspects. So not only do we need a strong simulation platform, we also need to focus on the community to make sure everyone is focused on the same efforts. Thirdly, we want everything to be open source so that everyone can contribute. And fourthly, we want to take a unifying approach rather than reinventive, meaning we want to stop creating one-off projects. We want to unify all the efforts into one project or multiple specific projects that everyone is using rather than creating clones with uh, similar features but not um, contributing to the same projects. So the way in which we aim to solve this is we want to build a software tool that has the following four features. Firstly, it should add a graphical user interface that is usable for all of the simulation engines. Second, it should simplify simulation development, removing the need for writing complex software. Thirdly, it should allow remote access to run the simulations, meaning we're enabling remote access to high-performance computers. And fourthly, we want to bring the entry barrier down as much as possible, simplifying the process from going from zero to contributing to the field. What these goals will achieve are the following three things. Firstly, it'll streamline simulation development. That means we can stop writing the same pieces of code over and over again in our simulations. Secondly, it creates a platform for education and resource sharing, a place that people can go when they're interested in quantum networks and they don't know where to find information. Thirdly, it enables access for everyone. No longer do we need high-performance computers to run simulations or a very strong software engineering background in order to write simulations, and this makes it easier for everyone to come and contribute to the field. We have further goals for this project. It's not just about the accessibility and the community aspects, but we really want it to be a very practical tool. And so the long-term goals are we want to enable community sharing. So when someone writes a research paper based on this network simulation, that code should be shareable in a very easy way. We want to create a universal quantum network simulation language. So instead of using various engines, which come with their own languages and own style, we want a single quantum network simulation language that can be portable to each of those engines. Thirdly, we want to convert simulation code to physical hardware execution. So we don't have to write complex hardware language. It can, should be compilable into the hardware language. And fourthly, we want to take a no code approach for protocol development as well. And what that means is because protocol development generally is a collection of instructions, we see that it's possible to think about drag and drop interfaces that use no code at all to generate the, the protocols. And we think that this can reduce the software engineering background required needed to write quantum network protocols. And with that, I'll introduce our QNET lab project, which aims to take all of these things into consideration and put them into a single project. The QNET lab objectives are to, as we discussed, build a unified quantum network simulation platform, a one-stop shop. Second, we want to develop and maintain a quantum network simulation community, a place where people can go to learn about quantum networks and ask about the current trends. Thirdly, we want to generate and organize community learning material so that the people in the future can come and learn more about quantum networks and see where they can contribute. Our first step towards achieving all these goals is we're going to develop a platform called the Quantum Network Development Kit, or the QNDK. And what this is, is it's a web-based graphical user interface. It comes with pre-built simulations, meaning we've already written simulations in various engines, which can be imported. 
Thirdly, we can run those simulations in the cloud. We don't need high performance computers. Fourth, we limit the amount of code writing. So we try to reduce as much as possible the amount of code that has to be written from scratch. And fifthly, we integrate the various simulation engines that are compatible in order to have access to all of the features of each of the engines. So let's take a look at the designs we've come up with for the Quantum Network Development Kit. On the left, we have the canvas, and the canvas is used to generate complex network topologies. And within the topology, you can click on all the objects and see the components and the noise models associated to each one. On the right, we can see the code, and the code can be assigned to each of the nodes so that they can run the series of instructions contained in the code. But the code is uh, visible to the user so they know exactly what goes into writing a quantum network protocol. We've also thought about this no-code approach to writing quantum network protocols. Because quantum network protocols tend to recycle a lot of the instructions and just execute them in different time points, we thought about a drag-and-drop interface in which you can write quantum network protocols. And from those quantum network protocols in this series of instructions, we can compile the actual code in which to run the simulation with. From there, we thought about this homepage in which we will allow people to come and see what is available to them to start learning about quantum networks. We also have a tutorials page in which it has, contains tutorials on how to use the platform, how different quantum network protocols work, and we open this up to the public so they can contribute their own tutorials. We've already begun this project and we've been demonstrating it to a few of our potential users. And what people are saying so far is that it's a great tool so far for teaching about quantum networks at a university. It will save from having to re-implement the constant parts that come up in every simulation. And it's going to allow for uploading a collection of known hardware components so that the noise models can be quickly assigned depending on the different vendors. And this way, the user doesn't need to know about the noise models for particular devices. They can just be imported. For the QNDK platform, we thought of a few future directions in which we want to take. The first one is we want to enable remote access to quantum networking test beds using the same interface. The interface contains visualization of the network topology with all of the components and access to the properties of those components. And it also allows access to the control instructions in which are running in that network. What that means is we could think about taking a simulation deployed to a particular topology that models the physical devices deployed in the test bed, ensure that protocols are working as expected, and then take that same logic and deploy that to a test bed and then run it on real devices. We don't have access to those devices, we can emulate part of them. That means the input and outputs are the same as if we were interacting with a real device, except what's happening behind the scenes is that those emulated devices are simulating the parts that don't exist yet in the hardware or that we don't have access to. So with that, I would like to demonstrate the Quantum Network Development Kit and where we're at with it right now. QNDK Platform is a web application. And so to start, we have three options. We can do a new simulation, import a saved simulation from file, or create a simulation from template. In this case, we'll do a new simulation so I can show all the features, but I've already imported a template so we don't have to write any code. So the three things we need to consider when we first start a quantum network simulation is the quantum network topology, the hardware parameters, and the protocol logic in which we want to run. So let's start. Firstly, we're going to define a network topology. Very simple, two nodes connected by a channel. Next, we need to define the hardware properties. In this case, you know, in this case, the QNDK is still in development, so we don't have all of the possible noise models, but we have the length, the noise, and the loss, which we can define on the channel. And next, we need to write the protocol logic. In this case, I've imported a BB84 QKD protocol written in the NetSquid engine. And so what we could do is we could see all the code it's imported from the database. So this is NetSquid code that will execute the sender side of the BB84 protocol. And the other side, we have the receiver side. So in QKD, we have two steps. We have the key distribution, and then we have the error correction step. So we also have the error correction code written here as well, all in NetSquid. Okay, so now we need to assign the protocol logic to the nodes. So to do that, we have this concept of groups, and the groups perform all of the protocols assigned in here in, uh, simultaneously, and each group executes one after another in sequence. 
So what we'll do is because we need to firstly distribute the key material and then perform up and then perform the error correction step is we'll have two groups. In the first group, we'll distribute the key material from the sender. So sender will be assigned the sender protocol. And now we need to assign the receiver to the sender, which is node 2. OK, we finish with that. Second step is to perform error correction, which is the cascade sender protocol. We finish that and again, perform that protocol with node 2. Finished. Now on node 2 side, we need to tell node 2 to receive. So node 2 will be allocated the receiver side of the protocol. And it will be executed with node 1. Oops, no mistake. 1. And after it receives the key material, it will perform the error correction step which is the cascade receiver protocol finished with node one. Done. Okay, so we're done. The protocol is assigned, the topology is assigned, the hardware property is assigned. Now we're ready to execute the protocol. What we do is we run the simulation. So we pick the server in which to execute. We make an experiment name, let's call this NetSquid1, and we run it for a maximum of 10 minutes. So run. Now it's launched. Let's see what's going on. Here it is, NetSquid 1, it's already finished. And what happened is we have the qubits being transmitted. You can see all the logs. And then error correction was performed. This is not so meaningful right now. So let's add some additional code so that we can modify the outputs. What we do, we open up our code editor. We can see the cascade receiver protocol is already open. And we can modify this code in place. So let's print. Uh, final co key was the final key here. Let's just take that variable. All right, so we modified the code. We can re-execute this without changing anything. Let's call this netsquid2. Run it. Here it is. It's running. We can see the logs, and it's done. And now we've modified the code, and we have our print statement here. So we can modify these protocols on the fly. So that all the code is there, we just need to make minor adjustments. So one thing of NetSquid is we need to implement routing. So this was a point-to-point -point experiment, but if we want to change the topology to be more complex, we need to have routing. But NetSquid is not built with a built-in routing system. So what we could do is we can change the engine. And let's go to QNET Sim. And QNET Sim is a, a, a network simulation engine that does include routing. I change the engine, but the protocol stays the same. All the logic is the same. It's just written in a new engine. So we have BB84 sender, BB84 receiver, and we have cascade. Now what we can do is we can modify the topology. Let's add a new topology. So we have this ability to add uh, pre-established topologies that are common, star, ring, line, fully connected, uh, dumbbell, etc. So let's add a six node star network. And from there, we will add a five node ring network. Great. So now we can make the topology a bit more complex. We can add a link from node two to node four. We can add a link from node seven to node 10. Now what we can do is we can modify this so that we can rerun the protocol. Let's just do the sender side BB84 and we'll run it with node nine because there's a path. So node nine from node one, finished. On the receiver side, node nine, we will Give it the receiver side of the protocol, finish with node one, done. And now let's run this protocol again. Okay, we call this QNS1 and run. Great, now it's running. Topology is going, you can see the logs happening, routing is happening, protocol is executing. And we've done that relatively quickly with very little code. If you want to make any adjustments to the protocol files, we have them all here make any changes we need. If we really want, we can create a new protocol file. Okay, so let's call this DB84 modified. All right, we got the protocol name. The engine is QNET SIM. We add the protocol. And now we have DB84 modified in an empty file, host and receiver. And we can do whatever we want here. Uh, take, let's for example, take the sender side. Why not copy and paste it? 
put it into here. Great. Now we have a modified BB84, except it does the exact same thing, but it's coming from a new file. Now what we need to do is go back to our canvas, go to node 1, and now we need to edit this one. We can delete it, add a protocol, and now we add the modified version. We don't need to change. Okay, we need to finish assigning, and now in node 9, we don't need to change anything. We can run it again, main server, QNS2, run, go to the experiments. We have two protocols running, one after the other. This one is still going. But that's all we need to do in order to run a new protocol, custom protocols, editing, and modifying. This one needs to finish. My computer is a little slow. I'll leave it here for now. So with that, I will conclude my presentation with the final points. The first is that the quantum network simulation community is divided and unification is needed, much like we've seen in classical network simulation. The QNET Lab project aims to unify and simplify quantum network simulation so that everyone is able to contribute to this field. Thirdly, quantum network simulation development is very difficult, but with the QNDK platform, we aim to greatly lower the barrier of entry so that people can start writing new protocols and start contributing with their own results. And fourthly, this project is a community-driven project, and so we don't want to close any doors. We're always open to collaboration, and I invite the audience to reach out to quantumlab at cisco.com if they have any ideas in which, how, in which we can improve the platform or if they want to start uh, helping us to build the platform. So any help is very much appreciated. And with that, I thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the Quantum Summit. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, so the first question is, uh, how do you model the action that is taking place in the nodes? Is that already pre-assigned or do you have to write code for that? The actions on the nodes are that code segment that we saw on the right-hand side. So those are the instructions that have to get assigned to the node. So we offer some templates for those uh, control instructions for different uh, popular protocols, but generally they have to be written and then assigned to the nodes. So the action part is separate from the, I mean, I, basically action is like, you know, you, you get a message, what do you do with that message, right? How do you respond to that message? That's part of the protocol spec, that action has to be coded up. Exactly, yeah. So you have some instruction like receive message, take message, modify message, resend, and then you'd have the same for the quantum messages or receive qubit measure qubit, et cetera. And then you put those in a sequence of events and that's the protocol, essentially. Um, another question is, um, how do you model the primary noise source for common entanglement sources? Multiple pairs instead of one, the Hilbert space grows very rapidly. Yeah, so we don't write our own simulation engines. So the way we handle that is, however, the simulations engines already handle that. So for example, in NetSquid, they have quantum source. The quantum source can emit, you know, more than one photon by mistake or something. You can model the source very accurately. Uh, but because the, well, depends on much entanglement you have, but up to something like 15 qubits entangled, you can run your simulations. But of course, once you have huge systems, as long as they're separable, it's okay. But if you don't have separable systems that are huge <laughs> entangled, then of course the simulation engine is not going to handle that. It's not going to work. So you need to kind of consider, you know, limit the size of the entanglement in order to run the simulation. But up to around 15 qubits entangled, you can run it. But after that, you'll see some slowdowns. Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, we are close to the end of the 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 alloc uh, allocated time, uh, and we can move on to the next talk. So we have uh, Professor Don Towsley uh, from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He's the director of the Quantum Information Systems Institute and he's a distinguished professor. Um, his research spans a wide range of activities from quantum and classical networking and uh, secure communications to distributed learning and inference. He's a fellow of the IEEE and ACM. He's one of the highly cited computer scientists with over 250 articles in leading journals. 
Today, he's going to talk about memory, noise, distillation, and teleportation in quantum networks. Uh, it's uh, it's been you know it's been my privilege to actually um, you know witness a lot of his work in SICOM community back in the day. But um, so so awesome to have you here, Don. Over to you. Uh, Don, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? Don? I think you're on mute. Have we lost his connection, perhaps? No, no, I couldn't uh, figure out how to unmute without stopping the share in one second. Oh, no worries. Yeah, it's it's uh, the, the the control panel is usually at the top and it's hidden and, and you have to hover to get that. <laughs> okay, you can hear me now, right? Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so so I, I want to talk about efforts that I've been involved in having to do with dealing with noise and quantum networks. Um, first of all, uh, by quantum network, I'm I'm referring to a quantum entanglement network where you have quantum switches connected via lossy and noisy links. Uh, the switch you can think of as a repeater with a switching fabric uh, has uh, quantum memories, uh, and uh, the way it, uh, the network would work is that uh, pairs of quantum memories in adjacent switches would uh, essentially form bell pairs between them, and then the switches would decide what bell pairs uh, to measure in order to connect uh, the link level uh, bell pairs uh, so as to generate end-to-end -end entanglement. And the challenges that uh, we've been focused on uh, in our group is uh, trying to make these networks robust to loss and noise, uh, let's say using purification, worrying about how to schedule, uh, uh, let's say, different uh, uh, bell swap measurements uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, you know, to handle classical communications because uh, it can introduce delays that can incur memory decoherence. Um, and uh, to do this by modeling performance, understanding the capacity, the fidelity, the, the latency that the network can uh, generate. And so the issue with noise is that unlike uh, classical bits, qubits are not really self-protected against a small perturbation. In the classical world, you can have an encoding for zero and one and the physical representation can deviate a bit, and it's very easy to figure out what it corresponds to and to snap it back. But as we know in the quantum world, our quantum state is really a superposition of zero and ones. And so uh, it could be that whatever the particular state is, that that's what we've wanted, or it might be that it's the result of noise sort of moving it. And so we don't really have a way of, of uh, knowing how to restore. And with uh, memories, uh, we have to deal with the fact that uh, they have limited coherence times. And so you may have a, a state representation and physically the memory wants to sort of move the qubit, let's say from a state one to a ground state of, that might be state zero. And uh, and so you uh, have a deviation that increases as time goes on. Now, one of the ways that we deal with this is by doing entanglement purification. Um, in, uh, in our networks, bell pairs are sort of really the key resource ingredient. And so what we could do is to generate several of them and then run them through some sort of a circuit, measure off all 
the results of those measurements to essentially uh, generate or leave ourselves with a higher quality uh, bell pair than what we started off with. And one sort of standard circuit for this, um, I call, referred to as the DEM circuit, would have two bell pairs. One would be a source pair, the other a target pair, uh, where the, the uh, Alice and Bob would share qubits. You would uh, perform a C naught at both Alice and Bob between the two of them, and then you would measure off the, the target pair. Uh, Alice and Bob would exchange classical communication. And what this ha uh, has the uh, uh, effect of doing is that if the measurements are consistent with each other, then Alice and Bob know that they're left with, let's say, a single bell pair that's uh, much higher quality than either of the two were before. Uh, now, how might you go about this? Uh, there's a, a notion of fidelity, which I'm not going to go into the technical uh, definition, but think of it as a measure of closeness of entanglement to perfection. And fidelity ranges between zero and one. If you have a bell pair with fidelity one, then it's perfect, uh, has uh, it's, uh, the highest quality possible. And as fidelity goes down, uh, that's a measure of that you have more and more noise that's affecting that bell pair. And one of the things to understand, of course, is when you do this purification here, it's possible that the measurements will be inconsistent, in which case you have to throw out the source pair. So purification steps succeed with probability P sub S. Okay, so with that in mind, now what I'd like to do is to talk about some of the work that we've been doing uh, in terms of trying to deal with noise. Um, let me return to sort of this basic uh, component of the quantum network, a, a quantum switch. Um, and for now, let's just think of it, it's, a, it's this, our network is just a single switch connecting several users. And we have different user pairs generating requests for bell pairs. And what the quantum switch will do is, is proceed in two phases. Uh, first, the links will randomly generate bell pairs and uh, th that may not succeed. And then in the second phase, given what the requests are from the users, the switch will select bell pairs uh, to measure. And it turns out that that selection is equivalent to selecting an eligible matching in a graph among memories. That what I'm showing on the bottom right is the memories that are occupied by qubits belonging to link level bell pairs, the dashed lines are essentially correspond to that there's a request that could be satisfied if you did a, a, a bell swap between those uh, two qubits. And what the switch has to decide is which one it's going to do, okay? And the outcome of these bell state matchings then will form a set of end-to-end -end entanglements between pairs of end nodes. Now, what I'd like to do there, we've done some work in the absence of noise, but let me just say a little bit, you know, suppose that we have noise, um, that the bell pairs that are created across the links are not perfect, okay? And what we do is we sort of think of it as a slotted system where during each time slot, a link can generate up to some maximum of bell pairs uh, per slot but they have some initial fidelity less than one. Um, and in this model that we started off with, you have to use the link level bell pairs uh, or you lose them. Uh, think of it that 
the memories decohere very, very quickly. And what we want to do is to generate end to end entanglement uh, with fidelity that's larger than some threshold. And so that may mean that we will have to use some purification. And so there are two things that you could do. You could either purify at the link level, and then once you've uh, increased the uh, quality of the bell pairs at the link level, do a swap uh, and, and give that to the end user. And I showed that on the left-hand side. Or you generate these link level bell pairs and you swap among them and generating bell pairs uh, uh, among users. And then they do a purification using uh, that DEMPS protocol so as to increase the uh, uh, to be above the uh, threshold. And so the sorts of results that we have is we've been able to characterize the capacity region for generic purification protocols, not just DEMPS, but other kinds of protocols. And we've established that a maximum weight matching protocol stabilizes the switch for rates within this capacity region. In other words, uh, it will guarantee that you'll get sort of uh, a finite uh, delays in, in serving requests. And I'm showing at the bottom here, for the case that we have two requests, uh, the rate region uh, for those two, let's say, user pairs, the, the red curve, it corresponds to the uh, the boundary of the rate region if there was no noise, okay? But in the presence of noise where we might need to do purification, then you get a, a huge uh, decrease in, in uh, uh, rate region. Uh, and the green boundary corresponds to when you do purify followed by swap, the blue swap followed by purify okay and uh what where this is going is that we'd like to be able to extend this to networks of, of switches not just a single switch we'd also like to look at other uh settings where let's say we have lots of perfect uh of memories um, and we'd like to explicitly model memory decoherence and also be able to look at regions where we have finite number of memories. Okay, I'd like to talk about a, another sort of problem that we've looked at. Uh, as I sort of showed you, these purification protocols require classical communications. Uh, and so if you need to do multiple rounds of purification in order to uh, get the quality bell pair that you want, there's a question of how this will affect uh, memory coherence. And so let me just walk you through a baseline purification scheme. We have Alice and Bob, uh, and they're generating, uh, let's say, bell pairs. Uh, and traditionally, what uh, Alice and Bob will do is they'll wait until those bell pairs are heralded. That's going to take some delay before they realize that. And then they can go about doing the uh, purification. Uh, they then have to exchange measurement results. So there's going to be another sort of uh, propagation delay due to that. Uh, they'll go through perhaps another round of purification. So they need to herald another bell pair and then finally exchange the measurement results. And so what you can see is you're going to have to be storing these bell pairs in memory. And memory decoherence, of course, is going to decrease the fidelity. And as the distance between Alice and Bob increases, then the fidelity is going to go down for this uh, baseline scheme. 
And in fact, you could even get run into a situation where you might do better not doing any distillation. So we've been looking at sort of an optimistic approach, okay, which is don't wait for anything, just uh, proceed optimistically as if everything is going to work out. I'm showing here the timeline from the last slide. And what we're going to do is we're not going to wait for any of the classical uh, information. We'll do the purification and we'll do the measurements and then we'll exchange the heralding and purification results. Okay. The, uh, what this will do is it will allow you to have higher fidelity in bell pairs, but the downside is, of course, that you're going to decrease your rate. And so we're interested in the effect that initial fidelity, memory coherence times, and distances between endnotes might have. And what we've been doing is looking at really three protocols. The optimistic, where you just proceed full speed ahead, don't worry about uh, classical communications until the end. A second, uh, heralded optimistic, where you at least wait to see that the bell pairs were created before you proceed with uh, purification. But don't worry about exchanging measurement results until you're completely done. And then the baseline where you always wait for classical comms at every step. And of course, uh, compare these to a setting where you don't do any purification. And we've looked at ground-based optical and satellite free space uh, scenarios. And I'll just uh, uh, quickly go through the system model. In the ground-based, we essentially assume that we have sort of an exponential the uh, decaying uh, attenuation coefficient. But in the satellite base, uh, the portion of the channel that's in free space, the attenuation decreases uh, uh, quadratically. And there's only the portion in the atmosphere where you get an exponential uh, decrease. Um, we assume that we have dephasing noise uh, with the memories with, with coherence time T2. Uh, we, the gates uh, incur depolarizing noise. And then, of course, there's noise in the measurements themselves. And I'm just going to show you some results for the DEMPS protocol uh, in the case of the satellite. And because we're sort of looking at fidelity rate trade-off, um, we looked at the secret key rate that you would get, let's say if you use an entangled-based uh, BB84 uh, protocol because it allows us uh, to sort of take fidelity and rate and sort of summarize it in one single metric, okay? What I'm showing you is, is a heat map um, where on the y-axis, we're increasing the coherence time. And on the x-axis, we're increasing the fidelity of the initial entanglement across the satellite links. And the different regions that we see here um, essentially correspond to where one protocol is better than another. Uh, NA is a region where you get zero rate that uh, we're not able to get the uh, fidelity or the quality of the, uh, the uh, that's used for uh, generating the keys high enough to be able to do anything meaningful. Uh, Heralded optimistic, uh, turns out that works the best when you have good memories and low uh, link fidelity. And the optimistic protocol, on the other hand, works well when you have uh, 
sort of higher initial fidelity and so-so, uh, let's say, uh, memories. Um, that was for the case where uh, entanglements were attempts were being generated at a thousand times a second, and the distance between the ground stations was 500 kilometers. In this other heat map, we've uh, increased the entanglement generation rate of the uh, satellite link to one megahertz. Uh, distance between the grand stations is 500 kilometers. And here what we find is that you always win by being optimistic. In other words, go ahead and do everything and then wait to see if, if anything failed in the middle. So that brings me to the, the last uh, sort of uh, problem that we looked at in the context of noise, and that is how scheduling uh, could uh, affect the, the fidelity of, let's say, of the quantum uh, state. Okay, and here we do, do it in the context of teleportation between a pair of users. And just to remind you about teleportation, we have Alice and Bob, they share a bell pair between them. And Alice has a, a qubit or a, a quantum information encoded in a single qubit. Uh, which is the red star that she would like to convey to Bob. And the teleportation protocol essentially entangles Alice's uh, sort of qubit with uh, her part of the bell pair, measures them off, sends classical information to Bob, and then Bob is able to essentially transform his qubit into the qubit that Alice uh, was sending. And the question that we were interested in is, what's the effect of memory noise on the, the fidelity of that final state? And so here's the system model. Alice and Bob, Alice has noisy memories. Bob has noisy memories. Um, Alice will have teleportation requests, uh, and each request course uh, consists of a single qubit that gets stored into memory. And uh, there may be other qubits that come in that need to be teleported. And then finally, Alice and Bob generate a, a bell pair between them. And the question then, is which of the qubits that Alice is storing in memory should she teleport to Bob? Okay. Uh, and so let's say in this case, she takes the oldest qubit and teleports it. But the question is uh, that how she schedules or selects the qubits from her uh, let's say, request memory, uh, can that affect the, the fidelity of the teleported qubits? And so we came up with sort of a very simple model. Data is generated according to a Poisson process with a rate a lambda. Entanglements are generated according to a Poisson process with, let's say, rate mu. We have finite number of memories for storing either the data or the bell pairs. And uh, we take as our memory noise model that, uh, that it's dephasing with a rate gamma, which is just one over the coherence time. And as I said, questions then, how should the bell state, the data qubits be scheduled? Uh, and obvious candidates are, you know, should you always pick the oldest qubit first? That would correspond to like first come, first serve, or the youngest qubit first. And 
How should the buffer be managed? The buffer is finite in size, and so it's possible that it might get filled up, in which case, uh, what should you do if you get another request or you get a, a, another bell pair at the store? Do you just discard the arriving qubit or uh, should you push out the oldest qubit? And from classical networks, we know that push out uh, always works best. And in fact, it's provably optimal. And so here are the kind of results that we get with, with a simple all sort of uh, queuing models for this system. Uh, again, the data generation rate is lambda, the bell state generation rate is mu. Uh, suppose the initial bell state fidelity is 0.9 and the initial data fidelity is one. Uh, let's say we have a, a coherence time of 100 milliseconds. We can store, let's say 10 qubits. Uh, then going in the graph to the right is as a function of load, which is just the, the ratio of the data generation rate to the bell pair generation rate, what the average fidelity looks like on the y-axis. And for four different policies, um, actually I take it back, three different policies, one where you use oldest uh, qubit first, storing the uh, data and the bell pairs. One where you use youngest qubit, qubit first for serving both data and bell pairs. And then one where you use oldest qubit first for the data and youngest qubit first for the bell pairs. And there are two regions, depending on whether the generation rate is less than the bell pair generation rate or, or larger. And the first thing that we see is that we always get a better average fidelity if we choose the youngest qubits. <clears throat> and the worst is when we do uh, choose the oldest qubit. Uh, second, you, you sort of see sort of an interesting behavior. It's almost monotonic on each side of, of the load when the load is equal to one. And what happens is when you have a mismatch in the rates um, that you can, uh, and you're using youngest qubit first, you can do very well because uh, whichever is the uh, the one that's being generated the smallest rate, when it comes in, it always finds sort of a fresh uh, either data qubit to send or a fresh bell pair to use as a resource. And the only reason it's not completely symmetric is that bell pairs consist of two qubits, so they're decohering at a slightly faster rate than the data does. And one thing is we can prove that youngest qubit first with push out it maximizes average fidelity. Uh, where this is going, uh, it turns out that we're able to also compute the fidelity distribution of the teleported qubits. And we'd like to be able to look at uh, sort of better models for how bell pairs are generated. Uh, this is, we've looked at scheduling for teleportation. It's interesting to think of in the context of like choosing what uh, bell pairs to swap in a network. Um, and uh, we've been looking at this in the context of a storage network where you may be storing bell pairs and perhaps uh, using error correction uh, to keep them fresh. And then how should you go about to serve bell pairs from the storage network? And, and that brings me to the end. Thanks, Don. I think we are, we, we are on the top of the hour, but I think there's a few questions uh, coming in from the audience that I'll probably at least uh, um, you know see if we can fit in. So one question is, uh, I, I don't know exactly, it was asked about one, about seven minutes back into the talk, but 
Are those rates the attempt lock rate or the average rate of pair creation? Often one operates with only one pair per 100 pulses, say. Uh, right. So the, the rates that I had with the heat maps, those are the generation attempts. Uh, so that, ranging from a thousand to, uh, let's say, a million. And uh, I don't remember what what fraction of those, uh, let's say, actually make it across. Uh, I'd have to look that up uh, or point, uh, let's say, the questioner to the paper. Okay. Yeah, another question is, uh, have you looked into optimizing over the purification protocols? That's something that uh, I didn't talk about but uh, we've been using some of the work of Stefan Krastanov, a colleague of mine, where he developed sort of an optimization framework within which to generate uh, purification schemes. And we've been using it to optimize for uh, both optimistic and heralded optimistic and baselines, uh, and uh, so as to do a, a sort of a more meaningful comparison. And uh, that will eventually show up in archive. Uh, maybe one final question. Um, so this is from me, actually. Uh, this seems more like a localized protocol, right? Like this is actually like you're you're operating on the on the switch, the quantum switch. But if you were to actually take an end-to-end -end, uh, take on this, right? Like you know, with many different connections. I mean, this is where maybe some of the optimization framework thing comes into play. You're not just optimizing for one connection, you're optimizing for the, the network good put, if you will, right? Is that something? Right. Is that it something is something, uh, and so I guess uh, the, the problems I sort of talked about today are small and contained enough that, you know, we have sort of like clean uh, results that we can show, but we have okay. been looking at, you know, flow optimization where you have different kinds of flows. They have different fidelity requirements. And right. part of it is to decide what the right distillation or purification schedule is uh, for them. And and again, I can point you to some papers that we've written. Of course, it gets uh, very complex very quickly the moment you start adding multiple nodes and more complex topologies and, and, and things like that. So. Right. And yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, we're just getting sort of heuristic solutions. Uh, okay. No, I think this is fantastic work. Thank you, Don. And uh, I think uh, it's we are three minutes uh, into the next talk, but uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce Professor Ben Yu. So Ben Yu is a distinguished professor at the University of California at Davis. And uh, his research at UC Davis includes uh, 2D, 3D photonic integration for Future computing, cognitive networks, communication imaging, and navigation systems, micro nano systems integration, and the future internet. He's a fellow of the IEEE OSA NIAC, and in this talk, he's going to talk about quantum wrapper networking for future quantum internet. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Ben. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right. Let me uh, get started. You can see my screen. All right. Okay, so it's my pleasure to be here, and thanks very much for your invitation. Um, quantum wrapper networking for future internet, and um, we'll discuss the. Um, oh, um, let me just kind of clear this off screens here. Yeah, the um, um, this presentation is based on the collaboration between Northwestern University and uh, UC Davis, and um, I have my student uh, sitting here. Um, uh, Mehmet On has done most of the work on the experiment, and so, on. so it's my pleasure to discuss this today. So when we talk about quantum networking, and we are looking for quantum internet, where internet, we all know that the uh, packet is the fundamental unit. So there are a lot of challenges. We already talked about many of them. How do you place a control plane on quantum networks? How do we manage quantum networks? How do we monitor the performance of quantum networks? How do we switch 
route and achieve end-to-end -end transportation in quantum networks, especially like say in QKD, we also like to make sure that there you can have a variety of topology can be supported. And then in the quantum network, a lot of times we're using polarization entanglement and so on. How do you stabilize polarization and synchronize payloads and header during their transport, assuming we're doing packet-based um, uh, networking? How do we co-design and integrate quantum protocols and algorithm in the software stack? How do we have do we have simulation tools and experiment testbed? The previous speaker, uh, Cisco, I already talked about this very important and it's important to have a simulation tool, simulation testbed, but also experiment testbed. And then you design, simulate, operate uh, quantum networks with quantum devices before you actually deploy them because it's gonna be very expensive and time consuming to deploy them. And so once we somehow manage to find solutions to all of the above, how do we interoperate and seamlessly upgrade from today's networks to future quantum networks? I used to work at Bellcore and this vendor neutral vendor um, uh, uh, independent upgrade from today's network to future network. And how do we do that uh, properly? Very, very important. And you know, so in other words, can we design and implement a quantum network that can coexist with today's classical network that can be backward compatible with uh, today's network so that you can facilitate uh, upgrades from today's network to future quantum internet. So that was the security schemes we talked about. Um, we, we want to be able to kind of allow the um, seamless upgrade from today's network to future and also be able to do this in a kind of packet switching type of network. Um, now, I've done this at the, back in Belcourt in 90s, 1990s, we had the uh, you know, telecom network with optical wavelength, and uh, we did the first optical reconfiguration network. And in 1997, we were asked to do, deploy the next generation internet. Uh, so we started something called um, WDM, that is basically the optical level switching network. So we basically the idea is to use the wavelength division multiplexing optical cross connect uh, so based on my patent um, with the uh, working like router and they put the IP over WDM. So this is a very different IP over WDM. You know, it's basically a um, <clears throat> packet or burst or um, diagram or circuit switching based IP over WDM. And that was kind of concurrent with the MPLS where IP and ATM uh, merged. The Cisco was a key part of that activity, MPLS and so on. It used to be called tech switching. So then ATM and IP got converged. So the IP became kind of more of a um, uh, management and uh, control, but used the ATM as the platform. Now, so then the MPLS router or MPLS switch router was using kind of a ATM to be the platform and having IP as the kind of a, a master. And then the MP Lambda S upgraded that to wavelength division multiplexing based um, uh, MPLS based IP and so on. Um, but from the beginning, our optical level solution was to use kind of um, integrated um, IP over WDM. The reason I'm showing this is because the design we had back then was to actually achieve seamless upgrade from say single wavelength, wavelength network or multi-wavelength network and um, so standard uh, wavelength over MPLS, IP over MPLS uh, network to optical level switching network and so on. So the key opportunities for quantum wrapper networking is something similar to what we've done in optical level switching where we use the classical wrapper. We're gonna call that uh, quantum wrapper made of classical bits and then we use the quantum data bit to be kind of wrapped around by the quantum wrapper. And so then we have a qubit being surrounded by classical bits and the classical bits will allow you to transport switch and route in the, um, in the quantum network. But you're not gonna to touch the uh, qubits until the qubits get to the destination and hits the uh, quantum receiver. And then, there are a lot of management schemes you have to do. Uh, we're gonna use the kind of inferred um, uh, performance monitoring because you cannot touch the um, qubits anywhere until you actually receive them. So quantum performance monitoring using classical bits in the wrapper, we do inferred optical signal ratio, quality of transmission, 
dispersion, project mode dispersion or uh, measurement and so on. Fortunately, there's a lot of optical monitoring technologies developed already. So without having to touch the qubits, we can perhaps do most of this by inference. And then you can help uh, develop quantum network TCP IP due to the fact that quantum wrapper mechanism can be used and coexist and correlated with uh, qubit receivers. Now the protocol independent data load, <clears throat> qubit can have any data load so long as it's uh, wrapped around by the quantum wrapper. So they can actually facilitate co-design and co-integration of compute and network stack, which can be automated and software controlled. It allows you to fully compatible, fully com um, um, interoperate with the software defined networking. You have management control plane based on software defined networking, working with the quantum wrapper networking. Allows you to interoperate between telecom protocols, Ethernet, OTN, MPLS, and uh, a lot of these uh, uh, Sonnet type of schemes with uh, uh, circuit switching as well. Uh, it allows you to free yourself from strict uh, synchronization because you have a label versus datagram uh, payload and so on. And allows you to exploit much of the existing control plane protocols and allow backward compatibility and allows the seamless upgrade from today's network to future network. So that's kind of the uh, idea. And kind of if you look at this uh, network, uh, it's very similar to what we have done uh, in quantum uh, optical label switching, we had optical label with the um, data payload at that time. But here we have a quantum wrapper, the blue quantum wrapper uh, surrounding the um, the qubits. So you have a quantum wrapper header and quantum wrapper tail. Uh, quantum wrapper tail is uh, optional, uh, and then you have a qubits that are that is surrounded by quantum wrapper header and tail. And what that what that allows you to do is to have the um, say a quantum cluster to talk to quantum cluster without having to have those qubits to be touched or read in the middle uh, routers and switches and so on. <clears throat> by, by having these uh, wrapper bits being generated at the edge router and have the um, quantum wrapper switch router to read the um, wrapper header and transport or switch or forward the packets based on the content of the classical bits, but not touch the uh, qubits. And, um, and again, the qubits can be of, a, a qubit payload can be based on say packet burst or the flow or even circuit, uh, so long as you have a quantum number header to be surrounding them. At the lo local, you have control plane management plane at each quantum wrapper switch routers interfacing with uh, say network control management. And basically you can have software defined network to be um, overlaying on top. So this allows you to do switch and routing and transport. Um, I'm gonna talk about this step-by-step step. and the protocol for this uh, quantum wrapper header can be defined with say 40 bits or 80 bits or depending on how much more say uh, error coding you wanna have, you can actually have a longer uh, bits as well. Basically you have preamble and then label. Label can be circuit ID or you can have source and destination or priority or, um, and then you, have, you can have a, a, a datagram by datagram priority, duration, quantum data format, uh, entanglement and quality of service and uh, type of service to actually pro provide some of the uh, parameters for the uh, transport and switching and routing. So entangled photon qubit um, uh, transport using quantum wrapper in a point-to-point -point network has say clock that would actually trigger the uh, quantum wrapper generation together with the uh, entangled pa uh, paratransmitter. So this would be an example of um, entanglement distribution, well as the, you could also use similar scheme for the QKD. And you can have a switch controller to switch this uh, two by one switch. And by the time you actually have the quantum wrapper generated with the header and tail and qubit coming in, those two will be merged together to generate the datagram. And we're gonna call this to be a quantum wrapper datagram in between quantum wrapper header and tail and you have a qubit uh, payload. Um, on the receiving end, the receiver will normally have this one by two switch to be sending bits to quantum wrapper analyzer um, so that that will actually re read the quantum wrapper, recover the clock and get the uh, payload receiver to be ready. 
and switch controller be triggered by quantum FI noise because you have destination and all this other information uh, given and also has the duration of the uh, qubit payload then it can be switching the um, uh, the datagram so they can separate the qw header with the qubit payload and then again with the qw tail uh, normally this receiver will always get the uh, classical bits whereas the uh, qubit receiver will only receive during the time that is sending the qubits only Okay, so then um, how about if you do quantum level swapping? So in the MPLS and other level switch networks, you can actually form a network based on level swapping or sometimes people call level swapping network. So then if you have a QW header with, um, uh, and then if you have the quantum level swapping module, and if you swap them, you can actually formulate a fundamental block for the networking. You can swap, switch them like we have done before. And then you can read the uh, uh, old header information from the lookup table and then send the new uh, header information, QW wrapper information to the, uh, the two by one switch, um, I'm sorry, in the generator, and then basically combine them together. So you actually have the original qubit payload and you have swapped the uh, quantum wrapper header and tail content. Now then the quantum wrapper switching router with uh, swapping and uh, quantum repeater company. If you have the quantum repeater, what you can do is that formulate this with uh, multiple input, multiple output with uh, multiple quantum wrapper swapping module. And you can actually formulate the transparent uh, optical switch fabric. It can be made of bit navigate or some of those uh, fast switches. And basically you receive, and as I mentioned earlier, your quantum wrapper swapping module can receive the one by two switch and uh, basically have the classical bit to trigger the switching, generating the new uh, quantum wrapper content, and then uh, forward the qubit content. Optionally, you can have a quantum wrapper uh, repeater as well, a quantum uh, uh, repeater as well for the datagram. And you can have, say, K port of W wavelength. So you can have KW uh, quantum wrapper swapper and you have a lookup table to actually provide the contention resolution and so on for the switch fabric and so on. So anyway, so then here you can actually see old header coming in um, and then you can actually swap and then get the new um, quantum wrapper header and tail content with a qubit that is either with the original qubit payload or the regenerated qubit payload with the quantum repeater. The quantum repeater is not, um, uh, mandatorily required one, it can be uh, optionally included. So that basically allows us to build the quantum wrapper switching router. So we've been actually building these things in our test bed. So again, you have a QW switch router that have a QW swapper, optical switch, and they have say craft interface that would allow you to look at the uh, old uh, neighbor content and uh, swap into a new QW uh, wrapper content. And then that has the, uh, the interface to network control management and software defined network uh, control network element and so on. Okay, so that's kind of the um, QW switch and router content. What we have done was that we have to started to do uh, a lot of experiment on this content and the, um, the experiment actually looks good in terms of say, we have done continuous mode, um, then, you, then there's a Raman background. So we actually have the coincident to um, average count actually degrades, but if you do a burst mode, having the wrapper in the time and then switch uh, qubit in the other time, the, um, the, the, the coincident count, the CAR, the uh, extent of coincident count actually is uh, uh, 16. And uh, this uh, average ratio actually is improving with the, uh, the more better defined time. We have started to build the, uh, the test bed. We have currently have three node test bed using the, uh, say, uh, the photon generators here and and uh, yeah, integral photon generator with uh, 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 switch nodes. And the, this is our quantum wrapper switching router. And on the receiving end, we also have these uh, uh, QW content readers and so on. So I've done kind of experiment step by step. So let's kind of look at the three node experiment. 
and basically we're generating intangible photon uh, generation here and you have a signal and idler coming here um, and then you have the qwsr at the core and then based on the content of the quantum wrapper that's been read by node b receiver two node c receiver one and based on that you will switch them and uh, have the uh, the qubits being content, uh, detected by single photon detectors here. And then you do the constant count and so on. So if you have a packet going to BC, BC node, measure that node A, then the B node has every other packet and C nodes has every, every other packet, right? So then B packet, the, the packets you see in the B and packet you see in the C uh, are coming from say node A and you can see the labels, quantum wrapper labels that are classical. Therefore you have a say 150 microwatt type of power levels. And then you have qubits that are not really visible because they're very, very low power. But anyways, those are kind of, you, you see the uh, quantum wrapper switching router working in this um, uh, kind of packet switching uh, test bed with the qubits. And then when we measure the um, coincident to accidental measurement uh, ratio, of the, the you know, initial source to destination at uh, looking at the header versus the, uh, the data. Basically what you're doing is here is to purposely degrade the, the link um, uh, quality so that bit error rate will increase for the quantum wrapper header. What happens then is that uh, statistically, the qubits will also degrade. So then coincidental uh, to coincidence to accidental ratio will also degrade because statistically your uh, signal to noise ratio will also degrade. On the other hand, if you just uh, do the same kind of degradation on the destination one only, then you will see the destination one um, qubit uh, CAR to degrade, while as destination two CAR will stay the same. And then vice versa, if you do the same for destination two, uh, the destination two uh, qubit will degrade, but the uh, destination one is not uh, affected. So this all kind of looks good. Um, the next experiment we did was we did a quantum wrapper based uh, packet switching with uh, QW swapping. It's the same ex experimental setup, except that we do the label swapping. This is a really hot out of the, uh, <laughs> our paper. Uh, student sitting next to me had just finished the uh, paper, got a very, very nice result. And he has uh, compared the result with uh, one nanometer bandwidth optical filter at 1550. As you know, at the 1550 nanometer, single mode fiber has 17 picosecond per nanometer kilometer. So you actually have fairly well-defined time uh, based uh, constant count and for the HH uh, horizontal horizontal uh, polarization and vertical horizontal polarization. Things look good. But then when you actually broaden the um, filter to 30 nanometer because you have a 30 nanometer worth of signal going through or the wrapper signal and the um, and then also the qubits going through the the uh, HH and VH um, has uh, spread out and there's um, more the degraded um, constant count at the other time as well. I think this paper I will have them uh, readily available. We're about to uh, submit that. We have basically um, achieved a successful demonstration of Q, uh, quantum uh, payload switch in between destination. And I think this one is very exciting. Um, my student is ready to tell you more about this, but two fault interference measurement at destination one and two shows very, very nice um, uh, visibility. Uh, I would say something like better than 30 uh, visibility. So for uh, HH and uh, uh, HV faces and diagonal faces and so on. So this kind of reminds me of the uh, the work that I've done when I was at Bellcore in 91 through 99. And in 91 through 97, we did the first uh, reconfirmed network testbed demonstration. Previous speaker talked about simulation. And so the first three years, we did a lot of simulation as to how the first uh, reconfirmed alternate network can function over long distance and switching and routing control plane, software defined network and web and uh, vendor interoperability on so on. We had, I was working at Bellcore by working with um, uh, Lucent and AT&T and uh, regional bells and so on. 
and then we moved on to, as I said, optical label switching, package switching, and so on. So, so what we did back then now is very useful in today's telecom. Uh, what we are doing now in the quantum network may be very useful about 30, 40 years down the line. Uh, we are setting up the test bed, uh, simulation, experiment test bed, and so on. We have the uh, packet switching router that was used to be doing optical lab switching, now doing the, um, the quantum wrapper switching experiment and so on. So just to com com uh, summarize and conclude, uh, quantum wrapper networking uses the uh, classical quantum wrapper for transport switching and routing in quantum network without having to read the qubits uh, data payload. And exists much of the existing control pl uh, plane and uh, allows you to do backward compatibility with that uh, and allows you to also do a seamless upgrade from today's network to future network. Of, of offers the inferred uh, optical performance monitoring. We demonstrate some of that with the cement noise ratio. We can possibly do enable the quantum network TCP IP by using this wrapper, facilitate the co design, co integration, compute network stack facilitates the uh, full compatibility with the software defined network using um, any of the telecom protocol, tele Ethernet, OTN, MPLS, uh, even Sonnet, and uh, pursue seamless uh, upgrade from today's network, user network. Well, our, our work right now then is to uh, apply this to various uh, uh, secure network schemes, um, trying to use QKD on our network as well. That kind of summarizes my talk. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, wonderful presentation. Um, there's a few questions, uh, you know, I have, but uh, let me see if this, there's any audience questions. So there's one here, which is, uh, is the quantum repeater here of the first generation kind entanglement distribution network like Don's setup? How do they handle uh, classical communications for heralding? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, this uh, quantum repeater is absolutely not necessary or needed, um, but um, it was used to kind of show that we could, when we, we do the, uh, when we do the quantum wrapper swapping to generate the new quantum wrapper, we could also do regeneration of qubits. But as you know, quantum repeaters are not really, um, mm -hmm. not truly available yet. So we are, going ahead with that experiment without the quantum repeater. Okay. Um, another question, actually, this is a question from me. Um, so which is around, uh, is there any difference uh, as far as your architecture is concerned between, you know, how you would treat a regular classical packet versus a, a quantum wrapper packet? In other words, are the parts of your like you know switching infrastructure are they aware that except for like you know when you do the demultiplexing and and you know multiplexing back to reconstruct right is there any any um any awareness that there's a quantum payload at the optics layer uh, i think that's a very 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 good question that is basically the fundamental reason why we are looking at quantum wrapper networking the answer is that you can actually achieve true integration between classical network and quantum network. In other words, just like we have what we are demonstrating in optical label switching network here, um, so long as you have optical label, we can put the datagram of any protocol and any format. So that demonstration in 1997 was based on optical label switching, optical label with the classical label mm -hmm. and datagram data payload with the classical bits here. What we are doing now is that this can be backward compatible with the optical label switching where the um, datagram can be consisting of classical wrappers and classical payload, as well as classical quantum wrapper and uh, quantum bit qubit payload. In other words, so long as this network agrees upon the protocol of quantum wrapper header and tail, you can actually have truly a qubit based uh, payload in the datagram as well as some other datagram may be based on classical. So on, on the fiber at any given time or any place, you may have a mix of classical bit based um, datagram and uh, quantum uh, payload based on uh, datagram. 
and you can actually allow you to have the classical uh, customers, classical IP customers, and then quantum um, uh, customers to be uh, coexisting at the same time. But of course, the classical data receiver will receive bits from classical client uh, transmitter, while as a qubit uh, receiver or qubit client may exchange information with the uh, uh, qubit enabled. So in the context of this QKD, this becomes fairly interesting, right? So you can actually start to think about how you how would you do the QKD distribution on the same network instead of the previous speakers talking about separating the physical layer, we can actually think about having them all coexisting and co-integrated. So this is the kind of direction we are looking at, but we would really love to uh, talk with more uh, people because we're not really the full <laughs> Uh, expert in quantum um, uh, physics and so on. No, I think I think we we we've had some I mean discussions in the past, right? Like you know around the yeah. fact that like you know there's a, there's an active thread of you know uh, research activities uh, within within Cisco Research, uh, you know that is sort of similar to to what you're proposing here. So I would love to see this actually like you know be true in reality, and and we can overcome all the hurdles that are that are out there. For one, I mean, I, I was just like thinking about like, you know, things like, for example, in classical networks, if you have any kind of local errors, right, uh, you just basically compute your CRZs or your checksums and you drop the packets because you don't want to waste the bandwidth on the next. So what type right. of like quantum CRCs do we have today to actually ensure that the frame that you have that you received at the at the switch, right, it's actually, mm -hmm. you know, coherent or like it's actually kosher. Uh, and, right. and do we have... Any, I mean, uh, of course, like you'd have to measure the quantum information in order to make sure that uh, right. it, it is intact. And, and then right. probably that is where the repeater comes in because you have to decode, ensure the appropriate checks, and then re-encode to transmit on the outgoing interface. Is that, yeah. is that how you anticipate yeah, yeah. It's it's, uh, it's very interesting because if you look back at our old papers, <laughs> year, year 1998 and 2000 and so on, we did exactly that for the optical level switching. For instance, if you're not careful in the IP network, you can easily have a uh, looping. Uh, right. So you can actually pack it there going around. But what we did was that on our um, label, we purposely put the counter so that each time it goes around the hub, it decreases the counter. So the time to live that will go. So we actually demonstrated 1001 hub optical level switching. And after 1001 hub, the packet will drop. So you can actually see uh, by using label swapping, you can actually put purposely put some kind of timer on it so that you don't you don't necessarily send the qubits through long router hub and degrade the qubits. To, so that you can, as you pointed out, you can purposely discard the packet when you know that you have exceeded your time to live. That's one uh, thing we demonstrated. Another thing we demonstrated is that using this uh, checksum, if you have say 128 bits and they do checksum, then you can actually do a very crude bit error rate calculation. And that's what we did with that, uh, what I showed you earlier, right? So in the classical network, we have shown very, very nice correlation between the classical uh, label versus classical data payload. And the correlation was like very perfect. Now in this quantum uh, scenario, statistically, CAR versus the header BR was also fairly good, uh, showing good, um, uh, Correlation. So then here it's very, very useful, right? Instead of having to touch qubit at every router, which you shouldn't, here basically looking at the uh, checksum or something on your mm -hmm. um, on your uh, uh, on your additional bits in the uh, quantum wrapper, you can estimate the healthiness, statistical healthiness of your qubit. So you can actually discard, decide to discard the qubit and ask the send that to be sent and so on. So there are a lot of interesting cross layer issues that are quite exciting. Uh, what happens in the physical layer, the control plane management plane and the TCP IP, and then start to think about the um, quantum error correction. There are a lot, of, a lot of exciting stuff and I hope to work with you on this uh, various topics. Oh, absolutely. This is this is very, very uh, dear, near and dear to us. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for the talk. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to the last session, but uh, very exciting uh, talk we have lined up uh, from our group uh, by Hassan. 
So Hassan Shapurian is currently a senior quantum researcher at Cisco, where he leads a wide range of projects on photonic quantum information processing and hardware physics. He received an MS in electrical engineering from Princeton and a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Chicago and uh, subsequently worked as a postdoc researcher at MIT, Harvard, and Microsoft Station Q. And uh, Hassan is going to talk about quantum repeaters, a uh, perfect segue uh, from Ben's talk. So over to you, Hassan. All right, thank you very much, Romana. Um, let me share my screen, yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, let, uh, let me begin by uh, thanking the organizers, my colleagues at Cisco for uh, organizing the summit and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to also thank the audience <laughs> who stayed uh, long enough uh, for the very end, uh, till the very end. Uh, so I realized my talk is the very last talk. So hope you had fun and enjoyed the summit so far. Um, so um, yeah, here's the outline of my talk. So I'll be talking about some of the projects that uh, I've been working on uh, within Cisco Research in collaboration with uh, you know, some of my colleagues at uh, Cisco Research as well as some external collaborators uh, such as uh, summer interns um, and uh, some of uh, PIs at universities. So I will start with a brief introduction to uh, quantum repeaters in general and then present uh, two projects uh, that we, we have been working on uh, recently and then I will conclude. Uh, so I guess uh, you have seen uh, enough of intro to quantum network. Uh, um, I would not uh, bother you much uh, with details. Uh, maybe just my perspective uh, about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, vision, uh, futuristic uh, uh, setup for a quantum network, which is uh, pretty much an optical network, which is running at a different regime. You know, we need to exchange quantum signals. So quantum signals are really, you know, weak or low intensity electromagnetic waves. Uh, or pulses, um, and the goal is to exchange, to let users exchange uh, qubits or quantum information among themselves. So the end users could be like quantum computers, you know, actual users who want to exchange keys or interact with quantum computers, and then, uh, you know, the obvious choice for uh, exchanging quantum information is, again, electromagnetic wave or in telecom frequency, uh, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Having learned, uh, having uh, like many years of experience uh, in uh, quantum, uh, in classical network, uh, we learned that over the years, uh, you know, that's been pretty successful to have a general uh, framework, uh, namely it is a technology stack, right? Where each industry or each segment uh, work on developing uh, technology within uh, that stack. And then, um, uh, without even thinking about other stacks. And then somehow these things work uh, together to give us this, uh, you know, hugely successful uh, network. Uh, so one can think of a, a similar thing uh, for a quantum network. Uh, and I would say the stage is still open. So th this is an area of research, how to actually think of a technology stack for quantum network. So here I'm just putting uh, on the left uh, you know, a stack for the classical network and, you know, some of the things that we know pretty well on the right about the quantum network, for example, what applications. So we had a session this morning about the applications of quantum network. And then on the uh, lower part, on the lower uh, right, you see that we have kind of a combination of many things and the goal is end-to-end uh, -end delivery of quantum information. Uh, but it's not really obvious, or that's the part that I'm saying uh, it's uh, open to research about uh, how to separate these, like whether like switching, routing, scheduling is really different from uh, separate, it can be separate from like actual hardware or, you know, fiber uh, uh, details of uh, like a hardware such as fiber or, uh, you know, various interfaces. And the reason, the underlying, the most fundamental reason that uh, we have this complication here is uh, simply quantum signal is fragile. So, uh, you know, it is subject to uh, um, signal attenuation or photon loss and various type of no noises as it transmits through uh, the channel. And uh, so there are these uh, protocols widely known as quantum repeaters uh, to deal with that. 
but then once we consider those, then it will uh, introduce new challenges, such as if we wanna now introduce uh, routing protocols, it will be different because we need some classical, some uh, you know, um, existing uh, classic, uh, some uh, um, concurrent classical communication along with our quantum communication. So that requires uh, revisiting whatever we know uh, in classical networking and uh, maybe developing uh, new protocols even. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, what we do at Cisco Research or at least within these uh, projects had this general theme that, uh, so we wanna uh, design uh, at a system level hardware uh, and uh, simulate hopefully uh, different things. And that includes, you know, static design or even simulating some uh, real-time dynamics and routing uh, scenarios. And what we want to do is after, you know, having a design or simply analyzing some existing uh, uh, protocols, uh, we want to get uh, what are the required hardware parameters to, you know, deliver certain uh, performances. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really helpful for uh, quantum uh, hardware development. So, for example, you know, there's a university group or, you know, some companies, uh, they are developing quantum memory. So one question is how good their memories need to be to, to do, let's say, uh, a toy network or very small um, uh, quantum network with certain uh, performances. Uh, or what are really the needs, uh, uh, what are the characteristic, required characteristics for routers and switches to deliver certain, again, uh, um, you know, e-bit rate, the qubit uh, or entanglement uh, bit rate uh, to the end users. So uh, essentially it would be a guide for hardware developers and also a guide for industry leaders uh, where they can decide whether the technology is mature enough to kind of adopt it and uh, use it for, uh, you know, actual implementation or incorporation in uh, actual network. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna uh, go over uh, very briefly uh, about the kind of uh, basics of uh, quantum repeaters. So uh, essentially uh, quantum repeaters can be divided to two categories. So they're, uh, the, as you can see, the names are two way versus one way. And the name had to do with just uh, the way uh, information flows from uh, sender to receiver. So in the usual two way or entanglement distribution network that we also learn quite a bit uh, from uh, Professor Towsley's uh, presentation. The goal is to establish an end-to-end -end entanglement between the two end users. And then uh, through teleportation, uh, we send uh, quantum information from center, sender to receiver. And the reason that this is called two-way is uh, during this uh, generation of end-to-end uh, -end entanglement, uh, these uh, uh, nodes that you can see, uh, maybe let me, uh, show you. Uh, so these are the kind of uh, nodes of the quantum network and these dots are quantum memories. So I'll explain a little bit more. So the goal is, uh, so we start with this uh, elementary links between these uh, uh, near, uh, neighboring uh, nodes. And then uh, we do this bell state measurement or entanglement swapping to make it a long range entanglement. And uh, so, you know, in order, to, uh, when, uh, when we have this uh, virtual links or entanglement links um, between the neighboring uh, nodes, they need to uh, inform other nodes that they successfully uh, establish this link. Okay, so, that, uh, so then this guy needs to send information to this node. And then at the same time, this guy needs to send information to, uh, let's say, Alice as a sender. So it requires both like forward and backward information. Uh, um, propagation. So that's why it's called a two-way. Whereas uh, the one-way uh, um, uh, transform, uh, one-way uh, transportation of data here is when you just prepare uh, a signal, a quantum signal, and then you send it from A to B. And, uh, you know, because of the noise and the photon loss, as I said, uh, you need to be able to correct uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the impact of the uh, the, um, the channel. And here, uh, you know, the usual way is to use this forward error correction, or in, in this case, because we're dealing with quantum signals, it's a quantum error correction uh, in some ways. And, uh, you know, roughly speaking, what it does is, uh, so uh, the sender prepares a multi-photon state, uh, you know, by introducing some sort of redundancy. 
Uh, so this uh, kind of um, photons uh, collectively represent one qubit of information. And then as it uh, flows through the network, you know, through uh, these routers, what happens is let's say there is one, one of these photons is lost. And then the, the, the job of the router is to account for these missing uh, photons and correct it through, you know, standard quantum error correction. And this is uh, uh, one thing that I will discuss in detail at this in one of the projects that we work. So I'm gonna uh, talk about both uh, types of repeaters, uh, but uh, you know, the general theme is just, if we want to implement these uh, in uh, real, uh, you know, using real hardware, what are the needs uh, and uh, where are we? Uh, so an important piece of hardware uh, in either uh, technology, in either uh, scheme, uh, one way or two way uh, is called quantum memory. And, uh, you know, we have uh, heard a little bit, uh, but for me, uh, let me just uh, remind you uh, the, the property that I'm gonna discuss a little bit, uh, which is called uh, coherence time. So quantum memory is a device that, you know, receives a qubit. So in this case, there are photons uh, or, you know, some electromagnetic pulse um, and it stores. Uh, so it, first of all, it has an interface that, uh, you know, can uh, store the photon in some ways. And then, uh, you know, whenever you need it, uh, you can click on it and then it releases the uh, qubit again in the same form. And, uh, you know, quantum memory essentially, because it's, uh, again, it's a quantum hardware, is noisy, it interacts with the environment. So it has a finite lifetime. So, and that's what we use uh, to call uh, coherence time. And then overall it is, uh, you know, it is, um, it experiences some noise. Um, so just back to uh, now um, quantum repeaters, uh, let me just quickly tell you some pros and cons uh, just you know, for concreteness and then I'll get into some details of our work. Uh, so both two-way and uh, one-way have some pros and cons. So two-way uh, repeaters, uh, you know, it is simpler hardware, meaning you only need maybe uh, quantum memories uh, and then you know, some routing. Um, it can generally uh, tolerate more noise because it is heralded uh, again with, uh, so we heard a little bit uh, from uh, Professor Tasley's uh, presentation that you can, you, there are ways to deal with noise. And then uh, it, it can uh, handle uh, longer uh, distance uh, between the repeaters. So remember, so quantum hardware is something expensive at the moment. So you don't wanna just put like repeaters, I don't know, every kilometer apart. Uh, so you, you want to, have them, uh, I don't know, once every like 80 kilometers or something like that. And, but then uh, the issue with two-way is because of this two-way classical communication, it introduces new challenges. So uh, whenever, you know, end users demand this entanglement, end-to-end -end entanglement, uh, then, uh, you know, it needs to go through the entire network. And unless you have some central controller, uh, then um, you know, it's not obvious to manage this uh, routing uh, in a distributed way. And again, this is an uh, active area of research, but for now, what we know, or uh, let's say to my knowledge, uh, it's not obvious uh, how to scale it up. Um, so the other thing is, as we scale up the network, uh, we have uh, more requirement uh, on the, uh, or uh, the need for a long lived memories uh, become more important. And uh, lastly, if we have multiple users, I think there was a question earlier um, um, that uh, how to handle multiple uh, um, demands, multiple end users at the same time, and we run into congestion uh, very easily in that case. Whereas in the one way, uh, you know, we can simply adopt this packet switching or uh, uh, or wrapper network idea that we just learned about to handle uh, routing and uh, you know address multiple uh, uh, demand at the same time, and uh, uh, so it's the closest to uh, the classical network. But then the big price is we need a quantum error correction, and this uh, this seems to be pretty challenging at least as of, uh, given the status of the quantum hardware as of now. So because of that, uh, I guess for near-term network, uh, two-way uh, protocols uh, are a better candidate. Okay, so with that, uh, let me get into uh, the first part of my talk um, or the first project. So this was in collaboration with uh, our intern, uh, Shahruz Pouryousef, uh, who is uh, Professor Tausley's uh, uh, student. 
And uh, this is about uh, an optimization problem. Uh, let's say we have now an existing uh, classical network, right? So, and it's very expensive to upgrade like the entire thing, right? Just, be, uh, just uh, you know, to add the quantum capability. So you want to be efficient. And this is one of the things that we try to address here. So we want to find an optimal location of repeaters uh, given uh, a fixed or existing uh, network infrastructure. And, you know, we have now, uh, we know like there are places uh, uh, where we do this um, um, signal amplification and we imagine that those places are good places to put some quantum hardware, let's say to add some quantum capability. Uh, but at the same time, we know that we cannot just add any number of memories, right? So we want to kind of characterize the performance as a function of number of memories or how good the hardware is. And also we want to include uh, the fact that uh, you know, if you want to do entanglement swapping, it could be probabilistic. Uh, again, that depends on the type of memory that we use, but uh, the simplest ones, such as the defects, uh, you want to use uh, some photon mediated gates, which are probabilistic. Uh, let me just show you one, uh, one kind of uh, uh, toy model or uh, just a simple setup. So I just showed you as, uh, this where, you know, we have this existing network and then let's say the result of the simulation tells you that, okay, so we need to put two repeaters here and two memories per node. Uh, and that gives us uh, like the maximum uh, network utility. Uh, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna uh, explain uh, more like the keywords that I'm using for such as quantum network utility. Uh, but uh, just to tell you uh, the the features of uh, the, uh, the the optimization protocol that uh, the optimization problem that we define is uh, it uh, you know it converges or it is looking for um, an efficient solution and a fair solution in the sense that you want to maximize. Uh, um, the network throughput and treat all the users equally. So we can introduce uh, um, some uh, weights uh, so that some uh, user pairs are more important than the rest. And then uh, one of the things that we see as the output is the rate fidelity trade-off, meaning that if you want to have a very fast rate EB rate uh, or this entanglement generation rate, uh, then uh, you know, you're going to sacrifice the fidelity or the quality of the entanglement. Uh, so let me just tell you very briefly how we kind of characterize or quantify uh, this uh, the, um, quality of the network or the network throughput uh, in this case. So remember, in the classical network, you know, we usually characterize the, uh, the network throughput in terms of the rate, latency, or the clock jitter, uh, or signal jitter in general, and uh, the bit error rate. And on the network, uh, on the quantum side, uh, the simplest quantities are uh, the rate, meaning uh, like how fast you can generate the entanglement and uh, the fidelity, of uh, the quality of the entanglement. And, uh, you know, just to give you an idea, the, the type of the expressions that we use is uh, a log of uh, rate times some function of uh, fidelity. And this function is determined by the application. So whether you want to do distributed computing or you want to do a key exchange as some, you know, uh, cryptographic, uh, cryptographic uh, uh, applications, uh, yeah, etc. And the point is here, we, uh, the overall utility is sum of log. And the reason that we have sum over log is, again, to implement this fairness, meaning that uh, it's not uh, the only favor one of the uh, user pairs to be very large uh, and then the rest are very small. Okay, so um, I realize the thing I'm kind of uh, uh, running out of time. So I may not ha have a chance to uh, discuss the second part of my talk, but uh, let me just at least uh, finish this part uh, and uh, give you some details about this. Uh, so the entanglement distribution protocol that we use here is based on a sequential scheme where there's a sender and receiver, and we build up the entanglement step by step from sender to receiver. So in this case, what I'm showing you is, let's say we have a linear chain and uh, you know, the optimal solution, uh, let's say, uh, um, so here there are like five nodes and there are these three uh, classical nodes or uh, potential places for repeaters. And let's say after solving the optimization problem, we get one repeater at the third node and, uh, and another one at the fourth node. And then we have only two memories. So that's this spatial multiplexing. 
So we don't have only one memory. So we want to have multiple memories, but remember here, we are not doing any purification or anything fancy. So we want to be really minimal. The only thing that uh, we want to consider is, let's say if there's a technology that uh, you know, it's cheap enough to scale up uh, many, many quantum memories on a single chip. And such a thing exists. Indeed, there are startup companies, uh, they're developing, they're claiming uh, to make uh, like millions of uh, quantum memories on a single chip. And that, this is really what we want to leverage here. Um, and uh, the last thing is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to consider probabilistic swapping. So the, uh, the reason that spatial multiplexing is useful is uh, because uh, let's say you uh, try all these uh, links in parallel and it doesn't matter which ones are successful. So here you decide. So this is kind of in some sense uh, has some flavor of uh, Professor Tausser's presentation. So you can choose uh, which pair to swap at the repeaters. Um, let me skip this and jump into some results. Uh, so that was uh, this dumbbell topology. Um, and... Um, uh, let me just tell you uh, another uh, example, which may make, make more sense. So here we use uh, ESNet, Energy Sciences Network, um, to show really how far or what do we really need if we want to enable quantum network, uh, a minimal quantum network using this uh, entanglement distribution uh, protocol that I explained. So, you know, we set up uh, the network topology. And in this case, because the uh, length of the links are very long, uh, so we need to augment. So we need to put several uh, repeater nodes, uh, roughly 100 kilometers apart in between. And then we run the optimization problem to, to find where to put the repeater. So here, as you can see, all the circles represent potential places for repeaters. But then the field uh, circles means we actually put a repeater there. And uh, let me just tell you some of the results, uh, some uh, aspects of the result. So the optimal solution turned out to be, uh, and by the way, so I'm not here showing you the result for the entire ESnet. So here we are just focusing on um, the East Coast and some part of the Midwest. Um, so it turns out the optimal solution on average, we have a uh, 200 kilometer distance between the repeaters. And then using this special multiplexing, we need at least 10,000 memories per repeater to deliver three EBITs per trial. Meaning when you try once, you get three bits, uh, you know, uh, on average uh, successfully. And then uh, the other output is the coherence time. So we need a coherence time of two milliseconds. I mean, having seen these, uh, seems like it's not a very kind of uh, uh, difficult or let's say fundamentally difficult uh, to, to enable quantum network uh, even across, uh, you know, part of uh, uh, the US map. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, let me conclude this part. I guess the, the point here is, uh, you know, quantum hardware is expensive and noisy, uh, then we need to be really uh, strategic uh, and uh, we need to be efficient uh, to deploy uh, quantum hardware or to distribute quantum hardware across the network. Um, so another thing is here, uh, we propose a special multiplexing as uh, um, a simple way of kind of accounting for the probabilistic links. And then uh, the other, uh, the last thing that I haven't, uh, I didn't have a chance to explain, but you, you feel free to check out our paper, it's on archive, is the fact that uh, the network core memories uh, uh, do not need, uh, they don't need to be as good as uh, the edge memories. So for example, what I showed you earlier, you can get a good performance even at the 200 kilometer distance, uh, and then the coherence time need to be only um, two milliseconds, meaning just the, uh, the time, uh, the round trip of the, uh, um, the um, you know, uh, optical signal uh, uh, from uh, one repeater to the next. Um, so um, I guess the, the last slide was, uh, was kind of ended a little bit late. I guess I have like five minutes left. Um, so let me briefly mention the, the, the stuff that uh, I was telling you about the one-way repeater. So we started this uh, line of research on one-way quantum repeaters. Um, and uh, maybe I can start by just telling you the difference because uh, you know quantum repeaters is uh, at least in the theory land had been a subject for like 30 years. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the challenges is, uh, uh, you know, it require quantum memories or it may require a very efficient spin photon. 
um, interfaces. Uh, at the same time, um, 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 I would say it require uh, um, a very efficient error correction scheme. Okay, or at least uh, for every uh, quantum error correcting code, there was a proposal. Okay, so there was no like a general scheme which. Uh, um, encompasses uh, like all various types of quantum error corrections. And here our attempt was to define a general scheme uh, where, you know, if you want to change, let's say your quantum error correction, uh, then you don't need to change your hardware entirely. So, uh, so here is the proposal. Uh, by the way, and this slides, so there's this uh, link to a blog post, feel free to check them out. Uh, so they are kind of, uh, simpler version of the paper if you don't want to get into the technical details but yeah uh, feel free to check out our papers um, so the idea that we have is let's do everything in uh in photonic so that's why the name all photonic comes from so we want to uh, implement a quantum error correcting code uh, using photons and then we apply error correction through photons um, and uh, that's a method uh, kind of widely used in context of uh, photonic quantum computing, but here we are adapting it to, um, to repeaters uh, or to quantum network. Um, so the, the general idea, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about the, the, inter, uh, the inside, let's say each quantum repeater. So we, we need a small quantum, photonic quantum uh, processor. So this is a picture from uh, Professor Moody's lab, uh, one of our collaborators. Uh, what we need is essentially a chip which generates a graph state, a desired graph state, a programmable chip uh, which uh, generates a graph state and then apply some gates between the photons, uh, arriving photons and then the photons that we generated locally. Um, and, you know, of course, this features all, uh, all the uh, nice properties of photonic systems. Uh, so let me skip, this is a little bit technical, uh, but the high level idea is um, to implement this uh, Calder Bank uh, Schwarzstein uh, codes in photonics. So th this is a general framework and uh, you know, our scheme could work for any uh, type of uh, quantum error correcting code. Um, and uh, rem uh, again, back to what I said earlier, uh, here, what we want to say is once you have this programmable photonic chip, you can even try different codes, let's say, in long run. Uh, you don't need to kind of change the hardware entirely. Um, so let me show you some performances. Well, before that, uh, again, uh, let me uh, tell you the, the two general schemes uh, to, uh, or hardware uh, that uh, can realize that. So one is the deterministic sources. Uh, we have heard a little bit uh, yesterday about some deterministic sources such as the vacancy centers or quantum dots uh, um, where uh, you know we can generate the single photons or apply gates deterministically between photons or we can simply use this probabilistic fusion based um, photons and I'll explain both uh, show you some results for both uh, parts uh, next um, so if you try it for a very simple code, so this is a seven qubit code, means you need to send seven photons uh, per qubit. And uh, so once uh, you know, we look at the performance, so here we uh, consider a linear geometry. So the repeaters are, uh, the separation is L0. And as you can see, when the repeaters are close enough, we beat the direct transmission rate. So this is the uh, signal attenuation rate uh, for direct transmission. You know, if you just uh, simply send a, a signal through optical fiber, so uh, you're losing uh, by 0.2 dB per kilometer. And you can see that, that uh, as we put these close enough, uh, then it beats the direct transmission. And if we put them separate, uh, far enough, uh, then it, it will not uh, perform. And that, this is a really a property of quantum error correcting code. So when the noise is larger than some threshold, then it performs worse than and uh, just single qubit noise. Um, so it can perform much better than direct transmission if we use better codes. So the first code was a seven qubit code, which is very simple. And uh, as you can see, these are uh, this is actually a breakthrough in quantum error correcting uh, community. A couple of years ago, this uh, quantum uh, uh, low density parity check code. Um, and here, uh, you know, actually what we know um, and what is known in communities that uh, 
uh, photonic systems are really a natural way to realize these codes because they require some non-local gates. And we are just leveraging uh, the good properties of these QLDPC codes to show that, so you can see here, the signal can be transmitted almost uh, 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 completely without error. Uh, if we put the repeaters uh, like up to maybe four kilometers apart. And these values, by the way, show the insertion loss, uh, meaning uh, if you just send a photon, just because the interface is not ideal, you may lose like 0.5 dB or something. Okay, just last thing about the, this work. Uh, if you wanna now compare this uh, with uh, the existing uh, literature, you can see that the number of photons uh, for these uh, previous uh, uh, protocols is like a four than at least 100, whereas in our case is uh, very small. Um, so that's one uh, feature and then it yields the same um, efficiency. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is a, the conclusion of part two. Um, I just wanted to say that an early application of photonic processors uh, could be uh, quantum repeaters, not actually like a fault tolerant quantum computer. Uh, but still, we need to have a systematic exploration of, a, of various quantum codes and uh, you know, a full uh, kind of noise analysis of a, a detail a hardware. Um, so one last and thing is, yes. Sorry, uh, yeah, I think we're getting pretty, a little bit over time, uh, but I, okay. I thought like I'll fit in one question perhaps. Uh, yes. is, is there a practical limit on the size of the networks we, we can have via one way or two way repeater schemes? Um, as I said, um, so for the two way, uh, it really depends on the routing protocols. And, uh, you know, the routing protocols that we know pretty well is based on some central controller. And then the size of network is kind of determined by uh, the power of that central controller unit. Uh, um, but for the one-way uh, systems, uh, I think it's almost like a classical. So you can just use this packet switching or wrapper network. So the, there is no constraint to scale. Okay. I think uh, I have one more question, but I think uh, I know we are sort of like at least seven minutes over time uh, and, and okay. we can take it up later. But, but thank you for your talk. And, um, you know, thanks all the speakers, uh, you know, you, you know, the, 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 the summit has been pretty exciting, at least for me. I've learned a lot, uh, just the depth and breadth of like, you know, information people have shared. I think, uh, you know, getting all the panelists, the keynotes, everything together. I think this has been a fantastic summit. And uh, that's a wrap from Cisco Research for this summit. And uh, I hope that we will uh, we will have a similar summit next year and uh, I will see you all next year. So thank you and uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.